Gadrils. I'm not talking about dispatches, Gadril. I'm talking about the sort of face-to-face -face conversation where the real explanations get made. The opportunity to use me as his go-between to father. Unless, of course, for some reason he didn't want father to know what he's really up to. Gadriel started to tell him he truly did sound more than a bit paranoid. But then she stopped. Maybe he did. But as one of her research team members in Garth Shoma was fond of pointing out, even paranoics sometimes had real enemies. And Mulgarthic is methylene, she reminded herself. What do you think he might not want your father to know about? She asked instead. I don't know. But you obviously suspect that there's something, or you wouldn't be worrying about it this way. I just can't quite understand why he'd want to discuss his instructions to his diplomats in such privacy. Not under these circumstances, anyway. Maybe he just felt he could speak to them more freely without you, she pointed out. You were the officer in command during the initial incident. Maybe he'd feel they'd be more frank about discussing options and possibilities, or the consequences of the incident, without you. And you said you didn't think he was very happy about your decision to make Shalar and Jathmar your Shadonai. Maybe he was afraid they really have managed to influence you, us, somehow, and he wanted to minimize any second-hand impact that might have had on what Skirvan might say or think. That's certainly possible. And for that matter, he's a commander of two thousand, and I'm only a lowly little commander of one hundred. For now, at least. His mouth tightened briefly, and Gadriel's eyes flickered. Those last four words were about as close as he'd allowed himself to come, yet, to admitting his worry about the probable consequences for his military career. But none of that changes the fact that I was absolutely the closest thing he had to some sort of expert, or informed opinion, at least, on the people he was sending Skirvan off to talk to. Even if he didn't want me sitting in on that discussion, why didn't he send Skirvan to pick my brain for additional information before sending him off to talk to Shelar's people? Sure, they had my written report, and yours, but if I'd been a diplomat setting off to talk to a completely unknown civilization, I'd have wanted every scrap of information or first-hand impression I could possibly get. You're beginning to make me very nervous, Gadriel said slowly. Are you suggesting... Mulgurthic said something to them in private, gave them some kind of secret orders he doesn't want anyone else to know about. I'm afraid that might be what happened, he admitted. But what kind of orders? I don't know, he said again. On the other hand, there is that methylene xenophobia to think about. Surely you don't think he wants... Gadriel broke off, unable or unwilling, to complete the question, and Jacek grimaced. I can't believe that even a Mithilin would actually want a war, especially with someone who's already revealed the combat capability these people have. At least I don't think I can. But I do worry about just how hard line he may have wanted them to be. We're the ones who are in the wrong initially. What if he's unwilling to admit that? What if he's decided to draw his own line in the mud, like Hundred Thalma? Gadriel nodded very slowly her expressive eyes dark and shadowed with worry. Hadrein Thalmer had been a complete and total idiot, but at least his mental processes, such as they were and what there'd been of them, had been straightforward and almost agonizingly clear. He'd been arrogant, stupid, and far too conscious of the military honor of Arcana in general and himself in particular. But Gadriel doubted that there'd been a single subtle bone in his entire body. Certainly there'd been an acute shortage of brain cells at any rate. Nithmul Gurthic was something else entirely. Everything she'd heard about him suggested he was anything but an idiot, which unfortunately might not be as good a thing as she'd been assuming it was. Given the typical Mithilin attitude towards the non-gifted, and given the almost inevitable Mithilin revulsion at the very concept of someone whose very different talents might challenge the primacy of the gifted, Xenophobia might actually be too pale a word for his reaction to the Sharonian's sudden appearance. If he'd opted to respond as a Mithilin, rather than as an officer of the Union Army, then he very well might have issued far harsher and less accommodating instructions to Rithmar Skirvan than he'd admitted. You're definitely making me nervous now, 
She balled the hand on his shoulder into a small fist and smacked him lightly on top of the head with it. I'll have to think of some way to thank you for convincing me to share your paranoia. Sorry. He caught her wrist and looked up at her. Even with him seated in the chair and her standing beside it, he didn't have to look very far up, and something deep inside her tingled at the warmth in his eyes. He, on the other hand, seemed completely oblivious to his own expression, she thought, with more than a hint of frustration. Have you sent a letter ahead to your father to tell him about your suspicions? She asked after a moment. Not yet. I've been turning it over in my mind, but I probably will send word ahead by Hummer. After we dock in Peristia, he twitched his shoulders. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about it before I wrote to him. I kind of hoped you'd just tell me I was crazy. I wish I could tell you that, I mean. But even though you may be wrong, I don't think you're crazy. And the truth is, I'm afraid you're not wrong, either. Great. Jasek's spine slumped just a bit, and he shook his head with a deep, heartfelt sigh. I'll go ahead and write. In the meantime, though, I don't think this is anything we need to discuss with Shalar and Jethma. Rahil, no. Gabriel shook her head quickly, emphatically. There's nothing anyone could do about it at this point, and there's absolutely no reason to worry them any more than they're already worried, Jasek. That's exactly what I was thinking. He pushed himself up out of the chair and took the hand which had rested on his shoulder in both of his. He held it for just a moment, smiling at her, then drew himself up to his full towering height. And now that you've come and rousted me out of my hiding place up here, I've discovered that I'm actually hungry after all. Would you care to come down to the dining compartment and share a cup of tea with me while I irritate the stewards into finding me something to eat? Where did Gadriel go? Shalar asked. I think she went up to the observation dome looking for Jasek. Jathmar replied, looking up from the book in his lap. Then he straightened and his eyebrows rose as he sensed her quiet consternation through their marriage bond. Why? I need, we need to talk to her, Jath. Shalar's magnificent brown eyes were worried, and Jathmar laid the book aside and stood to take her in his arms. What is it? He asked. She leaned back in his embrace, looking up at him, and he shrugged. I've been able to tell that you were worried about something for several days now, love. I just haven't been able to figure out what it was. I've been assuming you'd tell me about it in your own good time, so is that time now? I don't know if it's a good time or not, but I'm afraid it is something we need to talk about, she said unhappily. And frankly, the fact that you haven't been able to figure out what's bothering me is part of the problem. What? He couldn't quite keep an edge of hurt out of his tone, and she squeezed him quickly. That's not how I meant it, she told him quickly. What I meant was that we've always been so sensitive to one another because of our marriage bond that each of us has almost always been able to figure out what's bothering the other one, when something is. But this time you haven't been, have you? Well, I didn't want to push you. Of course you didn't, but that's not my point either. In that case, what is your point? He asked with an unusual sense of frustration. It's about our bond, Jathmore, she said softly, her eyes anxious. What about it? His expression was perplexed, and she sighed. You're not a voice, she said. Maybe that's why you haven't noticed. Noticed what? It's weaker, Jath, she said very softly. It's weaker. What? He stared at her in consternation. It's weaker, she repeated. Oh, it's not like it was when I had that head injury. It went away practically entirely then. This is different. It's, it's like we're losing some of our connections. When voices speak to one another, there are all sorts of side traces, emotional overtones, thoughts which aren't fully articulated but still transmitted, traces of memory. We're trained to filter those out when we're working to pass on messages, but they're always there. Well, marriage bonds are like that, especially when they're as strong as ours has always been. I've never really noticed it, he said slowly. Not the way you're describing it right now, at least. Yes, you have, she disagreed. But because you're not a voice, you haven't realized they were all there, deepening and enriching the way our feelings flow back and forth. I am a voice, though. 
I've always been aware of them, and now, for some reason, they're weakening. What do you mean? For the first time since the conversation had begun, he felt truly frightened by where she seemed to be going. You mean we're losing our bond, somehow? I don't know. I wish I did. All I know right now, though, is that we started losing those side trace elements a universe or two back. I don't have any idea why, and I don't have any idea how far it's likely to go. I've never heard of anything like it, so I don't have any way to hazard a guess about any of those questions. Then what do we do, love? Jathmar hugged her tightly. I don't know, she repeated yet again. Then she looked up at him again. Have you tried using your talent lately? Not really, he replied slowly. We haven't really stopped anywhere long enough for me to get a clearer look at things. Well, maybe the next time we stop you should try, she suggested. I'm the only voice in this entire universe. I don't have anyone else to test my talent with. But you don't need another mapper. I don't think I like where you're going with this one, love, he said unhappily. I don't like where I might be going with it, she told him. Do you really think we should discuss it with Gadriel? He asked her after a moment, trying to ignore the sick look in her eyes which he knew was mirrored in his own. I can't think of anyone else to discuss it with, Shayla replied with a small, wan smile. There's no one else with a talent in the vicinity, that's for sure. She might have at least some suggestion about what could be causing it. Even if she can't come up with an answer, she might start us thinking in the direction of one. But then she'd also know about the problem. Shalar's eyes narrowed as she tasted the suddenly darker tinge of his emotions. Of course she would. Why? Shalar, I know Gadriel is our friend. And, he added a bit more reluctantly, I know Jasek will do everything in his and his family's power to protect us, but unless these negotiations of theirs actually produce some sort of peaceful resolution without anyone else getting killed, they're still going to be the enemy, love. Maybe not of us personally, but of Sharona. And both of them are honorable people who take their obligations seriously. If there is something happening to our marriage bond, to our talents, possibly because we're spending so much time in proximity to someone who's gifted, for all I know, do we really want to let the enemy know? Even if they would never do anything to hurt either of us, if it turns out to be something they could use against other people's talents, you know that Jacek for sure and Gadriel almost equally for sure would feel compelled to pass it along. But if we can't even ask Gadriel about it, then who can we ask? Shalar asked in a tiny voice. I don't know, love, Jathmar said softly. I don't know. Chapter 19 So, how's your problem patient this week? Regiment Captain Namir Velvelig asked turning from the office window through which he had been contemplating Fort Cartoon's parade ground as Company Captain Golvar Silkash completed the rest of the semi-weekly sick report. The esteemed Hadrine Thalmer? Fort Cartoon's senior medical officer grimaced. Then he shrugged with a combination of helplessness, irritation, and smoldering frustration. The truth is, sir, he continued, that Tobis is more and more convinced the man strongly talented himself, which, if you'll pardon my saying so, would be a dead waste of a talent even if Thalmer had the least clue of what a talent was, in light of his total and invincible stupidity. Now, now, Silky, Velvelig admonished gently. We've known one another a long time. There's no need for you to indulge in all these euphemisms to hide your true opinion of our guest. Despite the sourness of his expression, Silk Ash made a sound that was halfway between a snort and a chuckle. Any temptation towards amusement vanished quickly, however, and he shook his head. Honestly, sir, Thalmer is a disaster. I don't know what we're going to do with him. As nearly as Tobis, platoon captain Tobis McCree was the untalented Silk Ash's strongly talented assistant surgeon. And I can tell. He's convinced himself our efforts to heal him are actually some sort of insidious brainwashing or mental torture. You're saying he's a lunatic, as well as an idiot? I wish I could dismiss it quite that easily, actually. Silk Ash shook his head again. The thing is, 
The talent he's got is sufficient, even without his having any idea in the world what it is, to throw up a mighty tough block. So he managed to tremendously limit what Tobis could do to control his pain. He even managed to limit the speed of the physical healing we could encourage. And that same block made it all but impossible for Tobis to get through to those suicidal urges of his, and that... Don't tell me, Velvelig interrupted. Because he made it so hard to get through, Tobis had to adopt a brute force approach, and that only made things worse, right? Exactly right, Silk Ash agreed. We didn't have a choice if we were going to keep him alive. We had to get through to him, so Tobis did. Despite the fact that Thalmer was fighting him every inch of the way. And despite the fact that Thalmer's resistance really did turn the entire effort into something that could be readily mistaken by the uninformed for the mental torture he thinks we were out to inflict in the first place. Wonderful. Velvelig pursed his lips and looked back out the window. Frankly, he could have gotten along just fine indefinitely without having Hadrine Thalmer dumped on him. The regiment captain wasn't much given to coddling weakness. That wasn't part of any Arpathian's cultural baggage, and in this case, Velvelig's contempt for Thalmer's indescribably wretched performance as a military officer left him even less inclined to pity the Arcanan. Which, unfortunately, did nothing to absolve him of his responsibility to see to it that the medical needs of any POW in his care were met. Assuming the camel fucking idiot will let us meet them, he thought sourly. Is there anything we can do about that situation? He asked aloud. At this point, Silkash shrugged. Probably not. In fact, I've come to the conclusion that the best thing we can do, for the next few weeks at least, is to pretty much leave him alone. Physically, he's close to fully recovered, or as close to it as a man who'll never walk again is going to get. The discomfort he's still experiencing can probably be treated by an herbalist almost as well as by a healer at this point. We'll keep Tobis away from him for a while, so if he settles down, we stick to a purely physical nursing regimen. You really think that will help? I don't know. Actually, I'm inclined to doubt it. As deeply as the idiot's dug himself in, I just don't see any other practical approach. If we can't find some way to get through to him soon, though, I'm going to recommend sending him on up chain. Tobis is good, and with all due modesty, I'm a pretty fair surgeon myself. But let's not fool ourselves. There are hospitals closer to Sharona which are undoubtedly far better qualified to deal with something like this. I see. Velvelig clasped his hands behind him and bounced gently up and down on the balls of his feet for a moment, then nodded to himself. Very well, he said, turning back from the window once more. Write it up as a formal recommendation and I'll approve it. To be honest, I'll be relieved to see his back. I don't think you'll get any argument from anyone over in my shop, Silk Ash assured him. Good. In that case, you wanted to see me, sir? Velvelig broke off in mid-sentence as Senior Armsman Fulsar Chanturgis poked his head through the door behind the seated silk ash. The Senior Armsman seemed blissfully unaware that interrupting his commanding officer was a military faux pas, just as he seemed unaware that even the most rudimentary military courtesy would have required him to at least knock before opening the regiment captain's office door unannounced. Judging from his expression, Company Captain Silkash obviously was aware of those minor points of military etiquette. Either that, or he'd just swallowed a spider, since he appeared to be experiencing some difficulty with his breathing. Velvelig's own expression remained commendably grave. Arpathian Septman's faces tended to do that. Despite the mental snort of amusement, Chan Turgis almost always managed to evoke. The senior armsman might not have struck most people as particularly hilarious, but Velvelig had never been able to imagine anyone more unlike most people's concept of a professional military man. Which was fair enough, despite the Chan in front of his surname, Chan Turgis had never set out to pursue a military career. The Ternathian was short, for a Ternathian at any rate, sturdy, and undeniably plump. He had a round, guileless face with blue eyes, both of which never quite seemed to focus on the same object at the same time. His straw-colored hair always looked at least a week overdue for a cutting, even if he'd only left the barber fifteen minutes before. And unlike almost any other voice Velvelig had ever known, Chanturgis had a distinct weakness for the bottle. Not only that, but on the occasions when he succumbed to that weakness, 
His normally pacific disposition tended to transform itself into a not particularly skilled but highly enthusiastic pugilism, which rather reminded Velvelig of the old cliché about the bison in the glassworks. It was those last two character traits which explained what he was doing in the PAAF uniform and assigned to Fort Cartoon. Inebriation had played a major role in getting his signature onto the enlistment form in the first place, and a series of less than felicitous encounters with various MPs in a wide selection of drinking establishments had led him to assignments like Fort Cartoon, located about as far from Sharona as it was possible to get. Yet despite his character flaws, which the gods knew were legion, he'd retained his nomcoms rank for two reasons. First, when he was sober, which, to be fair, was most of the time. He was as hardworking, punctual, and reliable as anyone could ask. Second, despite the effect prolonged abuse of alcohol normally had on any talent, Chan Turgis's voice remained incredibly strong and clear. But no matter how strong his talent, dozens of COs had despaired of ever transforming him into a neatly turned out exemplar of proper military appearance or behavior. It was simply impossible to get him to understand, or at least to observe, more than the bare minimum of the principles of proper military procedure and courtesy. Yes, senior armsmen, I did want to see you, Velvelig said, and Chan Turgis nodded and cocked his head. He can't really be that totally clueless, the regiment captain told himself, for far from the first time. No one could possibly be as smart as I know he is and not be able to figure it out eventually, unless they choose not to, of course. If he thought it would do one bit of good, he would cheerfully have hammered Chan Turgis to encourage him to figure it out. Unfortunately, the senior armsman's determination to remain the squarest peg in a round hole that anyone could possibly be was invincible. Besides, much as he sometimes irritated Valvelig, the voice was rather charming in his own thankfully inimitable fashion. What was it you wanted to say to me, sir? Chan Turgis inquired after a couple of seconds. If you'll give me a moment, I'll be right with you, Velvelig told him and looked at Silk Ash. The company captain's spider was doing its best to crawl back up through his nose, judging from his face's alarming color and the wheezing sounds he was making. If you'll excuse me, company captain, Velvelig said with admirable gravity in a voice which scarcely quivered at all. I believe the senior armsman requires a moment of my time. Of course, sir, Silk Ash managed to get out. He stood. With your permission, sir, he added in somewhat breathless tones, and Velvelig nodded. Dismissed, company captain, he said, and Silk Ash departed. In fact, he actually managed to get through the office door and close it behind him, before the laughter he'd valiantly suppressed broke free. Velvelig shook his head slightly as he listened to the whoops coming from the hallway outside, then returned his attention to Chan Turgis. So here you are, he said. The senior armsman simply nodded, and Velvelig gazed at him for a moment. Then the regiment captain walked across to seat himself behind his desk, and the amusement he'd felt only moments ago had disappeared by the time he leaned back in his chair. I'm getting a little nervous, he told Chan Turtis then. Nervous, sir, the Ternathian repeated. Yes. How long has it been since your last voice transmission from Company Captain Chan Tesh? Seventy-six hours and... Chan Turgis pulled out his watch and opened it. And forty-three minutes, sir. I see. Velvelig cocked his head, lips ever so slightly pursed. Obviously, Chan Turgis had been doing a little worrying of his own. Have you attempted to reach Petty Captain Balwan or Petty Captain Tragan? The regiment captain asked. As a matter of fact, Chan Turgis said slowly, snapping his watch closed once more and returning it to his pocket. I have. Of course, I'd actually have to go through Lemire Ilther to relay to Erthic Varden or Petty Captain Chan Lyrisk at Fort Brithick. And you haven't been able to raise them either? Velvelig's voice was just a shade sharper than it had been. No, sir. Chan Turgis' blue eyes had sharpened into unusually clear focus, and he shook his head. Of course, to be fair, it wouldn't be the first time we've had trouble getting Lemire to hear one of us, he added. 
He's not a lot older than Earthic, and he's considerably weaker than either Petty Captain Balwan or Petty Captain Tragen, or Earthic for that matter. And to be completely frank, we've got him covering too wide a gap, he shrugged. You know how thin we're always stretched out here, sir. When it was decided that we had to have our stronger voice assigned to Company Captain Halifu, Petty Captain Balwan was sent on ahead from Fort Brithick. But we all knew there were going to be occasional glitches, especially once the decision was made to send Chan Lyrisk to Brithick to work with Earthic Vardan. That left Lemire all alone to hold the relay between us and Brithick. And even though he's as disciplined and conscientious as anyone could ask, the fact that he's still young means his talent still has a bit of growing to do. The truth is, the stretch he's responsible for covering is wide enough that even something as minor as an allergy attack could create a problem, which is the main reason we've been planning on recalling Earthic from Fort Brithick now that Chan Lyrisk is here and assigning him to the same relay station as Lemire. Neither of them is all that strong, but together, they'd give us enough redundancy to feel comfortable about keeping the gap closed. But you aren't comfortable in your mind about any allergy attack in this case, Velvelig said shrewdly, and Chan Turgis shook his head again. No, sir, I'm not, he admitted. Lemire's receiving range is shorter than his transmission range. That's why he's closer to Fort Brithick than to us. He'd have to be seriously ill to be unable to reach me with a transmission from his end, especially if he tranced to do it and he's never let better than three days go by without sending at least a test message. Is it possible he's come down with something a bit more serious than an allergy attack? Something that came on quickly enough that he didn't realize he needed to get a message off to you before it put him out of commission? Certainly it's possible. Probable, though? Chan Turgis shrugged. I'd have to say I don't think it's very likely. I see, Velvelig said again. This is a prime example of why we shouldn't have voice relay stations with only single voices assigned to them, Chan Turgis said. If one voice goes down for any reason, there ought to be another one ready to back him up, the way they do in the inner and middle rings. And we wouldn't have had to play musical chairs with Balwan and Chan Lyrusk this way either. To be honest, we virtually built communications breakdowns into the system ourselves, simply by stretching our supply of voices so thin. I agree with you, Senior Armsman, Velvelig said dryly. Unfortunately, there are those nasty budgetary considerations. And let's face it, the supply of voices willing to go herring off into the wilderness is limited, very limited. I realize that, sir. Chan Turgis's tone held a hint of what might almost have been apology. And Velvelig's use of his own rank had apparently jogged his mental elbow into remembering the proper form of military address when speaking to a superior, for the moment at least. But his expression was also stubborn. I'm not saying there weren't what seemed to be perfectly good reasons for accepting the kind of stretch we're working with out here, he continued. I'm only saying that we've just found out why what looked like good reasons really weren't. Not now a point which I'm quite sure hasn't been lost on First Director Lamana and the rest of the Portal Authority, Velvelik said. In the meantime, we're still left with our uncertainty about the reasons for the silence coming from down chain. Chan Turgis nodded and Velvelik inhaled deeply. Very well, Senior Armsman, I want you to continue trying to reach Voice Ilther. But I also want you to send a message up chain. I want higher authority informed about this. You think something serious is wrong? Chan Turgis's question came out sounding remarkably like a statement, Velvelig thought, and shrugged. I don't know that I'd say I think something is seriously wrong, but I'm certainly open to the possibility that something may be wrong. It's hard for me to visualize something that could have kept any warning from getting to us. But in light of what Chan Tesh and Chan Baske have been saying, I'm not going to rule anything out either. I'm not exactly in favor of taking any chances either, sir. But it's almost 300 miles from Fort Shalar to Fort Brithick, and it's another 1,200 miles from Fort Brithick to Fort Gartoon. That's the next best thing to 1,600 miles of nothing but horse trails and wilderness. And Lemire's relay station is 500 miles this side of Brithick. I can't think of anything that could cover that much ground in just three days. Neither can I, Velvelig said mildly. On the other hand, 
Two months ago, I couldn't have imagined anything that threw honest-to-God fireballs or lightning bolts either. Under the circumstances, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to accustom ourselves to stretching our mental horizons, don't you think? And if it should happen that for some strange reason we drop off the voice net, I'd like to think someone might notice. Yes, sir. I understand. Good, senior armsman. Now, Valvelig made a shooing motion with his right hand. Go do it. Chapter 20 Now that's a sight for sore eyes, sir, if you don't mind my saying so. Platoon Captain, His Grand Imperial Highness Janaki Chancalarath, drew rein as they topped out across the modest ridge line, then looked across at Chief Armsman Lorash Chan Breichel with a quizzical expression. I don't mind at all, Chief, he said mildly. In fact, I agree. Although, to be honest, it's not my sore eyes I'm thinking about. The Chief Armsman's mouth twitched but he'd been an Imperial Marine for seventeen years, and his expression had learned to behave itself, more or less. As the platoon captain says, of course, sir, Chan Breichel responded after a moment. Far be it from me to confuse the platoon captain's anatomical parts. I should certainly hope not, chief. Janicki's voice was admirably severe, but his eyes twinkled and Chan Breichel snorted. Then the non-com's expression turned more serious. All joking aside, sir, I really am glad to see that, he said, waving one hand at the incredible energy raising the thick clouds of dust under the baking sun of the Quiri's depression. Black banners of smoke from the funnels of steam shovels and bulldozers mingled with the dust, hanging in a lung-clogging pall, and they could see the long, gleaming line of steel rails stretching out towards the southern horizon beyond it. I am too. Janicki agreed, and uncased his binoculars. He raised them to his eyes, and the distant scene jumped into sharp focus as he turned the adjusting knob. There had to be at least a thousand workers immediately visible down there, he reflected, and every one of them was as busy as an entire clan of beavers. Bulldozers and shovels chewed the roadbed out of the bone-dry, mostly flat terrain, rampaging through their self-induced fog of dust like steam and smoke-snorting monsters. Steam-powered tractors followed along behind them on caterpillar treads, dumping heavy loads of gravel for more bulldozers, scrapers, and steamrollers to level into place and tamp firmly. Then more tractors followed behind, hauling heavy trailers stacked high with railroad ties and rails. Workers balanced precariously atop the loads, tossed ties and rails over the trailer's sides with the easy rhythm of long practice, and each bulk of timber, each gleaming length of steel, landed precisely where it was supposed to be. More workers moved forward, adjusting the ties, setting them into the waiting gravel ballast of the steadily advancing roadbed. Gangs of track layers followed them, lifting the rails, swinging them into place on the heavy creosote-soaked ties, holding them there while plate men fished the rail ends, then stood aside while flashing hammers drove the spikes. The crown prince of Ternathia, who was well on his way to becoming the crown prince of all Sharona, lowered the binoculars and shook his head. This was scarcely the first trans-temporal express railhead he'd ever watched advancing across a virgin universe. But right off the top of his head, he couldn't remember ever seeing such a focused, frenzied, carefully choreographed boil of energy. And just why should you find that particularly surprising, Janicky? He asked himself sardonically. You've never seen them laying track towards something that looks entirely too much like an inter-universal war, either, have you? That sore part of me that isn't eyes is really looking forward to parking itself in a passenger car's seat, he informed Chan Breichel as he returned his binoculars to their case. Of course, after this long in the saddle, my memory of what passenger cars are like has become a bit vague. I'm sure it will all come back to the platoon captain, Chan Breichel said. And I hope you won't take this wrongly, sir, but the main reason I'll be glad to see those passenger cars has more to do with speed than places to sit. The farther and faster towards the rear we get these prisoners and you, the better I'll like it. Janicky grimaced and started to say something, then stopped himself and looked away once more. His own feelings at being bundled safely off to the rear 
however important the job they'd found to give him as part of the bundling process, remained profoundly ambiguous. The part of him which had been trained as his father's heir recognized the logic in Company Captain Chan Tesha's decision to send him back to Sharona. Indeed, that intellectual part of him recognized that it would have been the highest of insanity for Chan Tesh to do anything else. But what his intellect recognized as sanity and what his emotions insisted he ought to be doing were two quite different things. Sir, Chan Breichel said quietly, I know this isn't really what you want, but you know it's the right thing for you to be doing. Janicki looked back at the older man and Chan Breichel smiled sadly. You'd have done just fine, sir, the chief armsman told him. I've seen quite a few platoon captains in my time. Brought along my share of them, for that matter, if you'll pardon my saying so. Some of them, to be honest, scared the shit out of me. Others, well, let's just say I wasn't too sure where I'd find them standing on the day it finally fell into the crapper on us. But you, he shook his head, you might have ended up screwing up. I don't think you would have, but anybody can. But if you had, at least I'm pretty sure all of the holes would have been in the front. Thanks, chief, I think, Janicki said wryly. Don't mention it, sir. Chan Breichel grinned at him and Janicki snorted. Well, however that might be, I suppose we should get this show back on the road. Yes, sir. The chief armsman turned in the saddle to bawl a few pithy suggestions to the other men of Janicki's platoon. The recipients of his requests responded promptly and the ambulances containing the Arcanan POWs Janicki was responsible for escorting to the rear moved briskly forward. Janicki watched them roll past him behind their double teams of mules, each ambulance flanked by its pair of assigned watchful mounted marines, and admitted to himself that he felt a profound sense of relief. Despite any ambiguity, and he was honest enough with himself to realize Chan Breichel had put his finger squarely on the question which bothered him the most, he would be overjoyed to get those prisoners back to Sharona, and not just because he knew how vital their interrogation was likely to prove, either. From the reports he'd received down the voice net, it sounded as if his father had more than enough forest fires to put out. No doubt Emperor Zindel could find any number of useful things for his heir apparent to be doing as part of the extinguishing process. And according to those same reports, his sister Andrin had been forced to shoulder a huge share of the heir's responsibilities in his absence, and she wasn't even eighteen yet. It was time he got home and took that off her shoulders. Of course, there was that bit about marriages. Janicky grimaced. He'd never doubted that his eventual marriage would be carefully considered and weighed. It couldn't have been any other way for the heir to the winged crown of Ternathia and there'd been no point in pretending it could have been or whining about the fact that it wasn't. But given the testy relations between Ternathia and Eurymathia, he'd never anticipated being required to marry into the family of Chava Bussar, and he couldn't say he found the idea very appealing. The voice reports he'd been able to monitor had been fragmentary and disjointed. He didn't have a voice actually assigned to his platoon, and the voice relay stations tended to be far enough apart to make it all but impossible for travelers passing between them to stay in any sort of steady touch unless they were voices themselves. From what he had heard and seen, though, it didn't sound as if his father was any happier about the prospect than Janicki himself was. Not that his father's unhappiness would change anything any more than Janicki's might have. They were both Calaraths, after all and Janicki felt an odd sort of pride in the realization that his father would make the decision on the basis of what had to be done, regardless of any personal costs, in the full confidence that Janicki would understand. He looked up at the graceful speck circling lazily against the blazing sky and raised his gauntleted left hand, then whistled shrilly. He rather doubted that the circling peregrine falcon could possibly have physically heard anything, but Talina didn't need to. She'd caught the thought he'd sent with the whistle and folded her wings. He watched the magnificent bird streak down out of the heavens, rocketing towards him, touched with the reflected fire of the sun. Then she struck his gauntlet with all the power and control of her breed. He lowered his hand, and she hopped from his leather-protected wrist to the frame mounted on his saddle. 
pausing only to press her wickedly sharp beak gently and affectionately against his cheek. Janicky chuckled softly, stroking the sleek head with an equally gentle fingertip, and crooned to her. There, dear heart, he murmured. Wouldn't want to lose you, would I? Talina ignored the comment, just as it deserved to be ignored, Janicky thought with a smile. Imperial Ternathian falcons didn't get lost. Which is just as well, he thought, as he urged his blue roan Shikauer forward after the last ambulance. And if she doesn't get lost, I don't suppose I can either, however tempting it might be. And I suppose the truth is that I'm still anxious to get home, marriage or no marriage. Whatever else happens, he snorted in amusement, I should at least get a long hot bath out of it. Two or three days worth of soaking ought to be just about right. And the way I feel right now, that would be worth even having Chava Bussar as a father-in-law. Tergal Carthos watched the smoke curling up from the bonfire, which had once been a pathetic excuse for a portal fort, and tried to decide whether he felt more satisfaction or irritation. It was a hard call to make, he reflected, as his command dragon came in to a relatively smooth landing. On the one hand, he'd been given independent command of one arm of the pincer, punching into Sharonian-held territory. On the other hand, it was definitely the secondary arm, and he and the relatively light forces 2,000 Harshu had seen fit to assign to him, little more than 3,000 men and barely enough transports to move them, had an enormous journey ahead of them, a point the extensive flight they'd had to undertake just to get to their next staging point underscored quite nicely he thought grumpily. The portal between the previously Sharonian-claimed universes of New Euromath and Thurman was located in the flat plains of northwestern Elith and central Andara, but the portal between Thurman and Nersum lay a good 1,200 miles south of there. That put it in a deep, narrow, inconveniently placed valley in the mountains near what should have been the city of Garinth in the kingdom of Yanko where the connection between the continents of Andara and Hilmar began to neck down. And once he'd finished moving his entire command that far and resting his dragons before beginning the next stage, he'd moved through into Nersum only to discover that he'd also moved from the heat of Garinth back into the late autumn chill of Elith, within fifty miles of the city of Drekken, barely three hundred miles from his Thurman starting point at Fort Brithic. The good news was that it was only a little more than 600 miles from Drekken to his next portal, located in the kingdom of Lokan's Duchy of Kanaya. The bad news was that it lay at the northern tip of Lake Kanaya, and while the weather at Drekken was only pleasantly crisp, the temperature in Kanaya was going to be quite another matter. And from 500 Neshek's prisoner interrogation, it looked like a leg of well over 3,000 miles once he'd crossed over from Nersum to Raysum. Yet those were merely logistical details to be taken in stride, he reminded himself as he climbed down from the dragon. To be sure, those details meant there was no way in any world that he could possibly hope to reach Trasum before Harshu. He'd simply had to accept that he'd been turfed out of any of the glory for the conquest of that universe and that that miserable Air Force puke Torok was going to get credit for it instead. Still, by the same token, he'd been given an independent command whereas Toralk was going to be right under Harshu's eagle eye. The question in his mind was why Harshu had arranged things that way. Several hypotheses suggested themselves to him, ranging from the possibility that Harshu had such unbridled trust in him that he was the only man suitable for the task, which Carthos rated as only a little less likely than holding the winning ticket in the All Arcana sweepstakes to the possibility that Harshu had discovered just how deeply in debt to 2,000 Mulgurthic Carthos actually was. That was the possibility that worried the Thousand. On the face of things, it wasn't very likely anyone knew, given how carefully both he and Mulgurthic had covered their tracks. But if Harshu had figured it out before he decided to send Carthos clear out here on the flanking sweep, as he'd called it in his orders, then several thoroughly unpleasant possible futures presented themselves to Carthos's scrutiny. The fact that it was illegal for a senior officer to co-sign a loan for one of his subordinates could lead to ugly repercussions if Harshu reported it to the Inspector General. 
It happened from time to time, anyway, as everyone perfectly understood, but seldom, if ever, on the scale of Carthos's dealings with Mulgurthic, or rather with the central bank of Mithil, upon whose loan board one of Mulgurthic's innumerable cousins happened to hold a permanent seat. CBM was the largest, wealthiest, and most powerful of all the Mithilin banks, as befitted the official state bank of the Mithilin hegemony. It must hold literally millions of loans, but very few of them had been granted on such favorable terms or secured by such threadbare collateral. And the fact that CBM had been remarkably patient with his spotty repayment record would also interest the IG, Carthos felt quite sure. If it came to a formal investigation, Carthos would be lucky if he was allowed to resign his commission without additional and probably painful disciplinary action. Even prison time was entirely likely, if only as a horrible example to discourage others from following in his footsteps. He knew that. But what worried him even more than that was the possibility that a thorough investigation would also discover all the small favors he'd done Mulgurthic over the last few years. Although there'd never been anything quite so crude as an openly demanded quid pro quo, there'd also never been any question in Carthos's mind that those favors constituted the true interest on his past due loans. It was quite certain the IG would see it that way, at any rate. And if the private memos Mulgurthic had sent to him at the same time the methyl in 2000 had ordered him forward to join Harshu, ever came under public scrutiny, things would get very, very ugly. And if Harshu had already become aware of them... Stop it, Tergel, the Thousand told himself sharply. If he knows, he knows. And if he did know, he probably wouldn't have settled for just sending you off to the backside of nowhere. Sir, welcome to Nersum. Thank you, 500 Eswar. Carthos returned commander of 500 Pacris Eswar's salute. Eswar, a wiry, fair-haired Incarin, was his senior ground forces battalion commander. Carthos found his accent rather hard to follow. The islanders seemed to take a perverse delight in massacring the pronunciation of Andarin. But the 500 seemed a reasonably competent sort, if a bit on the over-enthusiastic side. I see a hundred Helica's reds were reasonably effective, Carthos continued dryly, looking past Eswar at the blazing wreckage commander of one hundred Ferrex Helica's five thousand and first strike had left where the small Sharonian portal fort used to be. Yes, sir, Eswar turned to survey the same scene and grimaced. I know you wanted it intact, Thousand. I'm afraid it was just a bit more flammable than our pilots assumed it would be. I see. Carthos had a grimace of his own. Somehow he doubted the Air Force would have made the same mistake if Torok had been here to ride herd on them. On the other hand, to be fair, not that he particularly wanted to be, Carthos himself had emphasized to 500 Karth Mala, his senior Air Force officer, that it was essential that the fort be taken out fast and hard. And since Harshu had retained both of Torok's yellows, may I assume the voice chain has been cut? The Thousand asked after a moment. Yes, sir. The strike teams located the relay station and took it out last night, and it appears that the portal voice was killed in the initial strike on the fort. So there's something to be said for overkill after all, Carthos observed with a desert dry smile. Then he shrugged. To be honest, Pacris, I'm just as glad Hundred Halakas opening strike leveled the place. He twitched his head at the demolished fort. I was never too happy about the distance to the next portal. I know there was a relay station, but it's only about 600 miles. If the information we have on these voices is accurate, quite a few of them could reach that far without a relay. I know, sir. Eswar seemed to relax just a little. Well then, Cartho said, straightening briskly and planting his hands on his hips. I suppose it's time I had a few words with 500 Mala, and we started getting the troops forward again. Yes, sir. Eswar said once more. Then he seemed to hesitate for a moment. Ah, uh, sir, I did have one other question. Question? Carthos looked back at the infantry officer, one eyebrow arched. Yes, sir, we have a few prisoners, sir. I was just wondering what you wanted me to do about them. Prisoners, Carthos repeated with a frown. What sort of prisoners? How many of them? There are only about fifteen of them, Eswar said. Three of them are pretty badly burned. 
Any officers? No, sir. Mostly enlisted, with a couple of non-coms. I see. Carthos gazed unseeingly into the crackling flames consuming the fort for several heartbeats, then returned his gaze to Eswear. Has anyone questioned them? Yes, sir. They didn't seem to know very much. And you believe them? According to the verifier spells, they were telling the truth, sir. Then they're not very useful, are they? Carthos observed. Apparently not, Eswear agreed. On the other hand, 500 Neshek might be able to get more out of them by asking the right questions. But 500 Neshek is the better part of 3,000 miles from here, with 2,000 Harshu, Carthos pointed out. It would take us just a while to get the prisoners to him. And by the time any information he got out of them got back to us, it would probably be hopelessly out of date. Eswear nodded and Carthos's nostrils flared. He didn't much care for the Sharonians. He wouldn't have under any circumstances. But even if he'd been inclined to, there were those memos from Mulgurthic to consider. I don't see any point tying up transport on that sort of useless shuttle mission 500, he said. It's not like we have all that many of them to spare, after all. No, sir, Eswear agreed. And if they don't have any useful information for us, and I don't really see much point in hauling them along with us either. Carthos looked levelly into Eswear's eyes. For a moment he thought the 500 was going to balk, but then the Incarin drew a deep breath. Yes, sir, I'll take care of it. Good. Carthos patted the smaller man on the shoulder with a smile. I'll leave it in your hands, then. Now, where can I find 500 mala? Chapter 21 Come in, Clamon, come in. Clamon Torok obeyed the invitation and stepped into 2000 Harshu's command tent. He'd half expected a summons like this one. In fact, he wondered what had taken so long. More than two days had passed since the revelations of his supper with Harshu. Tergal Carthos had been sent upon his way 48 hours previously, but Harshu had yet to move towards his own next objective, and so far at least, Torok had no idea why he hadn't. Hopefully, that's about to change, he told himself as he approached the map table floating in midair at the center of the outsized tent. Aside from himself and Harshu, the only other person present was Commander of 500, Herrick Markry, Harshu's chief of staff. Markry, old for his rank, with iron-gray hair and oddly colorless eyes, was the sort of officer who seemed to have specialized in unobtrusiveness throughout his entire career. Toralk had worked with him enough in planning the Expeditionary Forces operations to know he was a highly competent, even an imaginative man. But he didn't project that. His apparent blandness, for want of a better word, was the striking thing about him, and Toralk wondered why. He supposed it might have owed something to the fact that Markry's less showy personality was simply lost in the shadow of Harshu's far more extroverted and aggressive impact on everyone about him. Of course, it's always possible. Harshu picked him expressly because he has that sort of personality. But if he did, the question is whether it was because Harshu was smart enough to know he needed a balance wheel like Markry, or was it because he wanted to make sure his chief of staff wouldn't challenge him for the spotlight? Thank you for getting here so promptly, Clamon. Harshu continued, reaching out to offer the Air Force officer his hand. I'd say you were welcome if there were any particular reason why I shouldn't have come promptly, sir, Torok replied, and Harshu snorted. What a polite way of saying we've been sitting here on our asses too long, the 2000 said. Torok opened his mouth, but Harshu shook his head before he could speak. No, that's a perfectly reasonable thing for you to be thinking, actually especially given how heavily all of our preliminary planning emphasized the need to move quickly once we got through the initial Sharonian defenses. Unfortunately, 500 Neshek has turned up some intelligence, which Herrick and I have been kicking around for the better part of twelve hours now. What sort of intelligence, sir, if I may ask? Torok said cautiously. According to two or three of our prisoners, there are Arcanan prisoners being held in our next objective, sir. 500 Markry answered for his boss. What? Astonishment startled the question out of Torok. 
The instant it was out of his mouth, though, he wondered just why he was surprised. They'd known all along that the survivors of the second Andorans had been taken prisoner, which meant, logically, that they had to be being held somewhere. I suppose I simply assumed they'd have done the same things with their prisoners that we did with ours, gotten them moved to the rear for proper interrogation as quickly as possible, except, of course, that we haven't been doing that since we launched this attack, have we? That last thought suggested some potentially grim reasons for holding prisoners closer to the front, so he decided not to think about it anymore just at the moment. We've confirmed it, Harshu told him. At least, the verifier spells have confirmed that the prisoners giving us the information believe it's accurate. According to the best information Neshek's been able to put together, the worst wounded of our people were held at this Fort Gartoon, or Fort Railthar, or whatever the hells it's named these days. It makes sense, sir, Mark Rye put in. As far as we can tell, they don't have anything like our magistrons. They're pretty much limited to natural healing times, and transporting badly wounded men without even dragons must be a nightmare, so they probably parked the most badly hurt of our people at this Fort Gartoon. Since they didn't know a thing about our aerial capability, they must have figured Gartoon was far enough from our point of contact to be secure. But you see our problem, don't you, Clamon? Harshu said, waving one hand at the sketch map on the table. We can't exactly use the yellows, or even the reds, in a surprise attack if our own people are being held inside the fort. No, we can't, sir, Torok agreed, stepping closer to the table and gazing down at the map. At least it's on this side of the next portal, Harshu pointed out. As long as we exercise a little caution, there's not too much chance of anyone spotting us moving into attack position. I'm not sure how significant that really is, sir, Torok replied. Harshu raised an eyebrow and the Air Force Thousand shrugged. Obviously, there's always a greater chance of being spotted moving through a portal. One of the more irritating things about them is the way they bottleneck your movement options to at least some extent after all but we've pretty much swept the area between here and the next portal. There weren't any civilian settlements. Thank the gods, he very carefully did not say aloud, thinking about Neshek. And we'd neutralize the voice relay even before we hit Fort Brithic. So we can move with virtual impunity right up until the instant we jump off for the attack. All of that's true. But from the outset, one of our primary planning considerations has been the neutralization of their voice chain's next link the one immediately beyond whatever might be our current objective. So we're still going to have to get our long-range penetration teams through the portal before the attack, which is going to take us right back to that bottleneck situation. Maybe not, sir, Mark Rye put in diffidently. He tapped the sketch map. From this, it looks as if their fort is a good mile or mile and a half inside the portal. If we can get people on the ground, maybe a talon or two of dragons in the air, between the fort and the portal, they won't be able to get a voice through to the other side. Not at least until we can get our people through to take their next voice relay station. And you know roughly where that is? Torok asked. Yes, sir, we do. I see. Torok fell silent, pursing his lips as he moved his gaze to the sketched floor plan pinned to the table beside the map. He wasn't about to invest too much confidence in that sketch's accuracy, not knowing how Neshek obtained his information. Still, it was probably fairly close. The Sharonians, like the Union of Arcana itself, seemed to stick to fairly standardized designs for things like portal forts. He ran a fingertip across the sketch, thinking hard, then looked back up at Harshu. I wish we had some spec ops troopers to spearhead this thing, sir. Still, I think we could probably do it without an opening airstrike. Assuming, of course, that we still have the advantage of surprise. His expression was sober, and his voice took on a warning note as he continued. With their weapons, if they figure out we're coming and get themselves stood to in time, even a relatively small garrison is going to inflict heavy casualties if we don't hammer them with a surprise airstrike first. Understood. Harshu stepped over, close beside the Air Force officer, gazing at the same sketch. To be honest, the 2000 went on after a moment, I never expected that we'd get much farther than we already have, 
without taking substantial casualties of our own. I'm inclined to think now that I was overly pessimistic in that respect, given how decisively your combat strikes have been shutting them down before we ever have to go in on the ground. I don't really want to do anything to change that, like sending in some sort of conventional assault instead. But if they do have any of our people inside, then we can't justify not trying to get them out, or even worse, possibly killing them ourselves, simply because we might risk a few more casualties in a rescue attempt. I agree, sir, Torok said firmly, although he was strongly tempted to point out that even if they hadn't suffered very many casualties in human terms, the dragons they'd lost had been more than merely painful. The diversion of both transports and battle dragons he'd been forced to make to 500 Mala to support Carthos's independent advance hadn't helped his force availability any either, of course. How soon can you give me an operations plan? Harshu asked. Probably by lunchtime, sir. Torok shrugged. As I say, I'd feel better with a spec ops company to lead the way, but this is a fairly standard scenario. We spend a lot of time planning and executing these on the fly in our normal training exercises, and we've learned a lot about these people, too. Good. It's going to take us a full day to get our transports moved into striking range and rested anyway. Can you do your planning while you're actually in the air? No, sir, Torok said with fairly massive understatement. But what I can do is hold a small planning staff right where we are while we put the ops plan together. Then I can load them all onto a single transport and catch up with you sometime this evening. We'll have to leave the transport behind to rest while the rest of the attack kicks off. But the availability of a single transport dragon either way isn't going to make or break the op. Good, Harshu repeated. Good. I'll be looking forward to seeing your plan. Good, Sorel, good. Fulsar Chan Turgis said enthusiastically as he watched the crystal clear imagery of something physically seen through someone else's eyes. I've known voices three times your age who wouldn't have gotten it that clear. I think you're finally getting the hang of it. The Fort Gartoon voice could feel Sorel Targle's pleasure at the compliment. A pleasure due in no small part to the fact that the thirteen year old boy knew that it was deserved. You know, Fulsar, Sorel said back. You really are a pretty good teacher. Am I? Chan Turgis chuckled. Just between you and me, I'd rather be sitting in a school somewhere a lot closer to Sharona than being stuck out here. Well, I'm just as happy you're here. Thanks, I think, Chan Turgis said dryly. The truth was that Chan Turgis had been a teacher, and a good one, in one of the private talent academies before his weakness for distilled grain products landed him in the uniform of the PAAF. He wasn't above occasionally bewailing the change in his fortunes, although while he wasn't prepared to admit it to anyone, including himself, most of the time, he actually rather enjoyed his life at present. Oh, he really did miss the amenities of the home universe or the more developed of the colonized universes. But he also knew that his drinking problem, and the fact that it was a problem simply could not be denied, was far more difficult for him to deal with in those universes. Funny he thought, on a level carefully shielded from young Sorrel. Two-thirds of the drinking problems in the military happen out here on the frontier postings. I guess some folks miss the bright lights enough that sheer boredom gets them. Me? I think seeing all this empty, unspoiled breathing space takes the pressure off somehow. He didn't know if that was the truth or if he was fooling himself. And it didn't really matter. He'd been sober for almost a full year this time and he discovered that he really liked Regiment Captain Velvelik. There was a lot more humor and warmth hidden behind that Arpathian facade than most people would ever realize. Besides, the can't-make-me-a-soldier game was ever so much more fun with a CO who understood the rules. Mom's calling me, Fulsar, Sorrel said, and the imagery of the view from his window, which he'd been sending to Chan Turgis, disappeared abruptly. I think I may have left a few chores undone this morning. Haven't you figured out yet that you can't fib to another voice? Chan Turgis replied with a chuckle. You don't just think you left them undone. Well, maybe not, Sorrel admitted sheepishly. Bye. The boy withdrew and Chan Turgis sat up in the straight back chair beside his small desk and opened his eyes. Sorrel was a good kid. He reminded Chan Turgis of his own youngest cousin, as a matter of fact, although Sorrel's talent was considerably stronger. 
In fact, it was a shame, bordering on something worse than that, that he was stuck out here in Thurman. There weren't more than a couple of thousand people in and around Fort Gartoon and the surrounding countryside. No one, unless it was Regiment Captain Velvelig, had any hard and fast numbers for Thurman's population, but however many people there were, there weren't enough to have a proper talent academy, and Sorrell's voice really needed training. Fortunately, the boy's family's cabin was less than 30 miles from Fort Cartoon. That was close enough that Chan Turgis had caught the telltale involuntary voice transmissions of an extraordinarily powerful talent just coming into its own. It hadn't taken him long to track down the source although he had been a bit surprised by Sorrell's youth. Generally, a talent as strong as Sorrell's didn't truly begin manifesting until its possessor was at least 15 or 16 years old, which probably explained why his parents hadn't worried about having him tested for talent before they headed out to Thurman. After all, Sorrell had been only 12 when they set out, and they were due to return to Sharona in only a few more months. Sorrell's father, who was also named Sorrell, although he usually went by his nickname Kursai, which meant redhead in his native Tathawinan, was a geologist employed by the Fernos Consortium, who'd been assigned to the preliminary survey of the sky blood load in Thurman. Even though the basic geology was identical in every universe, there were almost always minor variations. Landslides limited to individual universes, or forest fires, or floods, or any number of purely local factors could affect plans to develop something like the huge silver deposits. In this case, the altitude difference between the Thurman and Failsham sides of the portal had produced more of that than usual. It was fortunate that this portal had obviously been here literally for centuries, if not longer. There were ample clues as to what must have happened to the local geography and flora and fauna when that savage tidal bore of furnace-hot, kiln-dry wind from the Rakathian Desert came ripping through it and blasted straight into the western face of the Sky Blood Mountains. The local plant life had recovered, masking the worst of the inter-universal sandblasting under fully mature forest. But there were still spectacular expanses of naked, wind-blasted rock, where the lash of the portal blast had scourged the flesh from the mountain's bones. Kursai was young for the responsibility of dealing with that sort of minor variation. But he was also smart and hardworking, and from everything Chan Turgis had been able to discern, he'd done a first-rate job. In fact, he, his wife Raiseth, and Sorrel were going to be heading back to Sharona in just a few days, at least three months ahead of their original schedule, for a well-deserved vacation and promotion. Chan Turgis had already discussed young Sorrel's need for additional training with his parents. And although neither Kursai nor Raiseth was very strongly talented, they were obviously delighted by his enthusiastic praise for what Sorrel had already accomplished. Chanturgis was glad. The truth was that he was going to miss the boy, and he'd given the lad his own bronze falcon badge as a going-away gift. Technically, Sorrel wouldn't be allowed to wear it until he'd passed at least his second stage training and been certified, but Chanturgis had a spare, and he'd known it would be the perfect gift even before he watched those brown eyes go huge and round with delight. I can use anything good that happens these days, he told himself. His expression tightened at the reflection. There was still no word from Rokum Tragen or Shanser Balwan. In fact, there was still no word from Lamir Ilther, for that matter. And there damned well ought to have been by now. A new regiment captain, Velvelig, was more perturbed by the ongoing silence than he'd chosen to let on, and so was Chan Turgis. Truth to tell, he was beginning to wonder if something rather more serious hadn't happened to Ilther. Fatal accidents were scarcely unknown out here on the frontier, where a man might be bitten by a snake, mauled by a bear, break his neck in a fall, or be crushed when a falling horse rolled over on him. True, things like that happened rather less frequently to voices than to others, given the relatively sedentary nature of their duties. But they could still happen, and he was becoming unhappily certain that he was going to discover that something a lot more serious than a simple allergy or the flu had happened to young Lamere. Stop borrowing trouble, he scolded himself. If you find out it was nothing serious after all, think how stupid you're going to feel. Janaki Chan Kalarath straightened in his seat and stretched hugely as the abbreviated shabby train hissed and banged to a halt at Fort Salby Station. 
The standard seats in the Trans-Temporal Express's third-class carriages hadn't been designed to fit Calaraths. And the seats the coin counters in the TTE home offices had seen fit to put into the carriages on their work trains made third-class carriages seem palatial by comparison. Still, as he and Chief Armsman Chan Breichel had already agreed, even this beat the hell out of a saddle. He snorted with amusement at the thought, then glanced at Chan Breichel. Go ahead and get them organized to detrain, Chief. I'll find out where we need to put them. Yes, sir. Janicki left that task in Chan Breichel's more than capable hands and climbed down onto the sun-blasted boardwalk of the Fort Salby rail station. It wasn't the first time he'd been here, but the place hadn't gotten much cooler between visits. There was one notable change, he noticed, and he was glad he'd been warned about it before he saw the Euromathian cavalry standard for the first time. Given the traditional relationship between Ternathia and Euromathia, and his own unanticipated marital prospects, he wasn't overjoyed to see the crossed crimson sabers on a black field flying from one of the flagpoles on Salby's parade ground. Platoon Captain Chan Calarath, a voice said, and he turned towards the speaker. Yes, sir, he said crisply, coming to attention and saluting the dark-complexioned company captain with the pronounced Shirkali accent. Stand easy, Platoon Captain, the company captain said dryly and extended a hand. I'm Orkham Vargan, the XO, and I'm glad to see you for several reasons, one of which I don't imagine you're going to like very much. Sir, Janicki said a bit warily, and Vargan gave him a lopsided smile, dark eyes sympathetic. I'm afraid there have been some changes in your orders. I know you were supposed to be their military escort all the way back to Sharona, but given what's been going on in Tajvana, the powers that be have decided they need you home as quickly as possible and not as just one more platoon captain. Which means, I'm sorry to say, that delivering these prisoners to Salby is the last thing you're going to do as an Imperial Marine. Your Highness. Janicki had guessed where Vargan was headed, and he'd been prepared to protest. But he didn't. He didn't, because even as Vargan spoke, a lightning bolt seemed to stab through his brain. It hit so hard, so suddenly, his breath actually caught. The glimpse had made no sense, not yet. Regiment Captain Velvelig had told him about the warning his father had sent down chain after the Emperor and Andron had experienced their initial glimpses. Unfortunately, the warning hadn't come with a great deal of detail. Not unusual, as Janicki knew only too well, where glimpses were concerned. Yet the little bit Velvelig had been able to tell him resonated strongly with the images of fire and explosions, the sounds of screams and the thunder of weapons ripping through him now. Janicki's talent had never been remotely as strong as his sister's. In fact, he'd always been rather guiltily thankful it wasn't. He'd watched his father and Andron dealing with the discomfort of their glimpses, and he'd been glad his own glimpses had never hit him that hard. Today, though, he longed for a bit more of Andron's sensitivity. Chan Breichel had told him about the glimpse he'd experienced on their march to Hell's Gate, but Janicki himself remembered nothing from it. That was more than merely frustrating, although he'd been able to guess, given the fact that the Chalgan Consortium crew had been massacred only a very few hours after he'd experienced it, what it must have been about. But from the physical reactions Chan Breichel had described, it was obvious that it must have been a very powerful glimpse, much more powerful than he'd ever had before. And because no one had ever expected him to have a glimpse of that strength, his training in how to dig it back out of his subconscious was nowhere near as good as his sister's. Are you all right, your highness? He heard Vargan's voice echoing weirdly through the power of his glimpse and tried to force his eyes to focus on the company captain. For a second or two, possibly even a little longer, they flatly refused. They were somewhere else, somewhere dark and frightening. Then they did focus, and Janicki sucked in a deep, sudden breath. Your Highness, Vargan repeated, and this time there was genuine concern in his voice. I'm sorry, company captain, Janicki said, shaking himself vigorously. I guess I really didn't want to hear that. I wish I hadn't had to tell you, Vargan admitted. Well, 
I hope all of this enthusiasm to get me home doesn't mean I have to leap right on the next train. Janicky prayed that his smile didn't look as forced as it felt. I've been doing nothing but traveling for the best part of four months now, first to Hell's Gate, and then straight back home from Hell's Gate. I'd really, really like to spend one day or so sitting still, preferably in a deep, hot bathtub somewhere. They said they want your return expedited, Vargan said slowly. Still, it's going to take us most of a day just to figure out the train schedule, given the way the Third Dragoon's movement is screwing up the TTE's timetables. I can't guarantee anything, but I suspect Regiment Captain Chan Skrithic could see his way to letting you have 24 hours, maybe even 48. I'd like that, sir. We'll see what we can do, Your Highness. I promise. Thank you, sir. And now, Vargan continued, let's get those POWs of yours off the train. I've arranged suitable and secure quarters for them while they're our guests. Janicky nodded and followed Vargan as the company captain strode briskly over to the train. But the crown prince's thoughts were somewhere else entirely. He hoped Vargan was right about Chan Skrithic. If the company captain wasn't, then it was going to be up to Janicky to find some way to change the regiment captain's mind. Janicky needed that time here at Fort Salby, and not just for a bath however sensually seductive hot water and soap might be. Whatever he'd just glimpsed, it was going to happen here, right here at Salby, in physical proximity to a glimpse's locus and a powerful, sharpening, focusing effect on the glimpse itself, even for someone whose talent was as erratic as Janicky's. So he needed to be here if he was going to figure out what that glimpse truly meant. But the one thing he knew with absolute certainty was that if he explained what he'd already seen to Chan Skrithic, he'd never be given the opportunity. The Fort Salby CO would literally throw him onto the next train, and in the absence of trains, onto horseback, to get him as far away as possible. If Janicky told him the one crystal clear image he'd brought back from his glimpse, in the instant his eyes refocused. The image of Company Captain Orkham Vargan's decapitated body sprawled across torn, corpse-strewn ground, while his blood soaked into Fort Salby's parade ground. Chapter 22 Commander of 50 Halsek reminded himself that he was going to need the use of his hands soon which would be a bit of the problem if he insisted on clinging to the rope so tightly that the hands in question were numb. He forced himself to loosen his grip a little and pressed his face against the side of the transport dragon's freight platform. Even with the Air Force-style face shield on his helmet, the wind of the mighty beast's passage threatened to suck the breath right out of his lungs. He felt every prodigious sweep of the dragon's pinions, the pounding of its vast heart and the night wind battering past him was cold, even through his heavy clothing and thick gloves, also Air Force supplied, at an altitude of almost 6,000 feet. All of that was true, and none of it mattered at all. Not tonight. Tonight was even more important than silencing the relays in the voice chain. Tonight, they brought some of their people home again, and no one, no one, was going to do that without the second Andarans. The dragon slowed abruptly, and Halsek's nerves tightened as the cargo master slapped him on the shoulder in warning. The commander of 50 pulled his head back as the slipstream weakened. He looked down and saw their objective. Timing for this operation had been tricky. Halsek wasn't sure exactly where the other side of this portal was located, but it had to be at least seven or 8,000 miles further east in its own universe, given the obvious 10-hour or so time difference between the two aspects of the portal. Personally, he suspected that was one reason the Sharonians had located their portal fort in the lee of a steep ridgeline. The last thing someone needed in the middle of his night was to have a miles-wide half-disk of noonday brightness streaming in through the window. To be sure, it was undoubtedly a spectacular sight, when that flaming sun and hot, bright sky carved themselves out of a sky dusted with winter constellations. Halsick had watched the same sort of thing himself with an unfailing sense of awe, and knew how fervently he and his fellow troopers would have bitched if it had been shining in through their windows. From all the reports, 
The far side of the portal also had to be substantially lower in altitude. There had been ample signs of the kind of damage that sort of differential produced, although it had obviously happened a long, long time ago. That damage had complicated things a bit when it came to picking the path for the ground element, too. In the end, they'd had to take a chance on sending in a high-altitude recon griffin and generating detailed topographic maps from the imagery its crystal had captured. Fortunately, no one on the ground seemed to have noticed the unusually large eagle circling over their fort. Ideally, the planners would have liked to hit Gartoon in full darkness. Thanks to the portal, however, there was no full darkness for this particular objective. The best they'd been able to do was to schedule the attack for roughly five o'clock in the morning local time. At this time of year, that would still be about 30 minutes before local sunrise and about 30 minutes after sunset on the other side of the portal. It wouldn't be true full dark on either side, but at least the portal was east of their objective. That meant all of the available light would be coming from the same direction, which would let them approach out of the darker western sky above the Kratak Mountains. Personally, Halesick would have preferred some heavy cloud cover, but that wasn't going to happen here. The cargo master slapped his shoulder again, harder this time, and Halesack nodded vigorously. Then the dragon swept over the parapet of the fort, clearing it by barely fifty feet, and braked into an abrupt hover as the gifted cargo master activated the levitation spell. The spell wouldn't support the dragon's heavy bulk for more than a very few minutes, but that was all the time in this universe or any other Iftar Halesack and his men needed. Underarmsman Lintail Chan Turkon hated the Dawn Watch. Chan Turkon was what was technically known in the PAAF as a screw-up. Actually, Master Armsman Karuk, Fort Gartoon's senior non-com, was prone to use a rather more pithy and less polite term in his own native Arpathian on the many occasions when he counseled Chan Turkon, which was one reason Chan Turkon tended to draw the Dawn Watch as often as he did, given that Karuk was a great believer in using unpleasant duty as a gentle spur to encourage better performance. And when Regiment Captain Velvelig decided to double the sentries on each watch for reasons best known only to himself, Chan Turkon had been the inevitable candidate for his present duty. After almost eight months of attempting to encourage better performance, however, even someone as formidable as Master Armsman Karuk might be excused for beginning to feel the first faint outriders of despair where Chan Turkon was concerned. The Master Armsman might not have despaired, but he was showing clear signs of deciding the time had come for more drastic measures. Chan Turkon had no idea what those more drastic measures might be, but as he stood on Fort Gartoon's parapet, gazing at the portal and the dawn slowly strengthening beyond the crest of the eastern ridges, he was glumly certain he'd be finding out shortly. As it happened, he was wrong. Something made him turn around. It might have been a sound, it might have been something else. Either way, he didn't have time to figure out what it was. His jaw dropped in total disbelief as something came hurtling over the fort's western parapet. Whatever it was, Chan Turkon had never seen anything like it before. It was an impossible fusion of improbable creatures, something with the head of a huge bird of prey, the hindquarters of a lion, feathered forelegs that ended in monstrous talons, and wings. It came over the wall, bursting out of the pre-dawn darkness of the western sky without a sound, and the PAAF trooper on the northwestern tower never had a chance to scream. The terrifying apparition swooped down upon him. The clawed talons snatched him up by the shoulders. The clawed rear feet ripped out, raking him from chest to abdomen in a dreadful disemboweling stroke, and the terrible metallically glinting beak snapped once. The severed head flew in one direction, and the discarded, mutilated body tumbled to the parade ground in a shower of blood and other body fluids as the impossible killer rocketed back upwards. Chan Turkon was frozen, unable to believe, to comprehend what was happening, as more and more of the murderous creatures came streaking over the fort's walls. Some of the sentries had time to scream as the fresh wave of death swept over them, Someone actually even had time and the presence of mind to start ringing the alarm bell. 
but it told only twice before one of the monstrosities pounced on whoever it was. Chan Turkon heard the screams, heard the high, wailing, hunting shrieks of the no longer silent killers. Somewhere, a rifle or pistol cracked, as one of the sentries somehow got a shot off, and Chan Turkon found his own hand suddenly scrabbling frantically at the leather rifle sling on his own shoulder. He was still scrabbling at it when one of the second wave griffins struck him from behind like a falcon striking a hare, and snapped his neck instantly. As the transport dragon came over the palisade and went into its hover, Hailsack watched the opening griffin strike swarm over the defenders. He'd always hated the strike griffins. The recon griffins were something quite different. First, they were almost always female, whereas every strike griffin was a male, although that was less important than their other differences. The recon griffins were also bigger, stronger, less maneuverable, smarter, and much, much more biddable. Some of them were actually affectionate and became quite devoted to their handlers. So far as Hailsack was aware, no strike griffin had ever been devoted to anyone. Their designers had built them around an almost insane territoriality, a vicious temper, and a voracious hunger. They had one and only one function, to kill anything in their programmed area of attack. Strike griffins were never trained for their missions the way recon griffins often were. Instead, their handlers relied completely on the compulsion spells laid into the creature's hate-filled brains through the sarcolis chips surgically implanted in the young no more than four or five days after hatching. That was one reason Hailsack hated them. There was always the possibility that those compulsion spells might fail, and the last thing any semi-sane soldier wanted was to have a theoretically friendly rogue griffin rampaging through his formation in a killing frenzy. At least this time the spells seemed to be holding, and it was obvious the Sharonian sentries had never had a clue the attack was coming. Most of them were caught with their shoulder weapons still slung, and a very few of them had time to do anything about that. In fact, very few of them had time to do anything but die. Namir Velvelig's bare feet hit the floor as the cacophony of screams, shots, and a strange high-pitched wailing sound yanked him brutally up out of dreamless sleep. He seized his pistol belt, slung it about his waist without even considering trousers or blouse, and raced out of his quarters to the office window which overlooked the parade ground. At the moment, the parade ground was a scene of barely pre-dawn nightmare. He saw the hawk-headed monsters ripping and tearing at his sentries, saw the mutilated bodies of his men strewn across the interior of the fort where their killers had dropped them like so much garbage. And he saw those same killers sweeping back, circling above the barracks where most of the rest of his men were quartered. Velvelig was an Arpathian. Despite his thoroughly modern education, despite his years as a professional soldier in a modern army, the shaman's tales had prepared him for devils and demons in a way most Sharonians would no longer have understood. His forebrain could only stare in disbelief at the slaughter outside his window. Deep down inside, though, those shaman's tales took over. He didn't have to think to know what a man did about demons, and that part of him instantly determined that his revolver was not the best possible tool for his requirements. He whirled away from the window. He didn't have the key, which was still in the pocket of the trousers he wasn't wearing, and there was no time to worry about niceties. A single shot from his H&W blew the lock off the chain through the trigger guards of the racked shotguns. Velvelig's hands moved with flashing speed as he scooped up one of the weapons. The Model 7 combat shotgun was a purely military weapon, a slide-action weapon with a five-round detachable box magazine and a bayonet lug, and designed to fire brass-cased ammunition which was much more powerful than the standard civilian loads. It was heavy, ugly, and a brute to fire. But it was as lethal as it was unlovely. And there were 24 preloaded magazines of double-aught buckshot on the shelf across the bottom of the weapons rack. Each cartridge contained 10 pellets, each of them the size of a Polshana 36 caliber bullet. And Velvelig racked the action open, slid a loose round into the chamber and closed it, then slapped in a magazine. He had few illusions about what was about to happen but he took long enough to sweep half a dozen more magazines into a canvas ammunition carrier and slung it over his shoulder. Then he stepped out onto the planked walkway in front of his office. 
Hailsuck grunted as he fast roped down from the transport and his heels thumped on the firing step inside the fort wall. He started to bark the order for his men to assemble on him, then ducked as another griffin came slicing in just above his head. Something exploded down below him. His ears classified it instantly as the sound of one of the Sharonian weapons, but this one sounded slightly different somehow. He whirled towards the noise and saw a single man, naked but for a loose white pair of skivvies and a weapons belt, standing on the veranda across the front of what Neshek's sketch map called the office block. He had what looked like one of the standard shoulder weapons, but as Hailsack watched, the man fired again, and a second griffin shrieked and collapsed in midair, as if it had just flown headlong into a wall. It slammed into the ground in a broken ball of fur and feathers, and the single defender's left hand stroked back under his weapon's barrel, and he fired again. A third griffin went down, and the man who'd killed it cycled his weapon once more and tracked smoothly, almost unhurriedly, onto a fourth target. Velvelig had a vague impression of something huge and dark hovering just above the wall. Whatever it was, there wasn't anything he could do about it at the moment, and he was totally focused on the task he could do something about. The veranda roof gave him overhead cover, and he had an excellent view of the monster-besieged barracks. He'd always been a superior wing shot, and these things, whatever the hells they were, were bigger than deer, not doves. He squeezed the trigger, the shotgun's butt plate hammered his shoulder, and a fourth monster smashed into the barracks wall like two hundred pounds of dead meat. He swung onto a fifth creature and fired, then a sixth. Half a dozen of the murderous beasts were down, and he pressed the magazine release. The empty magazine thumped to the veranda floor, and he slammed in another, worked the slide, and brought down a seventh target. Nothing could ever let Iftar Hailsik forget that the Sharonian butchers had murdered one of the greatest men in Arcana's history in cold blood. The hatred that had kindled in his heart was something perhaps only another Garthan could truly have understood. Yet as he saw that single defender standing his ground, firing with such cool, steady precision, he felt an unwilling surge of admiration. It wasn't just the other man's courage, though gods alone knew how much raw nerve it must take for someone who'd never even suspected that griffins existed to face them with such steadiness. No, it was the other's obvious sense of duty and his effectiveness. Even as Halsek watched, the single Sharonian brought down a seventh and an eighth griffin. The fact that the attacking predators were so focused on the targets designated by the combination of their controlling spellware and their own natural viciousness meant they paid the man killing them almost no attention at all. They were so totally committed to neutralizing the barracks, keeping anyone from getting out of them, as their pre-attack command programming required, that they never noticed the single man outside the office block. Yaman, the commander of fifty barked. Get the gates open! The rest of you, on me! Lance Yerman Farrell and the two other men assigned to help him went thundering down the nearest stair to the parade ground below. The rest followed Hailsek as he went scurrying along the firing step, looking for a clear firing angle. Velvelig brought down yet another griffin, and his second magazine was empty. He dropped it out of the magazine well and reached into the carrier at his side for a third. That was when the crossbow bolt hit him. It slammed into his right hip like an incandescent spike, and he grunted explosively at the raw, brutal stab of agony. The sheer sledgehammer impact was enough to knock him backward off his feet, and he went down, losing his shotgun as he landed. His left hand went to the stubby, thumb-thick steel shaft driven deep into his pelvis, but his right swept down to his holster, and the heavy, familiar weight of his H&W revolver fell into his palm. The monsters swarming around the barracks had noticed him at last, and one of them came straight at him. He brought the revolver up, tracking the incoming nightmare with a rock-steady muzzle, and fired. The hollow-nosed forty-six caliber slug hit the griffin in the left eye at a range of little more than fifteen feet. The creature's head snapped up under the brutal impact, but momentum kept it coming, and Namir Velvelig's world went black as the plummeting body smashed into him. Iftar Hailsack stood in the center of the captured fort's parade ground, looking about him at the litter of bodies and body parts sprawled across the gore-splashed dirt. 
In some ways, the carnage was even worse than he'd seen at Fort Shalar and Fort Brithick. The bodies there hadn't been this mangled, this shredded. True, many of them had been so burned and shriveled as to no longer look human, but in some ways that had actually lessened the impact. It had been hard to think of them as anything which had ever been human, while those killed by the yellows had at least been intact. These bodies were not. In fact, they looked exactly like what they were, the brutally mutilated corpses of men who had been literally torn to pieces by vicious, ravening predators bigger than most of them had been. So what? he demanded of himself harshly. Dead is dead, however you get that way. Besides, at least it's pretty quick when a griffin gets hold of you. And none of these bastards was an old gentle civilian who got murdered after he'd surrendered. A stubborn little voice buried deep in the back of his brain stirred uneasily at that last statement. He felt it there, but he crushed it ruthlessly back into silence. Whatever might be happening to surrendered Sharonian POWs, he and his men hadn't had anything to do with it, and none of it could change what the butchers had done to Magister Halliton. He watched the dismounted Unicorn cavalry troopers spreading out to relieve the initial infantry assault force. He and the other airdropped infantry had opened the gates and held them until the cavalry could arrive against the disjointed efforts of the dozen or so Sharonians who'd been outside the barracks and somehow evaded destruction by the Griffins. He'd lost three of his own men, but the defenders had been so stunned, so shocked by what had happened to them, that they'd had virtually no unit organization at all. Their counterattacks had been determined, but they'd been launched in ones and twos without sufficient strength, even with their infantry weapons, to break through the defensive fire of Halsex arbalists and infantry dragons. Most of those who tried to retake the gate were just as dead as the ones the Griffins had ripped apart. And, sir, fifty Halsex! Halsex turned and found Yerman Farl pelting across the parade ground towards him. What is it? the officer asked sharply. We found the POWs, Farrell announced excitedly. One of them's asking for you, sir. For me, Halesack blinked. Yes, sir. Farrell's smile looked like it was about to split his face in half. It's 50 Ulthar. Ulthar, Halesack repeated sharply. Where? Over here, sir. Halesack followed the lance quickly through the carnage to what was obviously the fort's brig. There were perhaps a dozen men locked into its cells. The early morning light pouring in through the outer barred windows showed that the cells weren't particularly crowded and that they'd been provided with ample bedding. That registered peripherally with Halsek, but his attention was locked on the tallish, wiry, red-haired Andarin, who had a cell entirely to himself. Thurman! Halsek seized his brother-in-law's good hand as fifty Ulthar reached it through the bars to him. Gods, man, we thought you were dead. Not quite. Ulthar was paler than ever, Halsek thought, and noticed the awkward way the other man stood with his left arm in a sling. The shoulder on that side was oddly hunched and swollen, as if there might be multiple layers of bandage under his blouse, and his face was grooved with pain lines, which hadn't been there the last time Halsek had seen him. I took a hit through the shoulder. Ulthar explained as he saw the direction of Halsek's gaze. Tore the hell out of it, actually. And these people don't have healers. Not like ours, anyway. They did their best, but... He shrugged his good shoulder and Halsek's jaw tightened. If they did, it's the only time they did, he grated, and Ulthar's eyebrows rose. What's that mean? he asked. Halsek looked at him in surprise and Ulthar smiled crookedly. I know you better than that, Iftar. It's not like you to leap to conclusions, and I'm a bit at a loss to understand how you'd know anything about how they've been treating us since they captured us. I don't have to know about that, to know what sort of butchers these people are, Halesack said harshly. Ulthar's surprise was obvious, and Halesack's lips drew back in a snarl. The fact that they shot Magister Halithan down like a dog after he surrendered is all I need to know, Thurman. Shot Magister Halithan? Ulthar's surprise had segued into confusion. What are you talking about? They didn't kill Magister Halifan. What? Halsek stared at him in disbelief. For an instant or two, the ex-Garthon's brain simply refused to process information. Then he shook himself violently. But the intelligence reports, the briefings. 
I'm telling you, they didn't do it, Ulthar said. They couldn't have. It wasn't one of their weapons, it was one of ours, an infantry dragon, a lightning thrower. Are you sure, Thurman? Are you positive? Damned right, I'm sure, Ulthar said grimly. They allowed us funeral rites when they buried the dead. I saw Magister Halithan's body with my own eyes, Ivtar. He'd been wounded in one arm, probably by one of their hand weapons during the attack, yes. But it was the lightning that killed him. Oh, my God. Halesick whispered, remembering the hatred, the fury which had impelled him. They said they couldn't confirm it, but... I don't know what they told you, Ulthar said. But as far as I can tell, these people have treated all of their prisoners, including me, Iftar, with respect. I haven't seen one bit of casual brutality, and their healers, such as they are, have done everything they could for our wounded, despite the fact that we shot at them first. We shot first? Halesek parroted. Of course we did. Ulthar's voice was suddenly harsh and bitter. Hundred Oldahan was right. He wanted us pulled back, away from the portal, until we could sort out how to manage a peaceful contact. But Hundred Thalmare had other ideas. I talked to one of the sentries he ordered to open fire on the single cavalry trooper they sent forward to talk to us. To talk to us, Ifta. Halesack's mind was working overtime, putting bits and pieces together, remembering the rumors about how 500 Neshek went about interrogating captured Sharonians, and remembering that 2,000 Harshu hadn't done a thing to stop him. Listen, Thurman, he said quickly, urgently, leaning closer to the bar than keeping his voice low. Can you prove we didn't kill Magister Halithan? Prove it? Ulthar's confusion was obvious, and Halesack shook his head hard. All our intelligence briefings have strongly suggested that the Sharonians murdered Magister Halithan after he surrendered. I didn't have any more reason to question that than anyone else did. Not till now. Now I do. And I have to wonder why they've gone out of their way to suggest to all of us that that's what happened. Ulthar stared at him for a moment, then grimaced. Magister Halithan's been buried for three months now, Iftar in a grave, in a swamp, without any sort of preservation spell. I don't know if anyone could prove exactly how he died at this point. I know I saw the body, and I think at least one or two of the others did, but I can't prove anything. And can anyone else confirm that we shot first? Halesack pressed. I don't know, Ulthar said slowly. The man I spoke to, Lance Tiris, died shortly after we were captured. Their healers tried, but they couldn't save him. Damn, Halesack murmured, and Ulthar cocked his head, blue eyes intense. What the hells is going on here, Ifta? Look, Halesack said even more quietly than before. I don't know for sure what's going on. We were told they started it both times, and we were told there were those unconfirmed reports that Magister Halithan was murdered after he surrendered. Plus the rumors, I don't know exactly who started them, that they shot our wounded after they surrendered. That's bullshit, Ulthar exploded. That's... Shut up, Halesick hissed. Shut up and listen to me. Ulthar spluttered to a stop and Halesick drew a deep breath. That's better, he said, then paused, trying to decide how to say what needed saying. Look, he said again, finally. You're my sister's husband, my daughter's uncle. I don't want to go home and explain to either of them that something happened to you after I found you alive. But I'm telling you, we wouldn't have been told what we were told as often as we were told it before this all kicked off, unless somebody had decided it was what we needed to be told. And if that was what happened, it fucking worked. He smiled grimly. Believe me, Thurman... You don't want to know the things I've been contemplating since they told me how Magister Halithan is supposed to have died, and I am sure as hell's not alone in that. But if I'm right, if it was done on purpose, how do you think they're going to react if you insist on telling them we've all been lied to? If you've been lied to, then it's my duty to tell people the truth. The familiar stubborn look in Ulthar's blue eyes made Halsick's stomach clench painfully and he fought a sudden urge to seize his less massively built brother-in-law by the front of his uniform blouse and shake some sense into him. 
God damn it, you listen to me this time, Thurman Ulfa, he said instead, a whetstone of passion sharpening the edge in his intense voice. I'm a Garthan. My people, your people now, damn it, know all about being lied to and manipulated. God's man. Those bastards, Shakira, have been doing it for thousands of years. And given what you've just told me, I smell the mother of all lies. Don't you think for one moment that whoever's responsible for it wouldn't be perfectly willing to disappear, a single inconvenient commander of fifty who can't even substantiate his preposterous claims? That kind of thing may go on in mythal, Ulthar said sharply. But this is the Union Army, goddammit. And I'm not telling you to keep your mouth shut forever, Hailsack shot back. I'm telling you to keep your mouth closed and your head down until you know for absolute fucking certain that the senior officer you're telling about isn't part of a deliberate campaign to change the truth. Do you understand me, Thurman? I'm not going home to tell Arillus that you got your stupid self killed playing Andorran honor games with somebody you shouldn't have trusted. Ulthar glared at him, but then, slowly, drop by drop, the anger flowed out of his blue eyes to be replaced by something else. I'm sorry, Ulthar, Hailsick said more gently, meeting that blue gaze of bitter disillusion. I'm sorrier than I can say, and I agree with you. The truth has to be gotten out, eventually. But for that to happen, you have to be alive to do the getting, and I am not going to lose you when I just got you back from the dead. Do you read me on this one? Ulthar looked at him for a long, long moment of silence, and then finally nodded slowly. Good, Hailsack said quietly, reaching through the bars to squeeze his brother-in-law's sound shoulder. Good. Chapter 23 Well, 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 Alivar Neshek murmured as he walked down the line of sullen-faced Sharonian prisoners assembled on the captured fort's body-strewn parade ground. Some of them were lightly wounded, all of them had their hands manacled behind them, and if the look of anyone except a combat-trained magister could have killed, Neshek would have been a smoldering corpse. The thought rather amused him, actually. Those five, he told Javelin Porath. And that one, he added, pointing at an overweight, blue-eyed senior armsman. Yes, sir. Neshek nodded and walked off, hands clasped behind him, whistling softly. He knew he could count on Porath to deliver the selected prisoners suitably. His whistling faded as the major flaw in his present sense of satisfaction floated to the top of his mind once again. The fact that his interrogations had revealed the presence of the Arcane and POWs here at Fort Gartoon was going to be a major feather in his cap, since that was the only reason they hadn't been killed right along with their captors instead of being liberated. But the fact that the attack had gone in on the ground to rescue them meant the intelligence section had gotten in further behind the lead combat elements than they had during the previous operations. Which meant the fort's badly wounded Sharonian commander was out of Neshek's reach, for the moment at least. Neshek growled a mental curse at the thought. Commander of 500 Vaynar had the bastards safely squirreled away in the casualty queue over at the field hospital. Personally, Neshek would have preferred to let the son of a bitch die from his wounds, which he certainly would have done probably fairly quickly without gifted healing, as an example to the rest of the prisoners. Or, failing that, Neshek could at least have shot him himself for the same purpose. Vaynar wasn't going to let that happen, though, and Neshek spared another mental curse for the officious Andoran scout's commander of fifty, who'd hustled the wounded Sharonian off to the healers before Neshek could get his hands on him. Well, I'll just have to do the best I can with what I still have to work with, and settle up with the troublemakers later, he told himself. And at least this time around, I've got a lot more people to get answers out of. He stepped into his chosen interrogation site. It had been a stable, but the unaugmented horses who had been housed here no longer required its stalls. Dragons and griffins, especially battle dragons and griffins, had active metabolisms, and horses and mules tasted just as good as cattle and sheep as far as they were concerned. 
and watching griffins and dragons feed was probably an eye-opener for the Sharonians, especially after what the griffins did to so many of their buddies. He chuckled nastily to himself, that alone ought to loosen a few tongues. He strolled across the front of the stable, considering the stalls. They'd do as holding cages if he needed them, he decided, while the tack room he'd had cleared would give him the sort of privacy and intimacy he'd found so effective in the past. He glanced up as Porath and two other troopers kicked and cuffed their prisoners into the tack room. Now, now, Lance Porath, he chided gently, following them inside. Surely there's no need for all that roughness, yet at least. Yes, sir, whatever you say, Porath replied with exactly the right edge of disappointment, and the five hundred shook his head and wagged one finger admonishingly. Then he turned his attention to the Sharonians. Now then, he continued, addressing them through his translating PC. My name is Neshek, five hundred Neshek of the army of the Union of Arcana. You and I are going to become very well acquainted, and in the process, you're going to tell me exactly what I want to know. None of the Sharonians replied, of course and Neshek smiled thinly. You may not think at this moment that you will, he told them, but if you do, you're wrong. Trust me, you're wrong. Fosar Chanturgis looked at the smiling, thin-faced Arcanan and felt a cold stab of terror. This Neshek was radiating his emotions so powerfully that even a half-deaf voice and Chanturgis was anything but half-deaf, couldn't help picking them up, physical contact or no. Not any more than he could help realizing that the Arcanan was the next best thing to certifiably insane. He's enjoying this, Chanturgis thought, really, really enjoying it. It's not just about power for him. There's something almost erotic about it, as far as he's concerned. And he's looking forward to killing. Triad. How many more of these people are just like him? No, the smiling lunatic's voice was almost caressing. Suppose one of you tells me who your assigned voice might be. Chanturgis's blood seemed to freeze in his veins, but his brain raced with feverish speed. Obviously, these people knew a lot more about Sharonian talents than anyone thought they might which made the reason for the silence from down-chain voices suddenly and terrifyingly easy to understand. In that moment, Fulsar Chanturgis could see what was going to happen as clearly as any Calarath, and a fresh thought hammered through him. He hadn't made any secret of Sorail Targal's awakening talent. Indeed, he'd been proud of the boy, bragged about the strength of his voice. If this Neshek was as thorough as Chanturgis was afraid he might prove, Someone who knew about Sorail was going to break and tell him. And when that happened, Sorail, he shouted, Sorail, listen to me. For an instant, there was no response. Then he saw a flash of vision, someone else's hand scooping sweet feed from a burlap bag for eager, velvet-nosed horses. Fulsar? Sorail's voice came back as the vision disappeared. The boy sounded startled and more than a little apprehensive. Obviously, more of Chan Turgis's side trace emotions were coming through than he'd intended, but maybe that was a good thing. What is it? What's wrong? It's the Arcanans, Chan Turgis said urgently. They've taken the fort. He sent flashing mental images, horrific images, of the striking griffins, the horned, lynx-eared unicorns, the terrifyingly enormous dragons, with the speed and completeness possible only for a highly trained voice. The thirteen-year-old at the other end of the voice link gasped at the raw brutality of everything he was seeing and hearing, and Chen Turgis allowed himself a moment of bitter regret for having inflicted that upon him. But someone had to know. He felt a brief instant of stunned silence, of shock so profound he was afraid the boy was going to withdraw entirely. He wouldn't have blamed Sorail a bit if he had. But the boy was made of sterner stuff than many an adult Chen Turgis had known. What's happening now? He asked after a moment, his voice amazingly steady. What do you want me to do? For right now, just hold the link open, Chen Turgis said. Listen and watch. 
You want me to try and get through the portal? Contact the Failtum relay station? No. Genturgis practically shouted the single word. Then he shook himself mentally, managing somehow to keep his expression from revealing what was going on inside his and Sorrel's heads. If they've gotten this far up chain without anyone getting a warning out, then they've been taking out the voices as they come. He went on in a calmer, more normal voice. That means they know what to look out for, and it probably means they're going to take pains to locate that relay station. If you try to get across the portal and contact anyone, it's just going to draw their attention, and that's the last thing you need to do. Believe me, Sorrel. All right. Sorrel sounded much more subdued, even frightened, and Chan Turgis's jaw tightened as he realized the boy's fear wasn't for himself. He wanted to tell Sorrel how proud he was of him, how much the boy had come to mean to him. But there wasn't time, nor was there really any need not for two voices as deeply linked as they were in this moment. It's going to be, Chen Turgis began, then broke off as the man who'd introduced himself as Alivar Neshek walked over to stand four feet in front of the line of prisoners. It may be, Neshek said reasonably, that some of you, maybe even all of you at this point, don't believe me. Perhaps you believe that by keeping your mouths shut, you'll manage to deprive us of some critical piece of information. But you see, there's a problem with that particular line of logic. We've captured quite a few of you this time. Believe me, even if you manage not to tell me something when I ask, someone else will answer the same question before it's over. Someone else always will. It's just a matter of how many people get hurt first. None of the Sharonians replied, and something inside Nashik purred like a huge hunting cat. He clasped his hands behind himself again, letting himself bob gently up and down on the balls of his feet as he studied their expressions. They seemed less shaken than most of his earlier interrogation subjects had been, he decided. That was interesting, something to bear in mind. Apparently, seeing their fellows ripped apart by griffins was a less shattering experience than being strafed with fireballs or strangled in a cloud of gas. Or perhaps it was simply that the casualty count had been so much lower this time. Come now, he told them almost caressingly. Don't pretend you don't understand what I'm telling you. And think about this. You six have the unfortunate privilege of being the first people I'm going to be asking these questions. There are a lot more where you came from, and truth is that you'll be almost as useful as examples, shall we say, as you'll be as information sources. To be perfectly frank, I don't really care whether you answer my questions or not. Still no one spoke, and Neshek unclasped his hands to reach out and take the Sharonian revolver from Porath. Now, to return to my first question, he said with a bright, friendly smile. Who's your assigned voice? Chanturgis' spine stiffened. He didn't even have to turn his head to know that none of his fellow prisoners as much as glanced in his direction. All of them stared straight ahead, jaws clenched. Perhaps you think I'm joking about the consequences of refusing to answer my questions, the Arcanan said. He raised the H&W with the air of a man who knew how to use it and aimed it at the forehead of petty armsman Urkum Varla, the prisoner at the far end of the line. Trust me, he cocked the hammer. I'm not. Sweat beaded Varla's forehead, but he only pressed his lips more tightly together, and Neshek began to squeeze the trigger. There was no hesitation in him. The emotional aura blasting across the tack room battered Chan Turgis like waves driven by a winter gale, and the voice knew beyond a doubt that the Arcanan was going to fire. Stop! Neshek paused, one eyebrow arching, and glanced sideways at Chan Turgis. You had something you wished to say, he said politely. I'm the voice, Chan Turgis said hoarsely. No, Fulsar, Sorrel cried in the back of his brain, but Chan Turgis's eyes never even flickered from Neshek's face. Are you now, 
The Arcanin glanced at the crystal which had been translating. It glowed with a steady blue, and he nodded. Yes, you are, he said. How convenient. I expected it was going to take longer to find you. Chanturgis said nothing, only looked at him, and Nashik smiled. Now, the next question, I suppose, is whether or not you're the only voice here in the local settlements. Are you? Chanturgis's mind seemed to be speeding faster than ever. The way the Arcanan had checked his crystal suggested it was somehow capable of telling him whether or not Chanturgis was lying. It must be one of these people's preposterous spells, which somehow duplicated a sifter's talent. But how literal-minded was it? I'm the only voice Regiment Captain Velvelig has, he said in flat, hard tones, and the crystal glowed blue again. So you are, Neshek said, and Chanturgis felt Sorrel's whirling emotions from the other end of the link as the boy tasted his own fierce determination to protect him. I'm afraid, Nasha continued, that we've only been able to come up with one way to make certain you voices don't go chattering away to one another. Chanturgis felt his facial muscles tighten, but it was scarcely a surprise, not given the emotions he'd already sensed from this smiling, purring butcher. I'm sure you'll understand, the Arcanan continued moving the revolver from Varla's forehead to Chan Turgis's. Fulsar, Sorrel cried. You can't. There's no more time, Sorrel, Chan Turgis said, and his voice was almost calm. I'm sorry. Tell your parents. Tell them. Someone else here at the fort may remember how I bragged about you. May tell them about you. You've got to run. Hide. Don't let them. The blinding brilliance of the muzzle flash silenced his voice forever. I've got the intelligence summaries for your next couple of objectives, Clermont, 2000 Harshu told 1000 Torok that evening. From what we've been able to put together so far, the next stop, the one in the universe they call Karis, should be easy. But the one after that, in Tracem, that one's going to be the hardest not to crack yet. Really, sir? Torok tried very hard not to let his distaste for the way that intelligence summary had been assembled show. Harshu obviously saw it anyway and gave his head an impatient shake. I know how you feel about Nasha Clamon, and to be honest, it's time I started reining him in. In fact, I have started. I've removed our prisoners from his control, and I've approved 500 Vainair's refusal to release the wounded to him. May I ask why, sir? Torok inquired very carefully. Mostly because we're starting to hit more heavily settled universes, according to what we've already learned. Or we will be shortly, at any rate. Fort Mosinic in Karis isn't much. Your yellows should be able to deal with it without any trouble. But somewhere on the other side of it, we're going to encounter this railroad of theirs. Apparently, they've got quite a large work crew pushing it down chain as quickly as they can, and it's undoubtedly got one of these voices of its own assigned to it. That's going to make problems all by itself. But once we get past that, there's this Fort Salvi in Tracem. I think you'll find the information on the portal itself fascinating reading. Then, once we get past that, there's the fort and a substantial settlement around it. In addition, it appears that there are quite a few farming and ranching villages and homesteads stretched out along the route from Fort Salvi to the next universe— with that many people mucking about, it's highly unlikely that we're going to be able to continue to neutralize this voice net of theirs. There's too much chance of missing a voice hiding in the underbrush, as it were. That means we're going to lose the advantage of surprise, which is going to make any real advance beyond Fort Salby problematic at best. But that's all right, actually. As you know, we've captured quite a few of their maps intact. We still can't read their language, but a couple of my bright young staff officers have been fooling around with our standard recon image interpreting spellware, and they've found a way to adapt it. They're scanning the captured maps into their PCs, and then using the interpreting spellware to compare them to our maps and look for terrain feature matches. Once they find one, the spellware automatically orients the Sharonian maps to ours and scales them accurately, using ours as a base. 
We may not know how to read any of the names on their maps, but we're able to make some detailed appreciations of the terrain on them now, which means we know what the rest of this portal chain looks like, although I could wish we knew more about the rest of their explored chains. At any rate, the maps all confirm what the prisoners say. The Tracem portal is definitely going to be the choke point we've all been looking for, for a lot of reasons. Really, sir? Oh, yes. Harshu smiled thinly. As I say, I think you'll be impressed. The portal itself would be a nightmare for anyone without dragon capability, and the approaches to the portal in Tracem itself are almost as bad. The only ground access to the portal is by way of a valley which is dominated by this Fort Salby. That's one reason I want Salby so badly. I want to be able to control that valley, keep them penned up in it, where we can pound them hard, bleed any effort just to reach the portal. Given their lack of any aerial capability, we should always be able to break off and fall back through the portal if they start pushing us too hard. Excuse me, sir, but if the portal is as defensible as you seem to be suggesting, why should we move beyond it? There seems to be substantial agreement among our current prisoners that the reinforcements their swamp portal commander was anticipating will probably be no more than a week or so out from Fort Salby by the time we can reach the portal. If I were their commander, and if I didn't have transports, then I'd probably think long and hard before even contemplating fighting my way through the portal from Tracem to Karis. On the other hand, we still haven't seen these people's heavy weapons and we don't have any way of predicting the actual combat power of this reinforcement they're expecting. They may think they can force the portal. They might even be right. By taking Salby and controlling the approach valley, we'll be able to start hitting them early. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to get a feel for how their combat capabilities differ from those we've already encountered. I want that feel before it comes down to a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight for the actual portal. If, on the other hand, their basic combat power is as outclassed as our more optimistic junior officers prefer to assume, they may never get past us to the portal in the first place. At any rate, from the topography on these maps, it looks like whoever selected the site for Fort Salby had an excellent eye for terrain. They've definitely put the plug into this valley at its most defensible point, which means it's the logical anchor for us to hang our defensive positions on. In any case, I'm assuming that once we hit the fort itself, word of our presence is going to get out. We won't be able to keep it from spreading up chain to trace them, no matter what we do. And I'm not planning on advancing any farther than trace them anyway. The 2000 shrugged. In light of all that, the intelligence value of anything more Neshek could extract from his prisoners has got to be of strictly limited utility. And quite frankly, I'm delighted that that's the way it is. For just a moment, a haunted, almost haggard expression flickered across Harshu's face. Then he met Torok's eyes levelly. I can't justify continuing to allow him to do the things he's doing unless he's in a position to provide me with genuinely critical information. And that's not going to be the case any longer. I can't pretend I'm not very relieved to hear that, sir, Torok told him after a moment. I know you are, Claremont. Harshu reached across the floating map table in his command tent and patted the Air Force officer's forearm gently. I know you are. There was silence for a moment. Then Harshu inhaled sharply and handed Torok his copy of the current intelligence summary. When you look this over, I think you'll see why this Fort Salby is going to be tough, he said much more briskly. I'll be interested to see if you come to the same conclusions I did about the most effective approach. I don't want to prejudice your thinking, but as you look through the summary, I'd like you to consider... My God, sir, I thought you were dead. As you can see, Silky, we Arpathians are even tougher than you knew. Namir Velvelig's eyes were darker and bleaker than Company Captain Silkash had ever before seen them. Yet his voice held a ghost of genuine amusement. No one's that tough, Silkash said flatly. Remember, I'm the one who triaged you in the first place. You did. Velvelig cocked his head to one side. Odd, I don't recall it. I imagine that's because you were unconscious, almost out of blood, and had serious cranial injuries, not to mention a badly shattered hip, and what I'm almost certain was at least one spinal fracture, Silk Ash told him. The surgeon's face twisted with bitter memory. I black-tagged you. I see. Velvelig reached out and squeezed his friend's shoulder. He understood now why Silk Ash looked the way he did. 
a black tag indicated that there was no point trying to save the patient, that it was time to let him go and concentrate on saving those who might live instead. I don't think your judgment was an error, if that's what's bothering you, Silky, the regiment captain said after a moment. Silk Ash looked skeptical and Velvelig snorted. Look, don't forget these people can work magic. Magic, Silky. And apparently it's not limited solely to better ways to kill people either. You wouldn't believe what I saw their healers doing before they decided I was fit enough to go to jail with the rest of you. If they could fix everything that was wrong with you, they really are wizards, Silk Ash said. Then he grimaced. What? I was just thinking, if they could fix you up as badly hurt as you were, and do it this quickly, no wonder an idiot like Thalmer didn't understand what we were doing. I'll bet you they don't use surgery at all. I don't know about that. Velvelig shook his head. I saw them doing some surgery, but I'd say they only do it for relatively minor injuries. I'm guessing there's some kind of limit on how much healing they can do at any one time with these spells of theirs, so they probably handle the little stuff the hard way and save the magic for really serious problems. But I think you're right about Thalmer, since I saw him walking out of their medical tent unassisted. He and Silk Ash looked at one another, and Velvelig saw the mirror of his own response to the sight of a magically, literally, restored Hadrine Thalmer walking around Fort Gartoon. Of course, it was probably even more complex for Silk Ash than it was for Velvelig. After all, the surgeon was a healer, even if he lacked the talent for it. His oath, as well as his natural personality, required him to want to see any of his patients fully recovered. However stupid, frustrating, detestable, and just plain infuriating the patient in question might be. Well, that's certainly interesting, Silk Ash said after a moment. That's one way to put it. On the other hand, I'm considerably less interested in Thalmer than I am in what else has been going on. I don't know everything that's happened, Silk Ash replied slowly, and Velvelig's spine stiffened at the bleakness which suddenly infused the surgeon's voice. What I do know hasn't been good, though. In that case, Velvelig said, in a tone whose evenness might have deceived anyone who didn't know our Pathians. I suppose... You'd better tell me about it. I'm worried about the horses, Dad, Sorail Targal said. So am I, his father said, patting him on the shoulder. They'll just have to look after themselves for a while, though, just like we will. Sorail nodded, and his father ruffled his hair the way he'd done when Sorail was much younger. The youngster managed to smile, and Kursai gave him a gentle nudge in the direction of the carefully hidden tent. Go help your mother with supper he said quietly. Yes, sir. Sorail nodded again and headed obediently toward the assigned chore. His father watched him go, doing his best to hide the depth of his own concern. It had been just over twelve hours since the fall of Fort Gartoon, and given the strength of the voice talent Sorail had been showing for the last several months, there wouldn't have been a lot of point trying to deceive the boy into thinking his parents weren't frightened. But no father wanted to add to his child's fears. Especially, Kursai thought, his expression turning hard and bleak. When that child had already seen what Sorail had seen in Fulsar Chanturgis's last moments of life. A part of the worried father was furious at the Fort Gartoon voice for inflicting that sort of trauma on his son. And an ignoble part of him was even angrier at Chanturgis for having bragged about Sorail's remarkable talent to other members of the fort's garrison. If the voice had just kept his big mouth shut, and Kursai Targal wouldn't be hiding in the early winter woods, praying that the cold-blooded butchers who shot voices out of hand wouldn't catch up with his son. But most of him knew it was totally irrational to be angry with Chan Turgis. There had been no possible way for the voice to anticipate what had happened, to even guess that his pride in his protege might prove dangerous to Sorail. And if his final voice message to Sorail had been traumatic, it had also been the only thing that had warned Kursai and Raceth to flee. The man warned us with literally the last seconds of his life. He told Sorail to run and hide when he knew he was about to be murdered. Kursai thought, Gods, while he was being murdered, how could anyone be angry with someone who did that? He knew all of that intellectually. It was just his emotions which couldn't quite catch up with the knowledge, which was stupid 
which in turn was one reason he was as irritated with himself as he was. He could actually understand that, although there wasn't anything he could do about it. Not yet. Not when his son might very well already be under sentence of death by the same barbarian butchers who had massacred the Chalgum Consortium crew, and now apparently launched a vicious, unprovoked attack on all Sharonians, even while they were officially negotiating for peace. He grimaced, gazing up at the sky, wondering if one of those eagle lions Sorail had tried to describe to him might already be circling high overhead, spying on them. He'd hidden his encampment as carefully as he could, and he'd used his surveys of the surrounding terrain to pick a spot which offered at least three separate avenues of escape. But if these bastards could literally fly... He grimaced again, and reached into his coat pocket to squeeze the bronze falcon he'd taken out of Sorrel's dresser drawer. Then he turned and made his own way towards the tent. Chapter 24 Senior Sword Barkin Kalser pulled out his navigation unit and glowered at it as his unicorn picked its way through the unforgiving terrain. The hammering these mountains had taken when this universe's portal formed was more extreme than most. It must have been exciting as hell, but Kalser was delighted he hadn't been here to see it. The way it had battered the mountainsides, stripping away trees and soil, leaving naked stone cliffs which rose like ramparts and piling up the wind-driven equivalent of silt behind any sheltering windbreak, had made a complete farce out of the normal maps for this particular piece of terrain. And the fact that the tree cover had been given time to fill back in after the carnage finally tapered off only made things even worse. Or that was the way it seemed to Bark and Kalser, at least. Remember to thank Hundred Worker for this when we get back to base he told himself. The navigation unit took a moment to think about his demands. It usually did when it had to coordinate itself with the take from a griffin-born recon crystal. The spellware that translated the airborne reconnaissance data for a ground-based unit's navigation requirements always seemed to have a glitch or two running around in it. After a few moments, though, the display settled itself, and he snorted with a certain degree of sour amusement. So, there you are. Or oh, there you were, at least, he thought at the red icon glowing in the display's depths. He wished, not for the first time, that there was some way to send the recon crystal's imagery direct from a griffin to a ground unit while the griffin was still in the air. Unfortunately, no one had ever come up with one. The griffin still had to return to base, the crystal had to be extracted from its harness, and then whatever had been recorded had to be downloaded to the units which actually needed it, which meant it was always at least a little out of date by the time it got to the sharp end. Still, it's one hell of a lot better than anything these Seronians have, he reminded himself, and his mouth tightened. He hadn't much cared for anything about the Seronians, even before the invasion actually kicked off. Just listening to the intelligence briefings had told him what sort of barbarians they were. And then there was Magister Halithan's cold-blooded murder. That was one crime no one was ever going to forgive. And Kalser's attitude towards Sharona hadn't gotten one bit better when they found the seared and burned bodies of fifty Narshu and his men. He knew Narshu had to have gotten at least a few of the other side, but there'd been no sign of any Sharonian bodies. Let our men fry in their own fat, or they took theirs with them. Kalser felt a familiar stir of rage and clamped his jaws tight. It had taken the healers quite some time to identify Uthik Dastiri's half-consumed body. When they finally did, though, it was obvious he'd been shot right between the eyes at very close range, before his body was left for the flames like so much garbage. Clearly the Sharonians had continued their practice of shooting their prisoners out of hand. Kalser's teeth grated, and he forced himself to make his jaw muscles relax. It wasn't easy. It especially wasn't easy when he found himself wondering what the Sharonians had done, or perhaps were even now continuing to do, to Rithmar Skirvan and the two missing members of his military escort. Well, they made the rules, Senior Sword Council told himself grimly. Now they can just take the consequences. All right he told the rest of the half-troop of cavalry hundred worker had assigned to him. According to this, he waved the navigation unit at them. 
We're getting damned close. In fact, I think they're probably up there, under that overhang. Kursai Targal swallowed a curse. He'd hoped to escape discovery entirely, but it didn't look like things were going to work out that way. One of those God's damned eagle lions Sorrel was talking about, I'll bet, he thought bleakly. It wasn't a happy thought, and watching the speed and nimbleness of the weird-looking horned horses under the Arcanans searching for them didn't make it any happier. The way those things covered ground made it obvious that Raceth, Sorrel, and he could never hope to stay away from them on foot. Not when they had airborne spies to tell them exactly where their prey had gone. Kursai looked down at the rifle in his hands. He was tempted, so tempted, to use it. But there were at least fourteen or fifteen of them. He probably could have picked off several of them, but he'd never get them all. And if he started the shooting, there could be only one possible outcome. Sorrel, he said quietly. Yes, sir. Take the rifle. Then I want you and your mother to go hide up at the top of the ravine. But don't argue, Sorrel. There's no time for it. Kursai turned his head and looked at his son there in the windy, sun-dappled afternoon and wished there were time. Wished he didn't have to be brusque with the boy he loved so much on this of all days. You have to go now, son, he said more gently. I need you up there looking after your mother. Now go. Take care of her, understand? Yes, Dad. Sorrel's voice was low, wavering around the edges despite his effort to keep it steady and Kursai put an arm around him and hugged him tightly. I love you, Sorrel. I love you very much. The boy looked back at him, mouth working, unable to speak at all this time, and Kursai gave him one last squeeze. Now go, he said softly, and Sorrel obeyed him. Kursai watched him go, and looked back down at the horseman, if that was the right term for someone mounted on such preposterous creatures, advancing steadily, towards his position. He needed a little more time for Sorrel and Raceth to reach the next hiding spot he picked out for them. Besides, he wasn't in any great hurry for what he knew he needed to do. He lay there, stretched out on the rock, savoring the caress of the surprisingly warm sun on his shoulders, and waited. Kauser and his mounted troops had almost reached the coordinates from the recon griffin's overflight when a man stood up in front of them. Kausa reined in his unicorn so abruptly the beast snorted and tossed its head in protest, and his eyes flitted about. The single Sharonian standing in front of him wore civilian clothes, and Kausa didn't see any sign of a revolver or a rifle. That didn't mean much, though. There could have been half a dozen more of them hidden away in the rocks and trees, every one of them with one of those accursed rifles waiting to blow him and his men out of their saddles. The Sharonian, a youngish, red-haired fellow, kept his hands in plain sight and just stood there, watching Kalser. His expression was remarkably calm, but Kalser could see the tension hovering in his tight shoulders and the way he held himself absolutely motionless. Good, the senior sword thought harshly. Go ahead and sweat, you bastard. Finally, the Sharonian spoke. It was only so much gibberish and Kalser reached into a cargo pocket and extracted a PC loaded with 500 Neshek's translation spellware. What? he barked. What did you say? Fulsar Chanturges had kept Sorrel informed on all of the non-classified details of the Fallen Timbers negotiations, and Sorrel had shared those reports with his parents. So Kursai had at least heard about the Arcanans' magical translating rocks. Even so, actually seeing and hearing one came as more of a surprise than he'd expected. Still, it wasn't as if it had come at him completely cold, and he drew a deep breath. I asked you what you want, he repeated in the steadiest voice he could manage. What do you think we want? The man who seemed to be in charge shot back. He sounded angry, and Kursai hoped that was only a trick of the translating magic. I don't know, he said as reasonably as he could. You're obviously soldiers. I'm not. And as you can see, I'm not even armed. He opened his coat carefully, aware of the dozen or so crossbows aimed straight at him. He held it open, letting them see that the garment had concealed no shoulder holster or other hidden weapon. So you're not a soldier, hey? 
the mounted man said with a scornful expression. No, of course not, Kursai replied. So, if you're not a soldier, why are you hiding out here? Why? This time Kursai let a little incredulity into his tone. You've invaded us. As far as I can see, it only makes sense to stay out of your way. Kalser had to admit the other man had a point. In fact, he had a better point than he knew. One of the troopers behind him stirred uneasily. Kalser sensed the motion and turned his head to give the offender a savage glare, and the man froze. Lily-livid bastard, Kalser thought. Probably one of those pricks who stays up all night moaning over the Corellian Accords. These bastards started the massacre, and 500 Neshek's right about taking chances with these talents of theirs. So, civilian, he said, what's your name? Kursai looked up at the cavalry commander. The Arcanan wasn't looking back at him. Instead, his attention appeared to be focused on the crystal in his hand, and Kursai's eyes narrowed as he remembered what Surreal had told him about Chan Turgis's last transmission, about the crystal which had flashed blue like some sort of inanimate sifter. Surreal, he said quietly and truthfully. Surreal Targal. Kalser grunted in satisfaction as the verifier spell in the PC blinked with blue confirmation. The Sharonian looked older than he'd expected, but then again, the man who'd given the name to 500 Neshek probably hadn't been in the best possible condition when he'd done so. Besides, nobody at the fort, except for the military voice assigned to it, had ever actually met this Surreal as far as anyone knew. Stand where you are, he commanded, then nodded to two of his men. Take a look, he said. The selected troopers climbed down, passing their reins to one of their fellows, and advanced on the Sharonian. The PC had translated Kalser's order to them into Sharonian as well, and the civilian obviously knew what was coming. He made no effort to resist, although Kalser's men were no gentler than they had to be. They were, however, thorough, and one of them grimaced, then waved a small bronze falcon-shaped badge triumphantly. Kalser reached down and took it letting it lie in his palm. Then he looked back at the man from whom it had been taken. So, you're a voice. Kursai kept his mouth shut. It wasn't easy. His heart raced, and he could feel the air fluttering in and out of his lungs. He knew now what was coming, and he felt the sweat beating on his brow. A part of him wanted desperately to answer the Arcanan's questions truthfully. Another part wanted even more desperately to lie but the truth would probably have been useless, and the lie would probably have been detected. He clenched his fists at his side, standing between the two men who had searched him and who still held his elbows. There was a reason he'd brought that badge along. He'd hoped it would never be needed, that this moment would never come. But the moment had come, and he found himself clinging to his love for his son and his wife, as he gazed silently up at the hard-faced, hard-eyed, Arcanan. So the griffin's got your tongue, has it, civilian? Kalser demanded. The Sharonian only looked back up at him, and the senior sword felt a cold, hard sense of satisfaction. The man's very silence was proof he was exactly what Kalser had been sent out here to find. Not that denying the truth would have done him any good in the face of the verifier spells 500 Neshek had loaded to Kalser's crystal. Not so talkative now, I see, he said sliding the PC back into his pocket, now that it was no longer needed. Still, the Sharonian only looked at him, and Kalser shrugged. The senior sword wasn't going to shed any tears over what needed to be done. For that matter, he wasn't going to pretend he didn't take an intense, personal satisfaction out of it. But unlike the Sharonians who'd murdered their Arcanan prisoners, Kalser saw no need for brutality. He looked at the two men flanking their prisoner, and nodded. Quick and clean, he thought approvingly, as the blood fountained from the voice's slashed throat. Quick and clean. He looked down at the crumpled body, which seemed smaller, the way dead men almost always did, then looked up at the sky, remembering another day, other bodies. Leave him, mount up, he said flatly and the dismounted troopers hesitated only for a moment before they obeyed. Kalser gave the corpse one more look, 
then reined his unicorn's head around and started back the way they'd come, leaving the body for the buzzards. If it was good enough for Fifty Nashu and his men, it's good enough for that bastard, he thought, and never looked back, even once. Overall, I like your attack plan, Clamon, 2000 Harshu said. The only thing I wonder about is whether it wouldn't be better to go ahead and commit the Griffins first. They were suddenly effective enough at Fort Gartoon. Yes, they were, sir, Torok agreed. But we also lost over a dozen of them. Practically all to that one damned lunatic with the, what do you call it, the shotgun, Harshu pointed out. True, Torok nodded. Still, it did cost us 10% of our total Griffin strength. I'd like to conserve that, especially if we end up needing it for Fort Selby. Harshu cocked his head, then frowned slightly when the command tent's canvas flapped gently in the brisk early afternoon breeze. That's a logical argument, Clamon. Why do I think it's not the only one? There is one other thing, Torok admitted slowly, reminding himself once again that there was a keenly intelligent, highly observant brain behind those intense eyes. I wouldn't call it a logical argument exactly, but it is causing me a little concern. Well, what is it? It's just that some of the griffin handlers are reporting that the compulsion spells don't seem to be working with 100% effectiveness. What? Harshu's eyes narrowed. What do they mean? That's just it, sir. They don't seem to be able to point to any one area in which the spells are malfunctioning. In fact, it's more of a feeling, I guess you'd say, than anything else. Harshu looked more than mildly incredulous, and Torok shrugged. I didn't say I'd observed any problems, sir. I just said the griffin handlers are expressing concerns, some of them at any rate. And to be completely honest, I've never been a griffin handler. I know that anyone who does that job successfully for very long has to develop particularly acute instincts where the griffins are concerned, though. So they could well be seeing something I'm not. Whatever's happening, it's making them a bit worried. Let's face it, sir, it's not exactly a safe job. This time, Harshu nodded slowly. In fact, Griffin handling was one of the more dangerous Air Force specializations. Not a year went by that at least one Griffin handler wasn't turned upon by his attack Griffins. People who did the job for very long had to develop a feel for when one of the hyper-aggressive creatures was hovering on the brink of breaking the compulsion spells, which normally kept its ferocity under control. Do you think there really is a problem? The 2000 asked. Or do they just think there is? Honestly, sir, I don't know. I only know there's a certain level of anxiety, and I'd just as soon let them stay where they are for right now. If we need them, we can use them. But if we don't need them, then why not let the handlers settle down a bit before we have to commit them somewhere else? I don't suppose I can argue with that, Harshu conceded. Especially when the fellow arguing in favor of it is the one who successfully punched out every fort we've encountered so far. Torok nodded slightly at the implied compliment, then waved one hand at the map on the table. As you see, he said, indicating a red pushpin, our advance parties located an appropriate oasis for our forward staging point. We're still going to have to fly in a lot of water, though, sir. That's going to cut into our total lift capability. That's why my assault plan calls for leaving the heavy cavalry behind, at least temporarily. They're going to be of limited utility in taking out the fort itself, under the proposed operations plan, and leaving the heavy cav behind gives us the best trade-off for holding water. Agreed, Harshu nodded. It's going to cost us a couple of days before we can move on Fort Salby, you understand, sir? We're going to have to use up some additional transport flights, leapfrogging them forward to Fort Mosinik before we can ship them the rest of the way to Trisum. Understood, Harshu said. That only leaves the question of exactly what to do about this after we punch out Mosinek. Harshu tapped another pushpin, then looked up at his commanding officer. I viewed the imagery from the recon griffin, sir. These people may not have magic, but seeing the kind of engineering they're capable of is, well, it's impressive as hell, is what it is, sir. I'd like your guidance on exactly how we want to approach it. I wish I were going with you, Iftar, Thurman Ulthar said quietly, 
as he watched his brother-in-law strapping up his backpack. Don't be silly, Iftar Helsick looked up at him and shook his head. You've sure as hell earned a little more rest, Thurman. Maybe. Ulthar moved his newly healed shoulder gingerly. His stint as a prisoner of war of people who didn't have magistrons had given him a whole new appreciation for modern medicine. The fact that he'd recovered the shoulder's full range of motion literally overnight would have been wonderful enough. But it was also the first time he'd been truly pain-free in literally months. He luxuriated in the sensation, but even as he delighted in the absence of pain, that very delight brought home the thing that most concerned him. It's not the rest I'm worried about, he admitted, and Halesack frowned. What is worrying you? the Garthon asked. You're still not feeling guilty of what that bastard Neshek did, are you? Actually, I am. Ulthar's expression was profoundly unhappy. I should have said something. Stopped him. By the time you were out of the healer's hands and knew what the hell was going on, two thousand Harshu and thousand Torok had already put a stop to it, Halesack pointed out. This time at least, he added. Ulthar's mouth tightened and Halesack shook his head. I'm telling you, Thurman, let it lie, for now at least. I don't know what else is going on, but it looks to me like the two thousands decided to put a muzzle on Nashuk. If that's the case, then he's not going to be torturing or murdering any more POWs, which means you don't have to play the noble Andarin paladin in shining armor, and maybe get your full self killed trying to stop it. Not trying to stop Neshek, anyway, Ulthar muttered. And what does that mean? Halesack demanded. They're leaving Thalmer in command here. Thalmer? Halesack frowned in surprise. Who had that brainstorm? I think it was 500 Isrian. How wonderful! Halesack looked as disgusted as he sounded. Chalbus Isrian was one of 2000 Harshu's senior battalion commanders. He was also one of the officers who'd argued most forcefully in support of Neshek's plan for dealing with the voice net. Exactly. It may not be that bad, Halesick said, but he sounded as if he were arguing with himself, not his brother-in-law, and he knew it. I hope not, Ulthar said bleakly, but the fact is, Thalmer is a frigging idiot at the best of times, and I've got a feeling, a really bad feeling, Iftar, that he's just been biding his time. He blames the Sharonians for what happened to us, instead of blaming his own stupidity, and I think he broke off with a shrug. You think what? Halesick asked sharply. I think he'll never believe the Sharonians were really trying to help him. I know their healers testified that they were on the verifier, and as far as I know, no one's ever been able to fool the verification spells. I know I'm convinced they were doing their best to help me but I don't think there's enough evidence in the multiverse to convince Thalmer of that. And what really scares me is how stupid he proved he could be before he was wounded. Gods alone know how much stupider he's capable of being now. Wonderful, Halesick repeated with a sigh, then shook his head. Thanks a lot, Thurman. Now you've almost got me wishing you were coming along with us. All right, Commander of 500 Serlos Murr said, looking around the briefing tent at the circle of faces one last time. It was pitch black outside the tent's canvas walls, but the spell-powered light globes illuminated its interior brilliantly. All of you know what you're supposed to do. Now let's go get the job done. Right? Right. The one-word response came back in a strong, confident rumble of voices, and Murr nodded in satisfaction, mostly. He looked around at his flight and strike commanders, their losses in the first attack had come as a shock to all of them, but since then they'd scored an unbroken string of successes and advanced the better part of 3,000 miles in barely 11 days, without the loss of a single additional dragon. It was the sort of operation they'd trained at in maneuvers for years, and never really expected to have the opportunity to mount, and they knew they'd performed brilliantly so far, which explained why their faith in themselves went far beyond mere confidence now. They viewed themselves as an elite and there was a brashness, a swagger in them. That's good, Murr told himself. Dragon pilots are supposed to know they have big brass ones, that they're the best of the best. But there was still that tiny, tiny flaw in his satisfaction, that sense that too much faith in themselves might still lead them to take one chance too many, to push that little bit 
too hard. And just what do you want to do about it, Solos? He asked himself. You want to make them less confident before you send them out on an op? There could be only one answer to that question, he reflected, and had to smile at his own perversity. It's just your own cross-grained cussedness, he scolded himself. You'd find something to be upset about even if you fell into a vat of beer. All right, he repeated again. We've got another fort to burn. Let's get them in the air, gentlemen. Chapter 25 Janicky Chan Kalarath sat in the tiny sitting room attached to his quarters and gazed out at the salmon-colored sky as dawn came to Fort Salby. The lack of handy trees had enforced a different building plan on Fort Salby, and the time and the presence of the TTE construction crews, which had been required for the Tracem cut, had provided the labor force and materials to execute that plan. Instead of the wooden palisades which surrounded most portal forts, at least until permanent long-term settlements went in, Salby had been built from a combination of stone and adobe. It had also been built on a considerably larger scale, since it was intended from the outset to be the permanent administrative center for this portal. Its walls, and those of its internal structures, were not only tougher, they were also considerably thicker than those of most portal forts as well, which helped their interiors stay cooler during the worst of the day's heat. And it also makes them a hell of a lot tougher, the crown prince thought almost calmly, almost. The morning was still cool, chill, as the dry, semi-desert air waited for the sun's heat. It was very quiet, and the calm tranquility swept over him, made even stiller and calmer somehow by the chaos swirling within him. Talina slept on the perch stand just inside the window, and his eyes lingered on her. There were ghosts in those gray eyes, ghosts which hadn't been there the day before, the same ghosts which had haunted many a Calarath's eyes over the millennia. Guess there's no such thing as a weak Calarath talent after all, under the right circumstances, or the wrong ones, he thought. Too bad. There are some things I'd really rather not know about. The glimpse wasn't entirely clear yet, but it was becoming that way. And as it clarified, dropped into focus, he understood exactly why it had been so strong in the first place. I need to tell Regiment Captain Chance Skrithik, but if I do... Janicky grimaced. The problem was that he couldn't just tell the regiment captain. Certainly, he couldn't tell Chan Skrithik everything. There was still more he had to find out, more he had to squeeze out of the glimpse. And there was only one way he could do that. He stood and walked to the window, leaning on the thick sill, and his face was grim. What have they done to you, sir? He sent the question out into the shadows of his mind. There was no answer, of course, and he closed his eyes against a brief, sharp stab of pain. If what he'd already glimpsed was true, there was no point trying to send a warning to Regiment Captain Velvelig. Not now. If he'd only had it a few days, maybe even one day sooner, then maybe he could have alerted Fort Gartoon, done something different. But he hadn't had it soon enough, and now there was nothing he could do. Not for Velvelig and Fort Gartoon, at any rate or for that matter, Fort Mosinic, and perhaps it had to be that way all along. He gave himself a shake, sucked in a huge lungful of the cool air, and straightened his shoulders. Go ahead and sleep, dear heart, he murmured, touching the sleeping falcon's folded wings ever so lightly. I've got to go talk to someone. Rolf Chan Skrithik was not amused. Technically, he supposed it might be argued, in light of the extraordinary orders he'd received, that his early morning caller was no longer a platoon captain, in which case he had to be considered the crown prince of Ternathia. Actually, of all of Sharona, although his father's formal coronation wasn't due for almost two weeks yet. But whatever the young man's official status might be, having someone knock on the front door of his quarters before he'd had time for breakfast, or even the strong cup of coffee it took to start his mental processes every morning, was irritating. I'm sorry to intrude so early, sir, Janicky Chan Kalarath said, almost as if he'd read Chan Skrithik's mind. I wouldn't have, if it weren't vital that I speak to you as soon as possible. About what? 
Chen Skrithik managed to keep the bite out of his tone somehow. Sir, Janaki inhaled deeply, I have to tell you that I've experienced a glimpse, a major glimpse. Chen Skrithik's irritation vanished instantly, snuffed by an arctic wind as he looked into Janaki's gray eyes. What sort of glimpse, your highness? He asked in a totally different voice. It's not complete yet, sir, Janaki said with a grimace of frustration. To be honest, my talent isn't as strong as father's, and it's a lot weaker than my sister Andred's. It's still coming into focus, and it's going to take a while longer before it comes clear, or as clear as it's going to come at any rate. I'm afraid glimpses aren't quite as cut and dried as the normal precog. I understand that, your highness. At the same time, Chen Skrithik managed a tight smile. I don't imagine you'd be telling me about it at this point, if you didn't at least have a pretty shrewd notion of where it was headed. And, the regiment captain's eyes sharpened, unless it concerned Fort Salby or something else along those lines. You're right, sir. It does. Concern Fort Salby, I mean. Janicki's nostrils flared. I know this is going to sound preposterous, at least at first, but, well, Fort Salby is going to be attacked. What? Despite his total faith in the power of the Kalarath talent, Rolf Chan Skrithik felt a moment of sheer incredulity. Janicki couldn't be serious. But when he looked into that young face, so much like a younger version of the official portrait of Emperor Zindel hanging in his office, any temptation towards disbelief vanished. Attacked by whom, your highness? He asked instead. Then he shook his head in irritation. That's a stupid question, I suppose, isn't it? Who else could it be? I know it sounds crazy, sir, Janicki said, but some of the details I've managed to strain out of the glimpse might explain how they could get this far up chain this quickly. Mind you, I don't know how they did it without any sort of warning getting out, but the short version is that they've got something I can only describe as dragons. Dragons? Chen Skrithik repeated very carefully, and Janicki snorted a humorless laugh. I did mention that I knew it was going to sound crazy, he reminded Fort Salby's commanding officer. Unfortunately, I don't know what else to call them. They're big. In fact, they're God's damned huge from what I've glimpsed so far. And they can fly. Not only that, they breathe fire and other things. Chan Skrithik sat back in his chair, examining his future emperor's face very carefully. Then he drew a deep breath of his own, and pointed at the chair on the other side of the table. If you'll forgive me, your highness, I haven't eaten yet this morning, and my brain doesn't work very well without its morning infusion of caffeine. Why don't you join me for breakfast, and tell me just what in Vothan's name is going on? Sometime within the next few days, company captain, Janicki said a couple of hours later. I wish I could be more specific than that. But that's not the way glimpses work, not for me at any rate. I only know it's coming, and that they've somehow kept any advance warning from getting out. And that petty Captain Chen Dharma, he nodded at the only officer present who was even more junior than he was, has been unable to raise Fort Mosinik's voice this morning. I see. Company Captain Vargan frowned thoughtfully, then shrugged. No one can have everything, your highness. The fact that we know they're coming at all is more than we really had any right to expect. Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik nodded in agreement. He, Vargan, Petty Captain Kalia Chen Dharma, Chan Skrithik's assigned voice, and Sun Lord Markin sat in a row of chairs facing Janicki as he stood in front of a large scale, detailed topographical map of Fort Salby and the surrounding territory. Janicki felt remarkably like a junior student, called upon to read his latest research paper aloud to a visiting delegation of department heads. Not all of whom seemed particularly enthralled by his presentation. As company Captain Vargan says, we are fortunate to know as much as we do, Sun Lord Markin agreed after a moment, but the Euromathian cavalry commander's expression was more shuttered than the Shakali's. He gazed at Janicki with cool, thoughtful eyes, then cocked his head. Forgive me, your highness, but I appear to be somewhat less familiar with the nature of your family's talent than my colleagues are. Or perhaps I should say that I am less familiar with its limitations. May I ask a question or two? Of course, Lord of course, Janicki replied. 
The entire briefing felt awkward. Partly, that was the inevitable result of the fact that his glimpse remained less than complete at this point. Partly, it was because despite his official separation from PAAF service, he still wore the uniform of the Imperial Ternathian Marines, and would continue to do so until he reached home and formally mustered out, which made him the most junior officer in the room, despite his exalted birth. And partly, it was because Markin's ambivalent feelings, where he was concerned, had been evident from the very beginning. The Sun Lord seemed inclined towards skepticism, as if he suspected Janicki as the heir to the throne, which Eurymathia had never quite managed to best or equal, of trying to use and manipulate him. Janicki didn't like that last point very much, but there was no use pretending it wasn't true. Or, for that matter, pretending it would have been reasonable to expect any other response out of a senior noble of the Ternathian Empire's greatest rival. You say that your glimpse indicates we will be attacked here shortly, Markin said in excellent, although accented and somewhat overly formal, Ternathian. I understand that you cannot tell us exactly when, not yet at any rate, but the question in my mind is whether the fact that you have warned us at all will not alter the events you have glimpsed, and so invalidate the entire glimpse, in part or in whole. I see what you're asking, Sun Lord. Janicki gazed at the Eurymathian for a second or two, while he considered how best to answer the question. First, anything that might be altered would happen downstream from the initial attack itself, he said. The Arcanians' decision to attack us, the approach route they're likely to take, the timing of the attack, all of those are governed by circumstances which almost certainly can't and won't be changed by any actions we take prior to their arrival here in response to my glimpse. That's not absolutely guaranteed, of course, but it's very, very likely. Second, glimpses are never as clear as straight precognition. Because they relate to the actions and decisions of human beings, they're more flexible, more amorphous, I suppose. Any glimpse is in a state of flux right up to the moment the events it concerns actually occur. That's one reason they're sometimes so difficult to interpret or describe to anyone else. Some aspects are very clear and tend to remain that way. Those are what we think of as the core aspects of a glimpse. According to the latest theory on how glimpses work, what someone with my talent actually sees is the most likely outcome of human actions and decisions from a potentially huge number of closely parallel universes, he shrugged. I'm not positive the theory is accurate, but it seems to hold up, and according to it, those core aspects represent the points in a glimpse at which the decision trees of all those universes flow together most strongly, where the outcomes we see are most statistically likely to occur. The less clear aspects are the ones in which the decision trees have greater numbers of branches, so there's less certainty as to which ones are going to be chosen. He paused again, watching Markin's face. After a few moments, the Euromathian nodded in understanding, and Janicki continued. Up until the moment this attack actually begins, the decision trees are already pretty well set. Oh, it's possible that if we do something in preparation and they find out about it, they might alter their plans as a result. It's unlikely, though, and I don't expect any pre-attack portions of my glimpse to change very much. Once the attack does begin, things get more complicated, and at that point, what we do to meet the attack is definitely going to affect the possible decisions and actions of our adversaries as they respond to our responses. However, that's where what we refer to as the fugue state of my family's talent comes into play. Roth Chan Skrithik shifted slightly in his chair. He seemed about to say something, but Janicki gave him the sort of look platoon captains weren't supposed to give regiment captains, and the fort's commander kept his mouth firmly shut. He still looked more than a little unhappy, though, and Janicki understood why. Some aspects of the Calarath talent were carefully not talked about, including this one. Fugue? State? Your Highness? Markin repeated. From his tone, which was no more than politely inquiring, one might have been fooled into thinking he'd failed to notice Chan Skrithik's unhappiness, Janicki thought with a wry mental smile. No one can deliberately summon or induce a glimpse, Sun Lord. Although my family's obviously been experiencing them for a long time, there are some things about glimpses 
no one has ever been able to explain satisfactorily. And we've never been able to make our talent perform to order, as it were. There are certain sets of circumstances which seem more likely to trigger glimpses, but no one's ever been able to find a way to do it at will. One thing we do know, though, is that once someone with a talent experiences a major glimpse, that person almost always finds himself experiencing a sort of continuous glimpse if he himself is directly involved in the events as they occur. Markin's eyes sharpened in sudden intense speculation, and Janicky smiled again a bit more tartly. That's right, Sunlord, he confirmed. That's why battlefield glimpses have served my family so well upon occasion. It doesn't always happen. For that matter, the occasions on which someone finds himself an actual participant in his own glimpses are rare, to say the very least. But the odds are very good that my own involvement in whatever happens here will trigger the fugue state, in which case I'll be able to predict probably at least several minutes ahead of time, and possibly quite a bit better than that, how events are going to depart from my original glimpse. With all due respect, your highness, Chen Skrithik began. I don't think having you, regiment captain. Janicky's quiet voice cut Chan Skrithik off like a knife. Fort Salby's commander looked at him and Janicky looked back. Even with Sun Lord Markin's men added to your own, you have fewer than 4,000 men, the crown prince of Ternathia said. And you've got better than 2,000 civilians to protect right here at Salby. Then there are the TTE work crews out of the railhead. And, your highness? Chan Skrithik prompted when Janicky paused. You've got at least eight to 10,000 men coming at you, sir, Janicky said flatly, with dragons and those lion-eagle things, and the gods alone know what other magic weapons. If you're going to hold your position and protect the people around you, the Sharonian civilians around you, then you're going to need me right here. But we're not going to argue about this, Regiment Captain. Janicky looked Chan Skrithik straight in the eye. It's the job of an Imperial Marine to protect civilians. It's the job of any member of the Empire's nobility to protect civilians. And it's the job of a Kalarath to protect civilians. Who those civilians are, where they came from, and how many of them there may be, is beside the point. Chan Skrithik looked prepared to go right on arguing, but then he stopped. He gazed at Janicky for several seconds, and Janicky wondered exactly what the regiment captain was seeing in that moment. In one sense, he was clearly Chan Skrithik's subordinate, a junior officer the regiment captain had every right to order to the rear if he so chose. But he was also the crown prince of Ternathia, the crown prince of Sharona, elect. And what he'd just said had been the tradition of the Kalarath dynasty, literally for millennia. It was that long, dusty line of ancestors Chan Skrithik saw standing behind him, Janicky decided. There were times when being the heir to the oldest ruling family in the history of mankind had its advantages. Granting what you've just said, your highness, the regiment captain said instead of whatever he'd been about to say, the fact remains that you can't be positive your participation will trigger fugue state. If it doesn't, then having you here would be a pointless and potentially very expensive mistake. I agree. Janicky replied steadily, and as I say, I can't guarantee it will happen. But what I've already glimpsed includes seeing myself in fugue state. He really didn't like admitting that bit, but it was the best way to convince Chan Skrithik. That's why I think it's a virtual certainty that it will happen. And the same bits and pieces of glimpse in which I've seen that have also shown me that you're going to need me if you hope to hold this position. Chan Skrithik flinched slightly. Then, slowly and manifestly unhappily, he nodded. Janicky nodded back, grateful that some of the aspects of the Kalarath talent were so closely held. It would never have done for Chan Skrithik to truly understand what Janicky had just told him. Assuming that His Highness's glimpse is indeed accurate, Markin said after a moment, then it's obvious. We must warn the higher authority and inform them of what must already have transpired down chain from here. Agreed, Sun Lord, Chan Skrithik said, glancing at Chan Dharma. And we need to warn Olver Banchu and the rest of his work crew. We need to do more than just warn them, sir, Vargan said. 
There's no way we could pull all of them back to safety in the time we appear to have. To my mind, that suggests we have to send a detachment forward to help defend them. But if they are too obviously anticipating attack, Markin pointed out in a completely neutral tone, and if the Arcanans realize that, then they are not likely to alter the attack plan His Highness has glimpsed. Vargan's expression tightened, but Janicki raised one hand before the company captain could speak. I'm afraid the Sun Lord has a valid point, company captain. On the other hand, there are some fragmentary bits and pieces of glimpse, which suggest pretty strongly that the Arcanans aren't planning to attack the railhead itself until after they've dealt with Fort Salvi. With your permission, your highness, Petty Captain Chan Dharma said before Vargan could respond. Yes, what you've just said makes a lot of sense, actually. It does? Vargan looked skeptical, and Chan Dharma shrugged slightly, his expression grim. As His Highness has already pointed out, somehow they've kept any hint of warning from reaching us, sir. They couldn't have done that by accident. That means they have to know about the voice net, and that they've somehow been eliminating or at least silencing the links and the chain as they advance. If that's the case, though, then when they see a labor force as huge as the one Engineer Banshu has out there, they're going to have to anticipate that there's a voice assigned to it and I doubt very much that they could believe it would be possible to completely take out that many people that widely dispersed before the voice in question got a warning off. He's right, Orkham, Chan Skrithik said. They'll probably count on cutting the voice net chain here at Salby, or else slipping a raiding force past us to find and take out the next relay station up chain. But they're not going to want to risk the construction crews warning us that they're coming before they get here. I still think we should beef up their security, sir. Vargan said after a few moments. I know most of them already have their personal weapons, and gods know they've got enough heavy equipment to dig themselves in deep. For that matter, a lot of them are veterans, but most of them are still civilians. I'd certainly be willing to do that, Chan Skrithik agreed. Then he smiled nastily. Suppose we mount a couple of Yurthics on flat cars and send them down to Banshu. We could send along a rifle company to back them up, of course. And what about sending along platoon Captain Chan Morak as well? Vargan considered the suggestion. Platoon Captain Harak Chan Morak was Company Captain Maris Nalkar's senior assistant, and Nalkar was Fort Salby's senior combat engineer officer. I think that would be a very good idea, sir, he said after a moment. Good, Chan Skrithik said then turned his attention back to Janicki. The regiment captain remained obviously unhappy about the notion of Janicki's remaining at Fort Salby, but he equally obviously knew it was going to happen anyway, which meant it was time to make the best possible use of the resource Janicki represented. Very well, your highness. What can your glimpse tell us about their probable attack plan? Well, regiment captain, from what I've seen so far, They'll open the attack with a strike by those dragons of theirs. They'll come in this way. He turned to trace a line from the Tracem Karis portal through the mountainous terrain to Fort Salvi. And apparently the range of their breath weapons, for want of a better term, is fairly limited. They have to get in close, so I'd say they're going to go for surprise. Which means... He went on talking, outlining what he already knew. And even as he spoke, other bits and pieces of glimpses roiled through the back of his brain like unquiet ghosts. Be patient, he told those ghosts. Be patient. I'll be with you soon enough. Chapter 26 Sir, sir, wake up, please. Division Captain Chan Jaraith twitched awake. His eyes snapped open and his right hand reached up and closed on the wrist of the hand which had been gently but insistently shaking his shoulder. What? He blinked, summoning himself back from the depths of sleep, then sat up quickly, eyes narrowing, as he realized he'd been awakened not by his batman, but by Company Captain Chan Corthel. What is it? He asked his staff, voice more sharply. Sir, I've just received an urgent message. It's for you from Crown Prince Janicki. Chandraith's expression didn't even flicker, but he twitched internally in surprise. From the Crown Prince, 
he repeated in the tone of someone who wanted to be absolutely certain he'd understood correctly. Not from his majesty? That's correct, sir. Chan Corthel's expression, Chan Jeraith noticed, was tight and worried, and his own inner tension clicked up another notch. He started to reach for the bedside lamp to turn up the wick, then snorted and diverted his hand to the window shade above his berth instead. Like most transuniversal travelers embarked on a lengthy journey by rail, the men of Chan Jeraith's division hadn't bothered to reset their watches or readjust their internal clocks. They weren't spending long enough in any one universe to even try to acclimate themselves to local time zones, so they might as well wait for that until they reached their destination, which meant that it was the middle of the night by Chan Jeraith's body's time sense, but brilliant sunlight was leaking in around the edges of the window shade as it swayed and bounced gently with the staff car's movement. He raised it a fraction of an inch, letting natural light illuminate his sleeping compartment, then stood. After so long, he thought as he shrugged into the robe his batman had left ready on the bedside chair, it would have felt unnatural not to have the floor vibrating and swaying underfoot. He belted the robe, then turned back to Chan Corthel. All right, Lazar, what's this message? Chan Corthel looked at him for a moment, then closed his eyes. Because Chan Jeraith had no talent at all, he required the services of a particularly competent voice and Lissar Chan Corthel filled that requirement admirably. When he began to speak a heartbeat later, it was not his voice Chan Jeraith heard. It was the voice of his future emperor, perfectly reproduced. That was Chan Jeraith's first thought. Then the words Chan Corthel was relaying so perfectly registered, and Arlos Chan Jeraith's face froze almost as solid as the ice forming in his veins. So that's the situation, Division Captain, Janaki Chan Kalarath said through Chan Corthel's mouth the better part of fifteen minutes later. What I've seen so far explains a lot about the Arcanans' transport and combat capabilities, but I still don't have a clue why they're doing this. The fact that we haven't heard a word from Company Captain Chantesh, Regiment Captain Velvelig, or any of our other outposts seems to me to represent clear proof that this is a carefully planned, well-thought-out offensive, which they must have been putting together the entire time they've been ostensibly negotiating with us. What that says about their ambitions and ultimate intentions, much less about whether or not there's any point even attempting to treat with them, is more than I'm prepared to speculate about at this point. I've relayed as many details of my glimpses to your staff voice as I could. Unfortunately, those glimpses are not yet complete. If and as the opportunity arises, I'll send additional details. At this time, my best estimate is that we'll be attacked here within no more than 48 hours, and probably sooner than that. Preparations to meet that attack are underway. In my judgment, my presence here will be necessary if that attack is to be successfully resisted. Chandraith's face was carved from stone. The young man who had sent him this warning was vital to the successful unification of his planet. His life, his function in that unification process, were vastly more important than the defense of a single portal fortress and the town about it. There was absolutely no question in Arlo's Chan Jeraith's mind on that point. And unlike Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik, he was a full division captain, so... That's all I can tell you right now, sir, Janaki said. Except to add this. Chanika, Sari, Halian, Showarak. The division captain's eyes closed and the stone of his face twisted. For an instant, he looked twenty years older. Then he inhaled deeply and nodded. Shawarak, your highness, he murmured. Chan Corthel's eyes opened. Like any voice with the monumentally high security clearance the company captain had to carry in order to serve as Chan Jeraith's staff voice, he knew there were questions which would never be answered that he would transmit information again and again which meant a great deal to its recipients, but nothing at all to him. As Chan Jeraith looked into the younger man's eyes, he saw Chan Corthel's curiosity and his awareness that this was going to be one of those times. And he was right. Thank you, Lissar, the division captain said quietly. Please ask Regiment Captain Chan Isale to wake the staff and have him include Brigade Captain Chan Quay in his wake-up call. Yes, sir, Chan Corthel replied equally quietly and withdrew from the sleeping compartment.
Chandraith contemplated the door which had closed behind the voice, but his thoughts were far away. They were with the young man who had sent him that final message, in a language so ancient that probably no more than a handful of people in all of Sharona would have understood it. Chunika Sari Halian, Shawarak. I am your son, Halian, I remember. Chandraith closed his eyes once more and let those words toll through him. The words which absolutely precluded him from ordering Janaki Chan Kalarith out of Fort Salby before the hammer blow landed. Shawarak, the division captain murmured one more time. Then he straightened his shoulders and pressed the button to summon his batman with his uniform. Alivar Neshek sat in his tent, glaring at the words of the report floating in his personal crystal. Outside the tent, the expeditionary forces encampment swarmed with activity. The follow-on echelons of transports bringing up the heavy cavalry which had been left behind weren't due to arrive for another several hours, but preparations for the attack on Fort Salby were moving ahead already. Moving ahead based on the information I got for them, Neshek told himself bitterly. Moving ahead, at the end of an entire advance that's only been possible at all, because of the information I got for them. He managed to keep his teeth from grinding together, but it wasn't the easiest thing he'd ever done. He knew who he had to thank for 2,000 Harshu's abrupt decision to relieve you of the stress of the duties you have performed so outstandingly, as Harshu's memo had so cloyingly put it. Thousand Torok and that sanctimonious prick of a healer, Vainair. They were the ones. Well, we'll see. Just how well their god's damned offensives go without me holding their hands and wiping their asses for them. His nostrils flared, but even as he told himself that, deep down inside of him a tiny voice told him he should have seen this coming long ago, that in the end it was Harshu, not Torok or Vainair that the two thousand had used him to do a dirty job that needed doing, without getting any of the dirt on his own lily-white hands, and that now Harshu had decided to discard him, that the gratitude, the patronage Neshek had anticipated, were going to turn out to be very different things indeed, as far as Harshu, that noble Andaran, was concerned. But that was all right, he told that tiny voice right back, he had another patron, one senior to Harshu, and two thousand Mulgurthic would appreciate and remember his efforts on Mulgurthic's part. He'd better anyway, Nashik told himself grimly. If he doesn't, if he tries to send me for the long drop too, he won't like what I have to say to the Inspector General, not one little bit. He won't like it. A raised voice shouted orders outside his tent, a squad of infantry doubled past, equipment clattering, and somewhere on the far side of the hot, dusty encampment, he heard the rumbling grumbles of irritated dragons growing impatient for their meal. Everyone else was so busy, so focused, and here he sat, finishing up his routine paperwork like a good little clerk in a forgotten corner, tidying up his reports, making sure all the blanks were filled in. And while he was at it, doing some careful editing about his exact interrogation techniques as well. He glowered down at the crystal for several more seconds, then drew a deep breath and got back to work. This, underarmsman Cardin Verace muttered under his breath, is a god's damned pain in the arse. It became evident that he hadn't spoken quite as much under his breath as he thought he had when junior armsman Paris Chan Barsic slapped him across the back of his pith helmet. Less bitching, more digging, Chan Barsic told him. The junior armsman was noted for a certain lack of understanding for anyone who gave less than his full effort to the task at hand. But Verace wasn't particularly worried, given how liberally coated his shirtless torso was with the pasty skim of dust, dirt, and sweat. Even Chan Barsic had to be relatively satisfied with his efforts. Of course, Verace reflected, relatively satisfied wasn't quite the same thing as completely satisfied. I don't mind digging. It's prying out the god's damned rocks I hate, he said with a grunt as he heaved another head-sized hunk of stone to one side. Besides, this is a stupid place to be digging a hole anyway. Oh, you think so? 
Chen Barsik was just as filthy as Verace, not surprisingly since he'd been the one doing the digging until they'd changed off again ten minutes ago. You don't like the field of fire? I like the field of fire just fine, I guess. Verace dragged a forearm across his sweaty face, then spat and watched the tawny, dust-darkened spittle disappear over the lip of the nearly vertical slope in front of them. We're a long way from the road, but I guess we can reach it from here. But we could have covered it better from closer and without having to hump the guns and ammo all the fucking way up here, not to mention. He started swinging the mattock again, grunting the words between swings. Being a hell of a lot easier to dig in. Yeah. Chan Barsik looked over the other PAAF troopers working to prepare the squad's position. Most of them were stripped to the waist like the race. Over half of them were digging in the hard, rocky, sun-baked mountainside, hacking out weapons pits that were going to be shallower than the book wanted, no matter how hard they tried. Most of the rest were shoveling the spoil from the pits into the sandbags that were going to go on top of those holes when they were done. All of them were sweating hard under the brutal sun, and unlike Chan Barsik, the majority of them weren't Ternathians. Look, the junior armsman said, searching for the best way to explain to a non-Ternathian. If Crown Prince Janicki says a shitstorm's coming, then you better believe it's coming and the crap is gonna be really, really deep. Trust me on this. What, you think maybe his family's been doing what it does for so long without figuring out how to get its shit straight? Yeah, but... But nothing, Chen Barsik interrupted. If the regiment captain wants us up here after talking to the prince, there's no way in hell, anyone's hell, I'm going to argue with them. And if I'm not going to argue with them, then you aren't going to. Yeah, 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 I got it, I got it. Verace grumbled, swinging the mattock still harder. Good. Andrin Calarath jerked upright in her bed so quickly that Fenena reared up on her bedside perch, mantling instinctively. Andrin never even noticed her beloved falcon. Her sea-gray eyes were wide, unseeing, as she saw with her other senses, another talent. How long she sat there, frozen, watching the horrifying images and sounds rolling through her brain, she never knew. But then finally she closed those haunted eyes once more. She sat very still, unmoving in the hushed, comforting midnight silence of Calarath Palace. And her face was white, and strained. Janicky, she whispered. Oh, Janicky. Are you sure about this, platoon cap? I mean, are you sure about this, your highness? Company Captain Lorva Messiaen asked. Fort Salby's senior artillerist stood on the fort's western fighting step, watching as fatigue parties, reinforced by almost every male civilian above the age of twelve, worked with focused, purposeful intensity. Sure about what, sir? Janicky asked. He'd come up to the stretch of wall between the two outthrust bastions which flanked the main gates and climbed up onto an empty gun platform to gaze out toward the portal. Messiaen wasn't sure exactly what kept bringing the Ternathian crown prince back to this position again and again. From his own perspective, it was the ideal place to keep an eye on the preparations for which he personally was responsible. But he knew Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik had been keeping Janicky extraordinarily busy. Too busy, the company captain would have thought, to be making his way up here every hour or so. Sure about putting those things up here? Messiaen said, jerking his head at the sweating, grunting PAAF troopers with sledgehammers, who were busy spiking the base plates of ten Yurthic pedestal guns mounts into the solid tops of the towers and bastions while the reasonably solid tops of the towers and bastions. Messiaen had a few private reservations about how well they were going to stand the recoil of any sustained firing. The half-ton weapons themselves sat to one side, and getting those pigs up to the tops of the towers had been anything but easy. In fact, in the end, they'd had to move most of them by brute force and human muscle power. Messiaen just hoped it was all going to be worth it and that they were going to get off more than a few shots per gun before the masonry's solidity or the crude modifications they'd made to the mountings themselves betrayed them. Now Janicky glanced at the guns, then arched an eyebrow at the artillerist, and Messiaen shrugged. They'll have the reach to cover the approaches from this wall and from the western towers, your highness, he pointed out. But if you're right about where their attack's going to come from, the ones on the eastern wall aren't going to be much help. Not against ground targets. No, Janicky conceded. 
The scion opened his mouth, then closed it again. Although he was from New Farnal, not Ternathia, he'd read enough history to know how well the Calarath talent had served the Empire over the millennia. Still, dragons? Flying monsters with the heads and wings of eagles and lions' bodies? I know it sounds crazy, company captain, Janicki said with a tired smile. Just humor me. If you say so, your highness, Messiah replied after a moment. How are the rest of your positions coming along, sir, if I may ask? They won't be ready before dawn, if that's what you mean, your highness. Aside from that, they're coming along pretty well. Good, sir. That's good. Janicki nodded to Messiah and stepped closer to the parapet and leaned his elbows on it gazing out across the town of Salby and up at the looming portal. Chanskrithik had loaded up all the women and children he could cram onto the available railroad cars and sent them steaming off towards Salim. Unfortunately, he had space for less than 800 civilians, and sheltering the rest was going to pack the fort to the bursting point. Still, that would be far better than leaving them to face the oncoming storm unprotected. Assuming, of course, that they managed to keep the Arcanans' monstrous winged beasts from turning the fort into nothing more than a conveniently concentrated slaughtering pen. Janicki's mouth tightened as he contemplated the unspeakable casualties, which still might all too readily be inflicted upon people for whose protection he and his family were responsible. Then he made himself relax. As he looked down at the dust rising from either side of the ribbon of railroad that reached along the valley floor below, towards the portal. Company Captain Messiah might have his doubts about some of the artillery deployments Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik had ordered on the basis of Platoon Captain Chan Kalarath's glimpse, but that hadn't prevented the artillery officer from getting the guns deployed as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, Fort Salby, despite the thickness of its walls, hadn't really been intended to be defended against an attack by modern heavy weapons. The fighting steps simply weren't deep enough to mount true artillery especially not artillery on field carriages instead of fortress carriages. And the gun platforms had never been intended for anything heavier than machine guns. So Messiah's field artillery had to be deployed outside the walls, along the foot of the stair-step-like bluff upon which Salby stood, if the guns were going to be used at all. That explained a lot of the dust Janicki gazed down upon. The gun pits were going to be only a bit deeper than usual, but Chanskrithik, or rather Janicki, to be scrupulously honest, had insisted upon the thickest possible overhead cover. Firing a four-inch breech loader or one of the 3.4-inch quick fires with a roof of heavy sandbags only a few feet over the gunners' heads promised to be exciting. But not as exciting as things might have been with dragons raining fire or lightning into the gun pits with them. Janicki wished Chan Skrithik had had more field guns available. Even with the light horse guns Sun Lord Markin and Wind Lord Garsel had brought along, though, the regiment captain had little more than a dozen pieces. He and Janicki had spent an arduous couple of hours bent over the map table, matching terrain against Janicki's fragmentary glimpses, to pick the best places to put the guns he did have. But neither of them was happy about the total numbers they had to deploy. The single three-gun section of 4.3-inch howitzers and the nine heavy mortars Messiah had available could probably take up at least some of the slack. They, however, couldn't be used from positions with overhead cover, which was why they'd been deployed inside the fort itself. From their position on the parade ground, they were protected from direct counterfire and had excellent 360-degree command, as long as the targets were far enough away for their high-trajectory fire to clear the walls. Of course, if the Arcanans' dragons got through to the fort, tin roofs laid over appropriated railroad ties and covered with layered sandbags were going up all along the fort wall's fighting steps as well. They weren't as sturdy as Janicki would have preferred, but they were a hell of a lot better than nothing, and they should offer significant protection against plunging dragons' breath. He hoped so, anyway. Covered rifle pits were also springing up outside the walls, placed to cover the artillerists as well as to protect the ground-level approaches to the fort. And there were quite a few cavalry troopers wielding shovels, picks, and axes out there. Sun Lord Markin and Company Captain Vargan, in a rare bout of agreement, which had probably surprised them even more than it had Chanskrithik, 
had both looked more than a little affronted at how emphatically Janicki had informed them that Sharonian cavalry had no business at all on the same battlefield as Arcanian cavalry. Actually, they'd been even more affronted because of the Arcanians' lack of modern small arms. Only fools, which neither Markin nor Vargan were, however little they might care for one another, would have even contemplated committing cavalry against dug-in riflemen, machine guns, and field guns. But both Markin and Vargan were cavalry troopers of the old school. Against crossbows, the possibility of one last anachronistic, glorious charge had suggested itself to both of them, which had turned them into unlikely allies in this one case. Janicki had used both booted heels to stamp on that notion just as hard as he could. Vargan had accepted the veto with something which might have been described as good grace by a sufficiently charitable observer. Markin, on the other hand, had accepted it with scrupulous, icy courtesy. Of the two, Janicki considerably preferred Vargan's reaction. Still, the Sun Lord had agreed that under the circumstances his precious cavalry horses were less important than human lives. Fort Salby's stables had been emptied of their intended occupants, and all of the command's horses had been moved down to the paddocks built around the oasis some several miles east of the fort to make room to pack in still more civilians. The men who might otherwise have ridden those horses were out there behind those shovels, digging in as riflemen instead. And Janicki had to admit that however much Markin might have longed for one final charge, He'd turned energetically to the task of integrating his troopers into Chan Skrithik's defensive plan when that charge was denied him. Now we just have to see whether or not it does any good, Janicki thought grimly. I'd be happier if we could hit them earlier, sir, Commander of 500 Murr said. He and Claremont Toralk stood outside the operations tent, looking out across the improvised dragon field. The transports were beginning to show signs of accumulating fatigue, Toralk noted, and several of the battle dragons were showing fatigue in their own fashion, which unfortunately consisted of being even more irritable than usual. I can understand that, Toralk agreed, and he could. But even dragons' eyes needed some light. This Fort Salby had the potential to turn into a nasty handful, and this time the approach was going to be tricky enough all by itself. It was no time for battle dragons and their pilots to fly into hillsides they couldn't quite see in time, or discover that not even dragon's eyes had enough light to pick out their targets accurately. It's not another damned wooden fort with just another handful of men in it, sir, Murr pointed out in what Torok couldn't quite call a wheedling tone. You've seen the plans. Yes, I have, Torok agreed once more. The detailed maps of this portal chain which they'd captured at Fort Gartoon included one of Tracem, and the modified image-interpreting spellware had worked perfectly. They knew precisely where Fort Salby was and exactly what the terrain around it looked like. They'd even found what one of their prisoners had identified as a map of Fort Salby itself, and Tougher Nut was a grossly inadequate way to describe the difference between it and something like Fort Gartoon. Salby's walls were taller, thicker and stronger. They were also going to be far more resistant to fire, and the buildings inside the fort were made of the same materials, which would make the Reds' breath weapons much less effective. If taking those walls and those internal structures turned into any sort of hand-to-hand -hand fight, it was going to be bloody, very bloody. One thing the map didn't show was what sort of cellars or underground passages might be integrated into the fort. There had to be some, and they were going to pose problems of their own, however the expeditionary force went about attacking the place. Listen, Sarnos, Torok said, turning to face his Talon commander fully. I understand what you're saying, and I agree that our chances of taking them completely by surprise would be better if we hit them in the dark. But your chances of losing a dragon, or two or three of them, on the approach would also be a lot higher. Murr looked unhappy, but he couldn't really argue that point. The approach route they'd selected took advantage of the mountainous terrain between the portal and their objective, using it to screen and conceal the incoming strike until the very last minute. But while battle dragons were trained for nap-of-the-earth flight, threading the needle of the valley which would lead them to Fort Salby wasn't something to try in pitch blackness. Assuming all your dragons survive the approach, Torok continued, you've still got the problem that, as you just pointed out, 
This is going to be a really hard target. And it's got a garrison at least four or five times as big as anything we've hit so far, with artillery and more of those damned machine gun things of theirs. If they have time to get their heavy weapons into action, we're going to get hurt. Remember what happened to your reds at the swamp portal. That's exactly what I am remembering, sir, Murr replied. If we hit them fast enough with enough surprise, we'll be on top of them and knock those weapons out before they even know we're coming. They won't get a chance to bring them into action at all. And frankly, I'd like that one hells of a lot better than the alternative. But to do that, you have to actually hit them, Torok pointed out. And to do that, the dragons have to be able to see them. Murr started to open his mouth again, but Torok shook his head. I understand what you're saying, Sir Lose, but look at it this way. As far as we can tell, they still haven't gotten any messages out. And because of the captured maps, we can finally actually read reliably. We haven't even had to send in a recon flight. So they can't know we're coming. For a moment, Murr looked as if he might argue that point, but then he grimaced and shook his head. Although no griffins had been sent through into Tracem, a very high-altitude griffin had overflown the Sharonian's railhead, barely 300 miles up-chain from the ruins of what had been Fort Mosinek. The image interpreters were still trying to make sense out of the take from the recon crystal, still trying to figure out what some of the huge, complicated, awkward-looking machinery was for. But the fact that all those workers were still out there, still working, was the clearest possible proof the Arcanans' presence at Fort Mosinek remained undetected. Since they don't know we're coming anyway, and since these people won't know any more about dragons or griffins than any of the people we've already hit, you're still going to have what amounts to complete tactical surprise. Torok continued. Maybe they'll have a few seconds, even minutes, to see you coming, but even if they do, how much good is that going to do them? As far as they know, they're still at peace. They're going to be maintaining a peaceful routine. It'll take time for them to get from that mindset into putting up any sort of effective resistance. Do you really think they're going to manage to do that, to break their heavy weapons out of storage and get them into action before you can get in at least two or three passes with your yellows? Murr shook his head, and Torok snorted. I don't think so either. But for those passes to be effective, you've got to have light for the targeting. If you don't, if you miss on the first pass, then you're likely to have to come back through much heavier fire, and even their rifles may get lucky. All right, sir, Murr smiled crookedly. You've made your point. For that matter, it was my people who came up with the timing in the first place. Just put it down to opening night jitters, I suppose. Don't think you're the only one feeling them, Torok said dryly. Frankly, I'll be happier when we're able to settle in on the defensive instead of advancing further and further into the unknown this way. I know no thrusting, offense-minded Air Force officer is supposed to admit that especially where a ground pounder might overhear him. But you know what? I'm feeling sort of lonely all the way out here, at the end of our advance. Chapter 27 Company Captain Silkash tried to conceal his anxiety as the pair of hard-faced Arcanan guards marched him across Fort Gartoon's parade ground. The surgeon's eyes flitted around busily, taking in everything he could see and the mind behind those eyes was equally busy. The Arcanans had decided to use the stables as an improvised holding area for the bulk of their prisoners. Despite the heavy casualties the Eagle Lions had inflicted, there were well over 400 of those prisoners, and finding a place to put them all obviously hadn't been easy. Silk Ash wouldn't normally have considered a stable a very secure prison, but the Arcanans had come prepared. The surgeons still had no idea how this magic of theirs worked, but the gleaming web which had been stretched across every opening in the stable buildings looked depressingly effective. It was clearly visible even in full daylight, and the Arcanans had completely ringed the stable with the glittering tubes of their fireball throwers as a pointed warning to any Sharonians who might have entertained notions about somehow finding a way through its close-meshed glow. The officers, on the other hand, had been kept separate from the enlisted and non-cons which, Silk Ash reflected wryly, had given them an unanticipated opportunity to experience Fort Gartoon's hospitality from the same perspective as their recent guests, although they were packed considerably tighter in the cells than their Arcanan POWs had been. 
Of course, his eyes darkened. There had been a few other differences between their own experiences and those of their arcane and POWs. Anger smoldered like slow lava down inside the medical officer. There'd been no opportunity for anyone to make any formal reports to him or to Regiment Captain Velvelig, but there'd been at least some contact with some of the non-officer prisoners. They'd heard what had happened to Chan Turgis, and the voice wasn't the only Sharonian who'd been killed in cold blood after surrendering. To have his men treated that way, especially after Velvelig had been so insistent upon treating his prisoners with respect and dignity, had filled the Arpathian with a white-hot rage. Despite the regiment captain's self-control, Silk Ash had literally felt the heat of that anger radiating from the other man. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the brutality had ended. It hadn't tapered off. It had simply stopped like a locomotive when the steam was turned off. Silk Ash hoped that indicated the savagery had never been authorized and had stopped as soon as higher authority learned about it. But he wasn't quite prepared to conclude that that was what had actually happened. In the meantime, the main body of the invaders had clearly moved on, which, she thought glumly, probably meant they'd already attacked Fort Mosinic by this time. It still seemed impossible, but if they'd managed to get from Hell's Gate to Fort Cartoon as quickly as they had. His thoughts shifted focus abruptly as his guards pushed him up the steps to the veranda of the office block. They weren't particularly gentle about it, and the manacles holding his hands behind him made him awkward. He thought about registering some sort of protest and decided that might not be the very smartest thing he could do. They thrust him into the building, and he found himself being marched down the short hallway to what had been Velvelig's office. They opened the door and shoved him through it, and Silk Ash's lips tightened involuntarily as he saw Hadrine Thalmer sitting behind Velvelig's desk. The two guards withdrew, leaving Silk Ash standing in front of the desk. Thalmer pointedly ignored him, keeping his attention on one of the omnipresent crystals these people seemed to take with them everywhere. This particular crystal was filled with floating words and letters in the Arcanan alphabet, and Silkash wondered what Thalmer was studying so intently in order to emphasize his prisoner's total lack of importance. Probably a laundry list, the surgeon told himself sourly. He's not smart enough for it to be anything more complicated than that. He knew the sarcasm was nothing more than a defensive mechanism, the only shield against the uncertainty and fear simmering deep inside him he could come up with under the circumstances. To his surprise, it was rather comforting anyway. He stood there for several minutes. Then the door opened again, and Silk Ash's belly muscles tightened as platoon captain Tobis McCree was shoved through it. This time the guards didn't withdraw again either. Instead, they stood back against the wall, behind the prisoners, and Silk Ash's heart sank as he noted the heavy truncheons at their sides. Thalmer let the two Sharonians wait for at least another five minutes before he finally looked up from his crystal. Then he leaned back in Velvelig's chair, and his smile was thin and ugly. Well, well, he said after a moment. Or at least that was what the crystal on his desk said as it translated for him. Somehow, Silk Ash thought sinkingly, the fact that he was finally able and willing to communicate with them wasn't particularly reassuring. So here we are, he continued after a heartbeat or two. I've been looking forward to this morning. Do you know why? Neither Sharonian answered, and Thalmer's smile grew even thinner. Then he nodded briefly to the guards, and Silk Ash cried out involuntarily as a heavy truncheon smashed into his kidneys from behind, and the pain hammered him to his knees. I asked you a question, Thalmer said. Do you know why I've been looking forward to this morning? Silk Ash looked up at him through a haze of sudden agony, then grunted as a heavy boot slammed into his ribs. He went down trying to curl into a protective knot, and the boot crunched into him again and again. No! he heard McCree shout. We don't know. Really? The amusement in Thalmer's voice was as hungry as it was ugly, but at least the boots stopped hammering Silk Ash. I'm astonished, the Arcanan continued. The two of you, such conscientious healers, 
so concerned about my well-being, so desperate to save my life, to cure my wounds. I can't believe such perceptive, compassionate people couldn't guess why I've been feeling so much anticipation all morning. Thalmer's voice seemed to be coming from a long way away, as Silk Ash forced himself not to whimper around the waves of pain rolling through him. Well, Thalmer said, and the chair scraped across the floor as he stood, stretching hugely to draw deliberate attention to his restored mobility. The answer is simple enough. Although I wasn't aware of it at the time, you gentlemen did your very best to help me. It embarrasses me deeply that I didn't realize that at the time. Fortunately, it's been explained to me since, and I assure you I'm more grateful for your efforts than I could ever possibly express. The Arcanan's eyes were ugly, and he slowly and carefully pulled on a pair of thin leather gloves. I've thought and thought about how I might be able to express my gratitude to you, he continued, as he smoothed the leather across the backs of his hands. Unfortunately, even with the assistance of my PC here, I don't think I have the words. So I've decided the best way to tell you. He held out one gloved hand, and the nearer guard handed him his truncheon. Is to show you. Hundred Geyersoft's fingers were steady in the control grooves as Grey Cloud led the 3,012th strike through the portal. The yellow dragon flew strongly, steadily, sharing his pilot's eagerness, as Geyersoff lay stretched out in the cockpit watching the imagery displayed on his helmet's visor. Ahead of them, the eastern sky glowed with the approach of dawn, but the shadows surrounding the ground below were still dense enough to make him a tiny bit nervous. The mountains about them weren't all that high compared to many other more impressive ranges but he'd been impressed, almost awed, by the incredible cliffs his dragons had been forced to climb over just to get here. And if there were taller mountains in the multiverse, the rugged slopes of these mountains were more than solid enough to flatten any dragon careless enough to fly into them. The mission planners were right to insist on waiting for dawn. The thought ran below the surface of Geyersoft's concentration on the steep, barren, poorly visible mountainsides streaking past beyond Grey Cloud's wingtips. We probably could have done this with less light, but I wouldn't have enjoyed it. The old cliché about the dearth of old, bold pilots flickered in the back of his brain. Then he felt himself tighten inside as they reached the last waypoint and turned on to their final approach. There. Gyrosov's eyes narrowed behind his visor as he saw the fort lying ahead of him, exactly where the maps said it should be. He looked through Grey Cloud's eyes, moving the crosshair while he prepared to climb high enough to gain a clear line of fire onto the fort's parade ground. But then, something jabbed at the corner of his attention, and his eyes moved back to the shadows below the fort's wall. What the hells? That's not supposed to be there. Whatever the hells it is, it's... He was still peering into the shadows, using Grey Cloud's vision to try to figure out what those dimly visible shapes and scars on the earth were, as the two yellows and their accompanying reds entered the final stretch of their approach valley, and the four Farika II machine guns, dug in on either side just below the summit, opened fire. Janaki Chan Kalarath had been standing on the raised gun platform between the gate bastions, with Talina on his shoulder for the last two hours. He'd stood there almost motionless, gazing steadily into the west, and Rolf Chan Skrithik had stood equally silent at his other shoulder, with senior armsman Oric Issia, Fort Salby's senior flicker, by his side. The regiment captain felt uncomfortable, which, he reflected, was a pitifully pale word to describe his emotions at this moment. Part of him wished desperately that he'd gone ahead and ordered Janaki to the rear. Another part of him, the part charged with defending 1,200 civilians, including his own wife, was desperately glad the prince and his talent were here. And yet another part wondered if Janaki would have gone, even if he'd been ordered to. And just who the hells would you have used to make him go if he'd refused, Roth? He asked himself wryly, 
glancing at the Marine standing respectfully behind the two officers. Chief Armsman Chan Breichel looked most unhappy, but Chan Skrithik had no doubt whose orders the Marine would have followed if it had come to a choice between him and the Crown Prince of Ternathia. Besides, when it came right down to it, Rolf Chan Skrithik was a Ternathian himself. He knew how valuable Janicki's life was. He also recalled the Calarath's motto, and the quotation attributed to Emperor Hallian over 1,500 years ago when he'd rejected all of the arguments in favor of withdrawing from the defense of his Bolakini allies. It takes twenty years to make an emperor, Hallian had said. It takes twenty centuries to make an empire the world can trust. Janaki Chan Kalarath understood what his ancestor had said all those centuries ago, Chan Skrithik thought. What's that? Chan Breichel said suddenly, there, above the southern hilltop. Chan Skrithik couldn't make out what the Marine was talking about, but Janicki answered him. The prince didn't even turn his head to look. He didn't have to, just as Chan Skrithik didn't have to look into Janicki's gray eyes to see the shadows moving in their depths. It's starting, chief, the crown prince said quietly. Still think it's a stupid place to put a machine gun? Paris Chan Barsik shouted in Cardin Varese's right ear. Fuck no, Varese shouted back. They had to shout, even though their heads were barely a foot apart, and even then they could scarcely hear one another. The cacophonous bellow of four fifty-four caliber machine guns tended to make it difficult to carry on a conversation. The heavy Farikas couldn't sustain maximum rate fire for very long without overheating catastrophically, but they didn't have to either. Each of the four machine gun emplacements on each side of the valley poured at least 200 rounds at the monstrous beasts leading that airborne onslaught, and none of their targets even tried to dodge. Serlos Murr watched in utter horror as both his remaining yellows ran straight in to the massed fire of the Sharonian weapons, which shouldn't have been there. Gyrosov and his wingman had been concentrating on their assigned target, not looking for machine guns on the tops of mountains a good mile and a half short of the target that didn't know they were coming. Murr had no idea what those guns were doing there. Indeed, he could hardly even find them. The brilliant flames of their muzzle flashes illuminated the shadows wrapped around their positions like chain lightning, but they were so solidly dug in with so many sandbags and so much earth piled on top of their positions that the muzzle flashes were all he could see. Well, that, and the consequences of those muzzle flashes. Gray cloud and sky kill seemed to stagger in midair. The fire wasn't even coming in from below where their scales were thickest, and the massive bullets punched through their sides like white-hot awls. One of them, Murr had no idea which, managed to scream in mortal agony, and then both of them went smashing down out of the heavens in bloody, shattered ruins that bounced and skidded onward along the valley floor like toys that flailed broken wings like pitiful, tattered banners. The three reds behind them went the same way before their pilots could react. The rest of the attack flight responded instinctively, rocketing steeply upward. But the deadly flanking fire tracked them as they climbed, and another red and one of the blacks went down as well, before they could clear the threat zone. Murr looked back from his own dragon as Razorwing bounded upward and saw the broken bodies of seven, seven of his precious dragons and their pilots sprawled grotesquely across the valley floor. The cheers were deafening. Rolf Chanskrithik found himself shouting right along with the rest of his men, bellowing his triumph, and he knew he was shouting even louder because of his reaction to the sheer size of the Arcanans' winged monstrosities. But Janicki wasn't cheering. The crown prince reached out and caught Chanskrithik by the front of his uniform tunic. The regiment captain's eyes widened in surprise at the strength with which Janicki grabbed him and literally yanked him forward. He started to say something, but then Janicki turned his head to look at him, and Chan Skrithik's mouth closed with a click. He'd thought there were ghosts in his crown prince's gray gaze before. Now he saw the reality. Janicki's eyes were huge, the pupils far too dilated for the strengthening morning light, unfocused on anything of this world. They didn't seem to be looking at anything about him, and yet Chan Skrithik had the eerie sensation that Janicki didn't simply see him, 
he saw right through him. They aren't going to give up that easily, the crown prince of Ternathia said in the clear, distant voice of a Calarath in fugue state. They'll be back, soon, he pointed directly overhead. There. Chan Skrithik nodded and looked at senior armsman Isia. Overhead watch, he said harshly. Alert everyone. Yes, sir. Isia saluted sharply, then closed his eyes, and one of the small stacks of message canisters on the parapet beside him began to disappear with the pre-planned dispatches, written well ahead of time against this very moment. Almost simultaneously, the canisters began to appear at their destinations. Company Captain Messiah glanced at his copy and began shouting orders of his own. Serlos Murr counted noses with a sense of total disbelief as his remaining dragons circled well to the west of those murderous machine guns. After transfers and rearrangements to make up for his earlier losses, the 3,012th had headed into action this morning with eleven dragons. Now it had only four, and both of his precious yellows were gone, simply blotted away. He lay in his cockpit, forcing himself to think as clearly as possible, despite the shock and white-hot rage blazing within him. The loss of seven battle dragons, seven, before any of them had even fired a shot, was far worse than merely devastating. It represented almost half of his total available combat strength and a third of all the battle dragons deployed to this entire chain. The long-term implications of that level of losses, especially in light of the Air Force's low total inventory of battle dragons, were something he resolutely refused to contemplate. Not yet. There would be time to think about that later, and he wasn't looking forward to it. The short-term implications were something he couldn't avoid thinking about, however. His entire battle plan had been built around bringing the maximum possible weight of fire to bear on Fort Salby as quickly as possible. The yellows were supposed to have been the opening salvo, blanketing any exposed defenders in a lethal, saturating canopy of gas. Had they somehow missed their mark, their escorting reds had been supposed to sweep the fort's exposed interior with fireballs, while the yellows looped back for a second pass. Now, with Hundred Helica's five thousand and first, Murr's weakest strike, detached to support Thousand Carthos's secondary advance, he had only the four shocked survivors of Geyersoft's 3,012th, all of them blacks, and the six reds and four blacks of Commander of 100 Solace Desmar's 2,029th strike. Part of his brain argued that he had to break off and pull back, that the losses he'd already taken were heavier than the conquest of one more Sharonian portal fort could possibly justify. But this wasn't just one more portal fort. It was the perfect forward defensive position 2,000 Harshu had been looking for from the moment the expeditionary force began its advance. Besides, he wanted these people. He didn't know why they'd put machine guns in such an unlikely spot. From test firings with captured weapons, intelligence had determined the approximate range of the Sharonians' heavy automatic weapons, so he knew they had the reach from those positions to cover the railroad and road which connected the portal to the fort and its small surrounding town. And he supposed that given the initial hostile contact between Arcana and the Sharonians, it would have made sense to devote at least a little attention to defending the approaches from the direction of Hell's Gate. But he also knew how heavy those large caliber machine guns were, and getting them into position, or just keeping them supplied with ammunition and getting their gun crews up and down those mountainsides for that matter, especially without dragons, must have been an unmitigated pain in the arse. The elevation damn well gives them good command of the surrounding area, I suppose, Murr thought harshly. But why here, and nowhere else? Another possibility suggested itself to him, but that was ridiculous. If these people had had any idea an arcane invasion force was this close to Tracem, they would never have left those work crews and all of that heavy equipment exposed on Fort Mosinik's very doorstep. And even if they had known, how could they possibly have placed those weapons so perfectly? Given all the possible lines of approach, how could they have picked exactly the right one to cover? No way, he shook his helmeted head. However it happened, the bastards have to have just lucked out. Well, his mouth twisted grimly. I suppose things have gone so well this far, that it's about time we had a little bad luck too. But these fuckers are not going to get away with massacring my people this way. He used his helmet spellware to trigger the combination of a white and an amber flare, 
and one of Geyersoft's surviving blacks climbed obediently up to his level. The pilot looked over at him, and Murr used dragon pilot hand signs to order the other dragon back to report to Thousand Torok and Two Thousand Harshu. The pilot nodded, and his beast banked away. Murr watched him go, then turned grimly back to the task at hand. No doubt Torok and Harshu would have their own thoughts about his fiasco, and he wasn't exactly looking forward to hearing them. But by the time his superiors got around to sharing their impressions of his most recent operation with him, that fort was going to be a smoking, smoldering ruin. Serlo's Murr owed the first provisional talon and the 3,012th strike that much. Company Captain Messiaen stood tautly in his position, field glasses glued to his eyes, staring up into the early morning sky above Fort Salby. Chief Armsman Wasire Chan Forkel stood beside him, but unlike Messiaen, Chan Forkel was parked under the very best overhead cover they could give him. The supporting structure above him was made of two crossed layers of railroad ties, thickly buttressed by sandbags. The western side of his personal bunker was the parapet of the fighting step itself, and the northern side was the equally solid adobe and stone of one of the gate bastions. The southern side was a wall of sandbags stacked two wide at the top and four wide at the bottom. In fact, only the eastern side was open, and that only so that he could communicate with Messiah. There was a reason for how elaborately the chief armsman was protected while his superior was so exposed. Unlike Company Captain Messiah, Chief Armsman Chan Forkel didn't need field glasses, as he stood there with his eyes tightly closed and his head cocked in an attitude of intense concentration. He was one of the most precious commodities any artillery commander could have, a highly trained, highly experienced, predictive distance viewer. Coming in, he announced suddenly, circling to the north and climbing. Messiaen swung his glasses onto the indicated bearing and saw a swarm of distant black dots climbing in a tight corkscrew, wings laboring. Even with the glasses, he couldn't make out a great many details at that range, but he didn't really need to either. Sorry I ever doubted you, your highness, the artillerist found himself thinking. Then he lowered the glasses. Keep your head down, Wessar, he said. We can't have anything happen to it now, can we? He smiled tightly at the distance viewer, then turned his own head to look at the crews assigned to the pedestal guns and machine guns mounted atop the walls. Okay, boys, the prince put you right where you need to be, and in just a minute, it's going to be time to show these bastards why. Hundred Murr's lips skinned back as the 2029th reached its designated pushover altitude. He'd been right. They might have placed outlying machine guns to cover the railroad and the ground approaches, but they hadn't bothered to put any of them out here in these barren, totally uninhabited mountains. Now, safely above the reach of their god's damned weapons, he and his dragons headed out towards their objective. Murr gazed down through Razor Wing's vision, examining the fort they'd come to burn, and grimaced. I shouldn't have argued against sending in the recon griffins, he told himself bitterly. Obviously, they don't think of this thing as just one more portal fort, do they? They must have a dozen of those machine guns up there on the walls. His belly muscles tightened at the thought, but his fingers were sure and confident in the control grooves. Yes, they had a lot of firepower down there, and no one was going to dismiss the threat, not after what had happened to the 3,012th. But this wasn't going to be broadside shots into unsuspecting beasts moving on steady, predictable courses. No, these defenders were going to have to fire directly upward into the teeth of a dozen, thirty, or forty-ton battle dragons flying straight at them and belching fire and lightning bolts as they came. And that, my fine Sharonian friends, Murr thought savagely, is a very different dragon fight indeed. Steady, Messiah murmured to himself far too low for any of his gunners to have heard. Steady, steady, steady. The dragons were almost directly overhead now. Surely they would have to begin their attack dive soon. The artillerist spared one precious moment to look over his shoulder to where Crown Prince Janicki stood on the parapet-level gun platform beside Regiment Captain Chance Griffith. The prince wasn't looking his way, which was a pity. 
The sign would have liked to have at least nodded at Janicki in appreciation. The Yurthic pedestal gun was essentially a naval weapon which had been around for decades. In fact, it had slipped over into obsolescence these days, and it was being steadily phased out of naval service in favor of light, quick-firing weapons like the ship-mounted version of the field artillery's 3.4-inch quick-firer because its shells were simply no longer heavy enough for its original design function. But it remained an effective weapon for many other purposes and the decision to upgrade the Imperial Navy's tertiary armament meant that a largish number of Yurthics, which had become suddenly surplus to the Navy's needs, were finding their way into custom service or PAAF use. In many ways, it was similar to the Farika, but instead of two to four barrels in a single fixed sleeve, the Yurthic, depending upon its caliber, had from four to six barrels arranged to rotate around a central axis in a circular motion. Instead of belted ammunition, they fired rounds from huge clips like oversized rifle magazines, with each barrel firing as it reached the highest point of its circular path. A pedestal gun's sustained rate of fire was lower than that of the lighter Farika, and it could maintain maximum rate fire only briefly. But that was fine with Messiaen, because unlike the Farika, the Yurthic was a genuine artillery piece. The Yurthic works had produced the weapons in several calibers. The most common were the 1.5-inch and 2.5-inch versions. The 2.5, like the ones on Fort Salvi's walls, came with four barrels and had a muzzle velocity of almost 1,600 feet per second and a maximum range of just over 6,000 yards with the new smokeless powder rounds. And unlike the 1.5-inch, it was capable of firing shrapnel rounds, not simply high-explosive or solid ammunition. They had been intended for relatively short-range actions, meant to smother light torpedo craft in a torrent of high explosive. As such, their designed elevation was strictly limited. But thanks to Janicki's warning, the available guns were deployed in a wide ring and mounted on firing platforms wide enough to allow the weapon to be traversed through 360 degrees. Elevation was still limited, but the Fort Salby machinists had torched off the limiting stops on the elevation quadrants to squeeze several more degrees out of them. Coupled with the broad base of fire from the way they were spread out around the Ford's perimeter, they had elevation enough to form a cone much taller than would normally have been the case, and Janicki and Chan Skrithik had thoughtfully provided something to help fill the gaps and thicken their total weight of fire. Every Farika II, which hadn't been emplaced in the hillside positions for the opening ambush, had been clamped atop improvised post mounts as well, and they had considerably more elevation than the pedestal guns did. Now, the men behind those guns watched over their sights as an incredible freight train of flying impossibilities dove straight towards them. A black's lightning bolt would be far less effective than one of the red's fireballs. Murr knew that. But after the losses he'd already taken, they needed every dragon. Even if that hadn't been true, Murr was a dragon pilot himself before he was anything else. No one else was going to lead the strike, not after what had happened to the 3,012th. He felt Razorwing's determination in the way the big dragon folded his wings and fell into a headlong, screaming dive. Despite the losses he'd already suffered, despite the possibility that he was going to suffer still more of them, Serlos Murr had never felt more alive, more confident, more powerful and focused. That's not a machine gun, he thought abruptly. There wasn't time to try to puzzle out just what that was, but the weapon was bigger and bulkier, and the Sharonians were aiming it upward as well. Bigger probably means nastier, his racing mind decided, and he moved his aim point from the machine gun he'd already picked out to one of the unknown weapons. He barely had time to make the change before the crosshair stopped blinking as Razor Wing's longer-ranged breath weapon entered its effective range of the new target. Kushai! Murr shouted, and the arm-thick column of lightning streaked downward. Company Captain Messiah flinched as the solid shaft of lightning exploded across the sky. It was almost blindingly bright, even in the full daylight which now had settled over Fort Salby, and the thunderclap as it struck home was quite literally deafening. It didn't appear to have that broad a threat zone, probably a circle no more than eight or ten yards across, but within that zone it was lethal. 
It also appeared to be fiendishly accurate. It struck directly on top of one of his yurthics, and the gun crew didn't even have time to scream. They convulsed, smoke erupting from their clothing and hair, and then the ammunition in their weapons magazine cooked off in an explosion that completely crippled the gun. Messiah saw it all, but only out of the corner of his eye, and there wasn't really time for it to register before his own people opened fire. Murr saw the tracers streaking upward as Razor Wings started to pull out of his screaming dive. The big dragon banked, twisting sideways, trading lift for evasion. It was a dangerous game to play this close to such mountainous terrain and at such low altitude after such a high-speed dive. But Razor Wing was a skilled veteran, and the sheer adrenaline rush filled Murr with a wild sense of exultation. This, this was what he'd been born for. Then Razor Wing bucked, bellowing a hoarse scream as his low-altitude flight path carried him straight in front of one of the pedestal guns. The rotating barrels flamed, the muzzle blast slammed at the faces and clothing of everyone near it, bronze cartridge cases flicked out of the opening breaches, bouncing and rolling, and Razor Wing took two direct hits. The high explosive rounds slammed into the belly scales, which wouldn't have stopped even the far lighter rounds of the machine guns. They penetrated deep and then exploded. Serlos Murr and his dragon slammed into the neat houses of Salbaton at almost 300 miles an hour. Messiah was never really able to sort it all out clearly later. It happened too quickly, too fast, to be accurately recorded by the brains of the human beings caught in the chaos. Machine guns and pedestal guns thundered and hammered insanely. The sky above Fort Salby was filled with stupendous creatures, and the gunners hurled their hate in copper-jacketed bolts and the sledgehammers of high explosive. The dragon pilots of Arcana had never experienced anything like it. For the first time, they encountered concentrated fire from a prepared, unshaken position, and the short range of their dragon's breath weapons left them no choice but to enter their enemy's reach. Lightning bolts lanced downward. Only a handful of the shorter-ranged fireballs were successfully launched and two of those went wide as defensive fire smashed into the firing reds. Sharonians screamed and died. The fireballs that landed inside the fort's confines exploded with tremendous force, and a tiny corner of Messiah's mind thanked Prince Janicki fervently for insisting that his howitzer and mortar crews be kept under cover, out of their gun pits, until they were actually needed. The overhead cover the prince had insisted with equal fanaticism upon providing for the riflemen spread out along the fort's fighting step proved its worth as well. For all the heat and fury of the fireballs, they lacked the blast effect to penetrate those heaped sandbags. What they did to Messiah's exposed gunners, however, was something else entirely. In less than two screaming minutes of savage action, Fifty-three of Lorvum Messiah's men were killed outright. Another eighteen were wounded so badly, death would have been a mercy. And still another seventeen were put out of action. Four of his yurthics were destroyed or disabled. He lost five farikas, and two of his heavy mortars were thoroughly wrecked as all the ready ammunition in their, thankfully, unmanned pit went up in a thunderous chain of explosions. But while all that was happening, his gunners brought down eight more dragons. One mortally wounded beast crashed directly into the top of the northwestern tower like a forty-ton hammer of scales, blood, and bone, and the impact reduced the pedestal gun crew atop that tower to gruel. The parapet exploded outward in a meteor storm of broken adobe, stones, and dust, and the dragon came to rest, one shattered wing drooping down until its tip trailed on the ground beyond. Its pilot dangled from its broken neck, hanging limp and broken himself from the straps of his flight harness. Another dragon smashed into the southernmost stretch of the western wall. It just missed the corner tower where the wall turned to angle back to the east, and the plunging beast crushed the firing step's improvised overhead protection. At least another thirty men were killed as the dragon exploded through the parapet and slammed to earth between the wall and the nearest gun emplacement. Smoke billowed up from the fort's interior. The top of the southern tower might have been missed by the plummeting dragon, but it was enveloped in a holocaust all its own, where that dragon's fireball had struck yet another of the yurthics before it was killed itself. 
The fireball had ignited the destroyed gun's ready-use ammunition, and two dozen nearby infantry had been killed or wounded. But only four of the attacking dragons managed to pull out of their dives successfully, and two of them staggered off, obviously badly hurt. Chapter 28 Merkos Harshu's face was completely expressionless as the imagery from Commander of 50 Farlow's recon crystal played back before him. Clairman Torok wished his face could be equally disciplined, but that was more than he could manage. Graholus, what the hells did Mer run into? And what the fuck did he think he was doing with that second attack? The imagery concluded with Deathclaw circling overhead, while his two wounded wingmates came in for quick, clumsy landings. Torok didn't have the dragon healer's reports yet, but he'd be surprised if the more badly wounded of the two survived. And whether the beast lived or not, both of the injured dragons were going to be out of action for a long time. Which means I have exactly three battle dragons left, all of them blacks, he thought grimly. Thank you, Harshu said almost absently to the gifted technician. The man had done extraordinarily well to get the imagery transferred so quickly, but he didn't look very happy despite the 2000's well-deserved thanks. Probably because he isn't a total idiot, Torok thought. The technician departed, and Harshu and Torok looked at one another across the map table. It would appear, Harshu said with a thin, humorless smile, that it's fortunate I'd already decided to halt the offensive here at Tresum. Torok winced. Sir, he began, I'd apologize for this, this debacle. If there were any way to excuse it, I... That's enough, Clairman, Harshu interrupted. The Air Force officer closed his mouth and the Expeditionary Forces CO shook his head. I saw your and 500 Murs attack plan. I was fully aware of the intelligence appreciations upon which it was based, and I approved it. Whatever blame there may be, it belongs to me as much as it does to you. Torok started to disagree with his superior's assessment, then made himself stop and shook his own head. That's very understanding of you, sir, he said instead. But whoever's to blame, we've got a major problem here. My, Clemen, a corner of his brain mocked, what a massive gift for understatement you do have. For all practical purposes, he continued, my battle dragon's strength has just been wiped out. The blacks I have left are the least effective for this sort of attack. And, to be honest, despite all the smoke and explosions our pilots have reported, I doubt very much that they succeeded in neutralizing the fort's defensive fire. Probably not, Harshu agreed. The 2000 gazed down at the map of the terrain around Fort Salby, rubbing his chin gently. All right, he said finally. There's no point standing here beating ourselves up over our losses. What matters are our remaining resources for prosecuting the attack. Torok looked at him, then cleared his throat respectfully. Sir, he said diffidently, as I understand our basic operational planning, the object was to secure a forward choke point we could hold against counterattack. That's what made this portal so attractive. But if we failed to secure that sort of choke point, our objective became to conduct a mobile defensive withdrawal slowing the enemy to the greatest possible extent while the commandery found reinforcements for us. And you're thinking that if we take heavy losses, additional heavy losses, against Salbi, we won't have anything left to conduct that mobile defense with. Harshu's voice sounded remarkably calm, and Torok nodded. That's exactly what I'm thinking, sir. Well, I'm not certain you're wrong, Harshu said frankly. On the other hand... Now that I've seen 50 Farlow's recon images, I'm more convinced than ever that securing Fort Salby itself would be extremely valuable. The ground-level approach to the portal is even more constricted from the upchain side than I'd thought it was. And thanks to the portal itself, there's no way, no practical way, they could flank us out of position. It would be a straight-up fighting withdrawal to the portal, with our transport dragons giving us the ability to pull our men out at the very last minute. I can't disagree with that, sir, but at the same time, the cliff's face alone is going to be a major terrain obstacle for anyone without aerial capability. Frankly, if I were a Sharonian, 
I'd figure it was a pretty solid cork all by itself. We don't need to control the approaches as well. I'm not as positive about that. Harshu shook his head. I've been thinking about what they did to Hundred Thalmare at the Swamp Portal. They used man and pack animal portable weapons for that attack. For this one, they've had their railroad available to bring in really heavy weapons. And remember the sheer size of some of the machinery the overflight picked up. I've been trying to imagine what one of their artillery pieces might look like built on that scale, and to be honest, the thought scares the crap out of me. Whether they've got any that big or not, it's obvious that they have some which are at least a lot bigger and heavier than anything we've encountered so far. Obviously, we haven't seen those in action yet. Which means I don't have any sort of measuring stick to evaluate how far through a portal they could shoot. I'd prefer to have some extra depth, enough room to at least get a good solid feel of their capabilities, before we make a determined stand defending the cliffs, for that matter. Simply deploying in well-fortified defensive positions in this kind of terrain would force them to slow down, move cautiously. We wouldn't have that advantage anywhere else, or at least not to this extent, if they ever did get past the cliffs. Finally, as you yourself just pointed out, our whole objective, when you come right down to it, is to buy time for the commandery to get a real field army in here. Not only that, it's clear we're going to have to recall Carthos, or at least Hundred Helicas Strike, to reinforce our surviving battle dragon's strength. And we're going to have to buy time for that as well. Well, if that's the case, then let's start buying it as far forward as we can. But, sir, it can be argued either way, Clermont, Harshu said. Unfortunately, we don't have time to debate it properly, not with their reinforcements as close as they probably are by now. That means I've got to make the decision right now, and to be frank, with so much of our battle dragon combat strength written off, our ability to mount a mobile defense has just been pretty damned seriously compromised, even assuming we get Helica up here to reinforce you, which leaves us with an interesting dilemma. Do we risk even more losses in a possibly unsuccessful attempt to secure a choke point we can hold without dragons? Or do we avoid the losses, but accept that slowing these people in the open field is going to be a lot harder without those same dragons? Torok frowned as he realized he hadn't really considered that aspect of their suddenly unenviable strategic position. He'd been too focused on their disastrous losses and what it had done to their combat power right here, right now, to think that far ahead. We've still got the transports, sir, he pointed out after a moment. Some of them, some of the tactical transports, the transport battle dragon crosses, have breath weapon capability. Not anything I'd like to take up against another dragon, you understand, but enough to make them effective against ground targets not covered by the kind of firepower they've got concentrated here. And whether or not we decide we could commit them as improvised stand-ins for the battle dragons, they'd still give us operational mobility that has to be enormously better than theirs. Agreed. Harshu's eyes were hooded, his lips pursed in a thoughtful, silent whistle, as he folded his hands behind him and stepped out of his tent into the morning sunlight. Torok followed him, gazing out across the dragon field. If a man hadn't known about the nature of the losses the expeditionary force had just suffered, he might have been excused for wondering what all the doom and gloom were about. After all, their personal losses amounted to only fifteen men, out of a total force of over ten thousand. For that matter, they'd lost only fifteen, possibly sixteen dragons, out of a total dragon strength of well over two hundred. On the surface, their combat power should barely have been scratched. I agree with your point about the transports, Clamon, Harshu reiterated after several moments. But we still don't know exactly how powerful this reinforcement of theirs is going to be. Given what they just did to us, my estimate of what's likely to happen when they're allowed to attack us just got a lot more pessimistic. That leaves me even more strongly inclined to continue the attack. Sir, I know what you're going to say, and you may be right. Harshu interrupted Torok's nascent argument. But we've still got a major force advantage, and we haven't committed the griffins or our cavalry, and these people still haven't seen our combat engineers at work. Under the circumstances, I'm inclined to risk additional casualties, considering the possible payoff if the attack succeeds. Be honest, Clermont. We both know we've gotten off incredibly light at this point. 
I know we've just taken a truly heavy hit to our battle dragons, but I don't think we can justify simply turning around and retreating from a potential prize like this one, when the rest of our force is still completely intact. We haven't been hauling all this cavalry and all this infantry around just so we could decide not to use it. Torok nodded without speaking. After all, he couldn't argue with anything harsh you had just said. What I won't risk are the transports, the two thousand continued firmly. You're right about the mobility advantage we'll retain as long as we keep them intact. I'd prefer to keep the light cavalry intact, too. This is going to be a job for the dragoons and the heavy horse, I think. And if you lose the heavy cav, you lose less of your tactical mobility down the road, Torok added silently. Of course, you lose more of your total firepower, but still. He considered the situation, his mind turning to the problem of how best to employ the aerial assets he could still muster. And as he did, he discovered that he actually felt at least a flicker of optimism. The discovery astonished him, and he shook his head again, this time in rueful admiration. Left to himself, he was almost certain he would have called off the attack. Even now, he was far from convinced that continuing the attack was the proper decision. But there was really only one way to find out and the two thousand had the intestinal fortitude to do just that. He's right about the defensive advantages of this particular choke point, too, if we manage to pull it off after all, Torok thought. All right, sir, he said. Let me go get with my staff for a few minutes, and I'll be able to tell you what we've got to try again with. Then tell Master Armsman Chen Gareth to get some more men on that fire. Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik said, pointing at the flames and thick, dense smoke pouring from the southeastern tower. The interior of the structure was burning now, although there wasn't actually that much in it that was flammable. He wasn't that concerned over the possibility that the fire might spread, but the gap all those roaring flames and dense smoke left in their defenses worried him quite a lot, considering that their limited infantry and field artillery strength was all concentrated west of the fort. Yes, sir, the runner saluted sharply and disappeared into the smoke and confusion. Chan Skrithik watched him go, then turned back to Janaki. The crown prince had scarcely moved. Even during the aerial assault on the fort itself, he'd stood there motionless, gray eyes unfocused on anything of the physical world about him. Not even the falcon on his shoulder had stirred, despite all the sound, fury, and confusion swirling about them. The peregrine had been as still as a bird carved from stone, as if its human companion's total focused concentration had reached out and enveloped it as well. Chan Skrithik felt awed by the realization that he was seeing something very few people had ever witnessed, the legendary talent of the Calaraths in action. Yet there was more than just awe inside the regiment captain. There was desperate worry, concern for the safety of the young man who would one day wear the winged crown. For all his years of service, all his hard-won experience and competence, Rolf Chan Skrithik's military service had been peacetime service, and he'd never seen anything like the last hour of chaos and destruction. In less than ten minutes, those diving monstrosities had killed more men than Chan Skrithik had seen die in his entire previous military career, and they'd been his men. In the process, he discovered that it was something no man could truly prepare himself for ahead of time. The sense that he had somehow failed his men by not keeping them alive, that he would have lost fewer of them if he'd only been smarter, better, rolled around somewhere in the depths of his soul. His intellect knew better, knew no Sharonian had ever even imagined the possibility of facing this sort of attack, that no one could have prepared better. But this was a subject where intellect and emotions were scarcely even on speaking terms, and he knew it was going to take him a long, long time to resolve those feelings, assuming he ever could resolve them. That, however, was something the future was going to have to take care of in its own good time. For the present, more pressing worries and responsibilities pushed that concern out of the forefront of his mind. And one of those worries was the way Crown Prince Janaki had insisted upon standing in this exposed position, high atop the fortress wall. He stepped towards the prince, 
reaching out one hand to urge him to at least climb down from the gun platform to the parapet fighting step. But someone else's hand touched his own shoulder first. The regiment captain twitched in surprise, and he turned his head, and Chief Armsman Loris Chanbreichel shook his head with a small, sad smile. No, sir, the Marine said softly, begging your pardon, but it wouldn't do any good. Chief, Chan Skrethik told Janicki's senior non-com quietly, I can't just leave him up here, not after seeing all of this. He jerked his head at the smoke, the fires, the corpsmen and their volunteer civilian assistants carrying broken and savagely burned bodies to Company Captain Kriller's infirmary. We've got to get him under cover. No, sir. Chan Breichel's voice was respectful, but he shook his head again. If he'd thought about it, Chan Skrithik might have been surprised. No Ternathian officer with more brains than a rock ever doubted that while officers might command, it was the tough, experienced corps of long-service non-coms who actually ran the Empire's military. Yet it was unusual, to say the very least, for one of those non-coms to argue with a full regiment captain at a time like this, or about something like this. As if any of us had experienced something like this in the first place. The thought flickered somewhere down inside, and Chan Skrithik cocked his head questioningly. That's not how glimpses work, sir. Chan Breichel's expression, Chan Skrithik realized, was just as worried as his own, and the chief armsman's voice was rough-edged. I got a sort of crash course about his family's talent before he took over the platoon. The non-com continued, what he's doing now, it's called fugue state, sir, and for it to work. He has to be at what they call the Nexus. Nexus, Chan Skrithik repeated carefully. Yes, sir. Chan Breichel took off his helmet and tucked it under his left arm so that he could run the fingers of his right hand through his short, sweat-soaked hair in a gesture which shouted the depth of his worry, more eloquently than any words. The Nexus is the place where whatever it is that makes his talent work flows together most strongly. It seemed to the regiment captain that Chan Breichel was trying to find the exact words to express something that didn't really lend itself well to explanations. Sir, the chief armsman said earnestly, I never expected to see this. Gods, I never wanted to see it. Because they told me that if I did, the shit would be neck deep and rising fast, begging your pardon. But the thing is, for him to go into fugue state at all, he has to be in exactly the right place. No one else can tell where that right place is. Triad, he couldn't have told you ahead of time, most likely. And that place could change, even in the middle of a glimpse. But until it does, it's where he has to stay, and you won't be able to move him. I've never heard anything like that, Chief. It could have sounded accusatory, but it didn't. According to all the legends, sir, Chan Breichel grinned crookedly. If you were a Calarath, would you want your enemies to know you'd be stuck in one place at a time like this? Chan Skrithik shook his head, and the chief armsman shrugged. That's probably the main reason the stories never mention it. On the other hand, His Highness says that someone with a really strong talent actually can move around in fugue state. Some of those with the very strongest talents have actually been able to fight in fugue state, for that matter. He says his talent isn't that strong, though. That's why he's just sort of frozen like this. Chan Skrithik heard the desperate unhappiness in the Marine's voice. Chan Breichel didn't want his crown prince and a young man to whom he was obviously and deeply devoted standing on this wall any more than Roth Chan Skrithik did. I see, Chief. Chan Skrithik laid a hand on Chan Breichel's shoulder. I wish... He'd explained that to me earlier. With all due respect, sir, I think he probably figured that if he had, you'd have kicked us out before the bastards attacked. Maybe I would have, Chan Skrithik admitted, and Chan Breichel shrugged again. Maybe I wish you had, too, sir. Gods know I wanted to argue with him about it, but he told me he has to be here, and somehow when he says that, you just can't. Chan Breichel's voice trailed off and he shook his head in the helpless, bemused gesture Chan Skrithik understood perfectly. He hadn't been prepared for the sheer force of Janicki's presence either. 
nor was he any more confident than Chan Brickell of his ability to argue at the Crown Prince's decisions. And so he only smiled sadly and squeezed the chief armsman's shoulder. Well, in that case, chief, we'll just have to see to it that we keep him in one piece, won't we? All right, sir, Clareman Torok said. Here's what we've got left. He copied the files in his own crystal to 2,000 Harshus and waited while Harshu's quick, fierce eyes darted over the information. The 2,000 digested it with his customary speed, then looked back up at Torok. I remember you're saying the griffin handlers were worried about their control spells. Yes, sir, and they still are. Worried, I mean. But they still don't have anything concrete to point to, either. I didn't want to use them before, because on the basis of our previous experience, neither 500 Mer nor I thought we'd need them. Obviously, we were wrong. So was I, Harshu reminded him. The 2000's tone was slightly absent as he looked back over Torok's hastily recorded notes. Are you sure about bringing Erlan's transports in this close? He asked after a moment. According to the maps, both the designated LZs should be dead ground from their observed positions. Agreed, but don't forget that their artillery isn't like ours, Clamon. They don't necessarily need direct lines of sight to their targets. Yes, sir. I tried to allow for that by placing them far enough from their main position to be out of their range. I understand. Unfortunately, we've already encountered at least one weapon, those big rotating things on the walls that we'd never seen before. I'm not inclined to assume they don't have other longer-ranged weapons we also haven't met up with before. Well, Torok brought up his own copy of the information and paged through to a map generated from the Sharonian charts captured at Fort Cartoon. We could put them here, or here, instead, he said, using his stylus to drop a pair of crosshairs onto the map. Both spots are farther from the fort, so Erlon's cavalry would have farther to go, but there's a steep, solid mountain slope between both of them and the fort. From what we've seen tinkering around with those captured mortars of theirs, I don't think even their weapons could drop something in that close on a reverse slope that steep. Um... Harshu frowned, contemplating the map. Then he nodded, although he still didn't look precisely enthralled. The other alternative, sir, is to make it an infantry assault. Torok pointed out. If we throw the griffins straight into their faces, and the tactical transports come in close behind them, we'd have the transports breath weapons, such as they are, for support, and the Sharonians would probably be too busy with the griffins to knock many of them down. Tempting, Harshu acknowledged. Very tempting in some ways. But our men are going to need heavy weapons support if they're going to have a chance against Sharonian weapons at close range. And as you pointed out, we may need those transport breath weapons later on, especially if this attack doesn't succeed. Besides, if we can take Salby, infantry is going to be more useful than cavalry afterward for defending the sort of terrain between the fort and the portal. He gazed down at the map for several more minutes, rubbing his chin, then paused. You know, he said slowly, if we timed it properly... We might still be able to use the transports after all. Torok's eyes narrowed, and his superior looked up at him with a smile. If you were a Sharonian, Clamon, and you'd never seen anything like a dragon or an augmented horse or a unicorn, which of the three would monopolize your attention if you saw all of them coming at you at once? Chapter 29 Immortal Aruncus, Tarnal Garsel, Windlord Garsel, muttered. The second Lord of Horse stood in Sun Lord Markin's command post, looking back at the smoke-streaming PAAF fort behind them, and he had ample reason to invoke the Euromathian god of war. Both cavalry officers, like Rolf Chanscrithic, were veterans of long service, and, like Chanscrithic, neither of them had ever seen or imagined anything like this. Actually, Garsel found the smoke and flames almost comforting in their normality. At least, they were much less disconcerting than the enormous beast, the dragon, he told himself, using the Ternathian crown prince's terminology as he looked back at it, which had crashed to earth less than sixty yards from the CP. 
It loomed like a scaly mountain of broken bone and flesh where it had landed, crushing a dozen of Garsel's cavalry troopers in its death plunge. A ruckus indeed, a voice said at Garsel's shoulder. He turned his head and saw Sun Lord Markin gazing out across the sandbags at the same sight. The first Lord of Horse was the second-ranking officer of the Salby garrison, which had made him the proper choice to command the infantry and artillery positions outside the fort itself. He didn't exactly look shaken, but his expression came far closer to that than anything Garsel had ever seen from him before. I didn't really believe him, you know, Garsel said. Markin glanced at him and raised one eyebrow. I suppose I didn't want to believe him, Garsel admitted, and this time Markin snorted. I imagine most of us would have preferred not to, the Sun Lord said after a moment. It's like something out of a child's fairy tale about monsters, ogres, and magic spells. Garso nodded, and Markin turned his eyes back to the monstrous, broken-winged carcass sprawled across the mangled bodies of his men. There was another reason Garso hadn't wanted to believe Prince Janicki, the Sun Lord thought. Another reason he hadn't wanted to, for that matter. Markin had his own very private reservations about his emperor, but Chaba Bussar was still his emperor. And up to this moment, at least, Markin had found himself forced to agree with Emperor Chaba on at least one point. Far too many people in Sharona were reacting with far too much panic to the reports from the frontiers. Stories about magic simply didn't belong in the everyday world of hard-headed, practical men. Oh, no one had questioned the fact that the Arcanans were actually there, or that they had massacred the Chalgan Consortium survey crew with frighteningly unknown weapons. But Hell's Gate was 48,000 miles from Sharona, and hard on the news of the massacre had come the word that less than 400 men had taken the swamp portal away from the enemy with ludicrous ease. Sharonian weapons had been clearly and obviously superior to anything they had yet faced, and nothing else the Arcanans had demonstrated since that short, brutal battle had been especially terrifying. Surely not enough to justify the almost hysterical response of certain of Sharona's political leaders. Whatever happened out on the distant frontier, there was no real chance of an enemy successfully fighting his way through the portals and all of the wearisome miles between them to actually reach Sharona. Even assuming that all of those arguing in favor of some sort of worldwide, hell's, multiverse-wide empire were genuinely sincere in their motivations and not simply seeking to manipulate the political equation for their own advantage, which seemed unlikely to say the least, it would have been foolish to allow oneself to be caught up in the hysteria. Now, smelling the smoke from Fort Salby, looking at the huge, broken body of a genuine dragon, while he awaited the second assault from a force which had advanced 4,000 miles in less than two weeks. Jukon Darshu, Sun Lord Markin, knew those hysterical leaders had been right all along. If the Arcanans had dragons that breathed fire and spat lightning, if they could cover 8% of the total distance to Sharona in only two weeks, then the gods alone knew what else they might have or be able to do. It was entirely possible that they could fight their way clear to Sharona after all, and that Zindel of Ternathia and Ronal of Fernalia had been dead serious from the outset. That whatever Chava Bussar might think, Zindel had not been manufacturing and manipulating the crisis which had impelled him to the throne of a united Sharona. For Soma, help us all, he thought. If the crown prince saw this in a glimpse, what has his father seen? He didn't much care for that question, for a lot of reasons. Of course you don't. You're a Euromathian, and Euromathians don't like Ternathians, do they? But if the Arcanans have capabilities like this, then maybe the conclave was right. Maybe we can't afford to be Euromathians or Ternathians any longer, even if it does mean putting another crown on Zindel Jan Kalarath's head. They're coming back. Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik twitched as Janicki spoke for the first time in at least half an hour. Your Highness, they're coming back, Janicki repeated in that same otherworldly tone. They're using their dragons to circle around the other aspect of the portal in Karis. Then, they're going to use the western aspect in Tresum 
and swing wide, trying to keep us from seeing them while they put cavalry on the ground. Cavalry? In the open against dug-in infantry and artillery? Chance Griffith couldn't believe what he was hearing. Yes, Janicky said. He turned those daunting eyes on the regiment captain. It's not going to be that easy. They can put them on the ground east of us and avoid most of our covering positions, and their cavalry is a lot faster than ours. And they've got something else, something to cover them. I can't quite see it yet. And they're loading up other dragons with infantry. They'll be coming at us too. And I think they're going to use those eagle lions this time as well. Chan Scrithic's jaw tightened. He would have been totally confident of his entrenched infantry's ability to deal with any Sharonian cavalry attack. But as Janicky had just reminded them, he wasn't dealing with Sharonians, as their ability to avoid his entrenchments demonstrated. Can you see how they'll come at us, your highness? He asked. Not yet, Janicky replied, and a hint of frustration shadowed his voice even through its detachment. There are still too many possibilities. They're coming together, focusing, but they aren't there yet. Can you see where they'll land their cavalry? Chen Scrithic asked, opening his map case. Here or here, Janicky's forefinger stabbed the map, and Chen Scrithic looked up at the senior armsman Isia. Message for Company Captain Messiah. Give him these coordinates. Chan Scrithic read them off from the map grid. Tell the company captain I want Chan Forkel to watch both of them, and I want the howitzers ready to engage. Yes, sir. The flicker had been writing quickly while the regiment captain spoke. Now he read back his shorthand notations. Chan Scrithic nodded approval, and Isia flicked the messenger canister to Messiah's flicker. The artillerist's acknowledgment appeared on the parapet beside Chan Scrithic less than two minutes later. Commander of 50, Delther Farlow, was still trying to come to grips with what had happened to the initial attack, as he and Deathclaw led the line of transport dragons out of the portal's western aspect. The maneuver wouldn't have been very practical without dragons. The nature of the portals between universes meant that any traveler from Karas found himself confronting the same sort of enormous cliffs, no matter which way he passed through the portal. But the westernmost cliffs were quite a bit higher than those to the east. Wind erosion had softened and grooved the tops of those sheer walls until the pressures between the two sides of the portal had equalized, but the palisade of stone remained steeply and starkly unscalable. Facing east into Tracem, from the opposite side of the portal, the cliffs were much shallower, and the wind screaming down the slopes beyond the cliff's edges had carved deep ravines. The Sharonian construction engineers had taken advantage of that when they cut their road and railroad routes. As far as Farlow could see, they hadn't had very much choice about that. But the expeditionary force did, and 2,000 Harshu and 1,000 Torog had decided to take advantage of that fact. Too bad they didn't take advantage of it before, Farlow couldn't help thinking bitterly, even though he knew it was unfair. Nobody could have predicted what had happened to his fellow battle dragon pilots and their mounts before they'd actually seen it. He knew that. But he also knew that somehow he, a mere commander of 50, had become the senior battle dragon pilot of the entire first provisional Talon. Of course, I'm a commander of 50, with only three dragons to command. He grimaced behind his helmet visor at the thought, then shook his head. He had other things to be concentrating on at the moment. The dragons are landing at the second location, sir, Chief Armsman Chan Forkel told Company Captain Messiah. Too bad, Messiah grunted, then turned to his own flicker. Inform Regiment Captain Chan Scrithic that the enemy is landing at the second location and that we can't bring it under fire. Yes, sir. Damn it, Chan Scrithic muttered as Issia read him Messiah's terse dispatch. He'd been afraid of that when Janicky indicated the landing areas on the map. The one in question would have been out of range for the mortars anyway, although the howitzers had the reach. He doubted these Arcanan bastards had any way of knowing that, but they'd lucked out and chosen a landing site in the dead ground beyond a steep intervening ridgeline. Tell Company Captain Messiah, I want Chan Forkel to keep them under observation. Let me know the instant they begin to move out. Yes, sir. Five hundred Erlans in position, sir, the Hummer handler announced. Good. Arshu turned to Torok. I suppose that means it's time, Clamon. Yes, sir, it is. 
Torok nodded and looked at the Hummer handler. Send Hundred Comus the release order, senior sort. Yes, sir. The Hummer handler opened the smaller cage in which he had set aside the Hummer with the release order already recorded. Now he took the small, fiercely aggressive little creature in his hands, whispering something to it, and tossed it into the air. Its wings blurred into invisibility, and it turned like a questing hound, hovering in midair. Then, sudden as a snapping arbalist string, it flashed away. Torok watched it disappear and fought down an urge to inhale deeply and surreptitiously. He remained far from certain that continuing the attack was the right move, but that no longer really mattered. First, because it wasn't his decision. Second, because everyone was committed now. Commander of 100, Sertel Cormus, would release his griffins five minutes after he received Torok's dispatch, and the griffins' onslaught would be the signal for the rest of the assault. Graholus, I hope this works, a thousand thought fervently. Please, let this work. Regiment Captain. Roth Chanskrethic turned quickly back to Janicky. Something had changed in the prince's voice. The fort's commander couldn't quite identify what that change was, but whatever it was, it sent a fresher, deeper surge of anxiety through him. Yes, your highness. It's starting. Janicky turned to look at him, and the distant focus in his eyes was deeper and darker than ever. Listen to me, he said, and there was a stark edge of command in his voice. I don't know how much time there'll be. It won't be enough, however much of it there is so it's important. Listen to what I tell you. Of course, your highness. Chanskrithik was puzzled. Of course, anything Prince Janicky had to tell him was important. Did Janicky think Chanskrithik would have allowed him to stand up here, Chief Armsman Chan Breichel or not, if it wasn't important? I can't tell yet. Janicky sounded far more frustrated. I can't tell. Which is the real attack yet? He wheeled back around, staring out across the parapet. Then his head tilted back. He looked up into the sky above the fort, his head swinging from side to side. Not yet, he told the bright, cloudless heavens in a strange tone which mingled command and entreaty in almost equal measure. Not yet. For a moment, nothing else happened. Then, his falcon launched from his shoulder with a high, fierce cry, and he sucked in a deep breath. They're coming! His arm shot out, and he pointed sharply to the northwest. There! Fifty Farlow watched the strike griffins go streaking past the transports and his escorting battle dragons. The griffins were far smaller, tiny compared to the dragons, but there were over a hundred of them, and he was delighted that they were at least a thousand feet higher than his own formation. Farlow had a lively respect for the men who worked as griffin handlers. He trusted their professionalism implicitly. Yet he'd seen what griffins could do, and he wanted no part of it. If the compulsion spells failed, or if those spells misidentified the griffin's target, enough of them could swarm even a dragon out of the heavens. This time, though, there was no mistake. The griffins swept onward, diving towards the smoke-gouting fort like a plague of pony-sized locusts, and Farlow smiled thinly behind his visor. Should have let them swarm the bastards in the first place he thought, even though he knew precisely why it hadn't seemed necessary. I bet they won't like this one little bit. Sir, I think... Yes. The lookout, floating on his levitation spell at the end of the long tether to his saddle, shouted down to Commander of 500 Garrus Erlen. The Griffins are in position. Good, Erlen barked. Now get your ass back down here. Yes, sir. Bugler. Yes, sir. Blow walk. Yes, sir. The bugle began to sound, and the big, heavily augmented horses of the Seventh Zydor Heavy Dragoons stirred into movement. They had a long way to go, and so they moved without haste. The time for that would come, but it wasn't here yet. Not yet. They were bigger, much bigger, than the Light Cavalry's unicorns, and despite their augmentation, that meant they were slower with less endurance as well. Their speed and strength had to be conserved for the final dash to their objective. But that was all right. The Griffins wouldn't attack immediately. The compulsion spells directing their strike had been carefully structured to give Erlen's cavalry time to get into position. The heavy horse's larger size meant each of them could carry not one rider, but two. 
and two of Erlen's 120-strong companies were configured as standard heavy dragoons. Each horse bore a two-man saddle, with the rear rider armed not with a saber or lance, but with a cut-down version of an infantry dragon. It was much shorter ranged than the infantry weapon, but longer ranged than any arbalist and far more deadly. Each horse and commander of 100 Orkel Killeron's Charlie Company, on the other hand, carried only a standard saddle, instead of the two-man heavy dragoon version. In place of the normal second rider, a smaller version of the standard dragon cargo pod had been harnessed to each horse. Its comparatively diminutive size was small enough for an augmented horse to handle without too much trouble, but still big enough to carry a full 12-man infantry squad. A quarter of those pods were occupied by gifted engineering specialists. The others contained over a thousand picked infantry, and one basis for their selection was that at least half of them had at least some gift. Enough, at any rate, for them to be armed with dagger stones for the assault. Activate the glamour, Erlen said to the gifted commander of fifty at his side. Yes, sir. That's it. Janicki's voice was suddenly calm, almost quiet, and Chance Krithik jerked his eyes away from the small dots circling above Fort Salby with a hungry eagerness he could sense even from here. They seemed very close, those dots. But if they were the size the prince had described, then they were much higher than they looked. I beg your pardon, your highness. I see now, Janicki said, and turned his back on the circling dots to face the regiment captain with a strangely serene little smile. I didn't think there was going to be enough time. Your highness? Something about Janicki's voice, the way his body language had somehow relaxed, worried Chance Grithik. Listen. Janicki put his hands on Chance Grithik's shoulders, pulling the older man so close to him their foreheads almost touched. The eagle lines are going to attack in just a few minutes. They'll come in from the west. When they do, we'll see the dragons coming in behind them. The prince's words came quickly with a sort of distant urgency. Chance Grithik might have been fooled by their quietness, but he saw something behind the ghosts in those gray eyes. He saw ferocious purpose, determination, and his own eyes narrowed with the intensity of his concentration on what Janicki was saying. They'll have infantry on the dragons. Some of the dragons will be spitting fire or lightning. They'll have more infantry on lines ready to drop over the parapet. They'll use eagle lines to try to suppress our fire, but the dragons aren't the real threat. They're a diversion, regiment captain. They want us looking at them while the real attack comes in from behind us, from the east. Do you understand? The dragons and their infantry are the diversion, not the cavalry. Do you understand? Chen Skrithik nodded, and Janicki looked past him for a moment at senior armsman Isia. Warn Company Captain Messiaen, the cavalry have some sort of spell. It's like a smoke screen, but different. It'll look like a mirage, like heat shimmer. But the cavalry will be behind it. Most of the men won't be able to see through it, but Chan Forkel can. He's got to get Messiaen's first rounds on target, on the ranks around their standard. It's like a windsock, like one of the Arpathian dragon standards. That's where their commander is, where the spell will be coming from. Do you understand? Isia darted a look at Chan Skrithik. The regiment captain nodded, and the flicker swallowed hard, then produced a jerky nod of his own. Yes, yes, your highness. Janicki's head swiveled back to Chance Krithik while Isia's frenzied pencil started scribbling the message to Messiaen. The black dots overhead were beginning to widen their circle. Chance Krithik was vaguely aware of them, sensed the way they were straining at some immaterial leash. But most of his attention was focused on Janicki Chan Kalarath and the prophetic fire burning in his eyes. They've got those fire throwers on some of the horses, and some of the others are towing carriers, floating carriers like hot air balloons, with more infantry in them. They'll try to get the carriers in close enough to assault the parapet, use them like scaling ladders. And if they can't get over the wall, they'll go through it. They've got people with spells that can open breaches, like blasting charges, but different. They'll have to reach the wall to actually use them. They'll try for the dead spot at the southeast corner where the fire will cover them and none of the machine guns or pedestal guns will bear. You have to get men with grenades over there now. Do you understand? Chan Skrithik felt himself nodding as Janicki repeated the three-word question like some sort of mantra. See to it, chief, he said to Chan Brykel. The Marine stared at him for one instant, then turned almost agonized eyes to Janicki. He hesitated a heartbeat longer, but the crown prince gave him a smile and twitched his head, confirming Chan Skrithik's order and Chan Brykel thundered off, shouting for the other members of his platoon. 
Some of the infantry have the same sort of smaller fire throwers. Janicki went on, the machine gun words coming with almost impossible clarity, yet simultaneously seeming to trip and fall over one another. If the ones with the blasting charges touch the wall, they'll blow through it. The fire throwers have less range than a revolver, but they'll kill anyone they hit, and each of them is good for several shots. And they've got other people with them. People with spells, like a lifter's only better. They can actually lift people up over the parapet without using ladders or the carriers if they can get close enough. The circling dots were plunging downward now. Rifles began to crack. The surviving machine guns on the parapet began to fire as well. But the griffins were smaller, faster, and far more agile targets. The men Janicki had insisted on arming with the more rapidly firing Model 7s were going to be far more effective than riflemen, but the shotguns were also much shorter ranged. The men armed with them had to wait for the griffins to come to them. Remember, sir, Janicki's eyes burned into Roth Chanskrithik's soul, and his hands slid down from the regiment captain's shoulders to grip the front of his uniform tunic. Remember, the dragons are the diversion. They won't risk them in close. They've lost too many. It's the cavalry. You've got to stop the cavalry. If you stop it, they'll break off the attack. They won't take additional losses, not this far from home. But if the cavalry gets through, gets inside the walls, it's over. You can't... He broke off suddenly, and his eyes dropped abruptly back into focus. They were suddenly, once again, the clear gray eyes of a young man, not the eyes of an avatar of legends. It's here. His voice had changed, too. It was almost almost normal again. Good luck, sir, he said, and his hands locked on Chan Skrithik's tunic. The regiment captain's eyes just had time to begin to widen, and then Janicki picked him bodily up and threw him off the gun platform. Chan Skrithik landed on the fighting step three feet below, landed so hard, so awkwardly, that he broke the bones in his left forearm into gravel. He scarcely noticed the white-hot agony of those snapping, shattered bones. It was so small, so unimportant in comparison. Janicki Chan Kalarath never even turned his head. He was still looking at Chan Skrithik when the griffin he'd never seen with his physical eyes at all hit him from behind and killed him instantly. Chapter 30 The griffins hit Fort Salby like a tidal wave of ferocity wrapped up in feathers, talons, and fur. The men on the fort's walls had never seen anything like them. But then, they'd never seen anything quite like a lot of what they were seeing this day. And if they'd never seen them before, at least they'd had them described to them by officers who had been briefed by Crown Prince Janicki. Those briefings diffused much of the terror of the unknown. They didn't magically banish fear, didn't make dragons or griffins any less monstrous, any less unnatural. But they set aside the paralyzing shock complete surprise might have achieved. And the men of Fort Salby were angry. They knew about the negotiations. They knew the crown prince was right, that the Arcanans must have been carefully planning their offensive the entire time they'd been talking about negotiations and peaceful settlements. They'd drawn their own conclusions about what must have happened to the voices down chain from Trasum and they knew they'd been supposed to be taken by surprise themselves and massacred in what they thought was peacetime. They'd already smashed the first attack. The price might have been high, but they'd knocked those stupendous dragons out of the air, proven the Arcanans' magical creatures were indeed mortal, however wondrous they might appear. And so, as the griffins swept down upon them, swinging wide to avoid overflying the infantry positions west of the fort, they were ready. Rifle fire flamed across the parapet. The heavy machine guns which had wreaked such havoc against the dragons couldn't traverse quickly enough to engage the smaller, fleeter griffins effectively, and even the rifles were less than completely effective. As good as the Model 10 was, it was still a bolt-action rifle engaging flying targets coming in at speeds of well over 200 miles an hour. Here and there, a griffin's wings suddenly faltered, a beast fell out of the oncoming cloud of killers, but the rest kept coming. The overhead cover which had been erected to protect the firing steps from fireballs proved at least partly effective against griffins as well. Some of the beasts flung themselves upon the sandbags, ripping at them, shredding them to get at the fragile human bodies beneath them. Others hurled themselves straight into the faces of the defenders, coming over the parapet, swarming into the gap between the overhead and the tops of the fort's walls. 
Still others swept past the parapets entirely, swooping on the unprotected men on the fort parade ground and in the gun pits. Fourteen-inch bayonets turned rifles into short spears, thrusting frantically as two-foot beaks snapped like headsmen's axes. Here and there, wicked talons gripped rifles, snatching them aside, and everywhere men screamed in agony as bellies were opened, throats were ripped out, heads simply disappeared. Revolvers cracked and shotguns began to bellow, thundering in rapid fire, spitting buckshot into tawny-hided killers, and griffins shrieked in agony of their own. It was all one mad, swirling sea of chaos. Rothchand Scriffic saw the griffin which had killed his prince. The creature flung back its head, bloody beak gaping in a scream of triumph, and then a feathered thunderbolt struck from above. Janicky's falcon hurled itself into the monster's face with a hissing shriek of pure fury, and the guillotine beak snapped ferociously as its small tormentor ripped bleeding furrows across its face and blinded one eye. Talina distracted the griffin just long enough for Chan Scrithic to drag out his revolver. The regiment captain was aware of his prince, bleeding under the griffin's ferocious talons, and he bared his teeth in savage hatred as his thumb cocked the hammer and the heavy weapon roared. The griffin screamed in fresh pain as the heavy bullet smashed into it. It turned away from Talina back towards Chan Scrithic, and the regiment captain shot it again and again. It went down at last with a fourth shot, and Chan Scrithic felt hands pulling him back to his feet. It was senior armsman Issia, bleeding from a deep cut in his right cheek, his eyes wild. Sir, are you all right, sir? Chen Skrithik stared at the flicker for two or three eternal heartbeats. All right? How could he ever be all right again? He ripped his eyes away from Issia, and they burned with unshed tears as he looked down at the dead young man at his feet. But then he shook himself. His prince had died to give him his final orders, and his lips drew back. Message, he barked to Issia. Yes, sir. Issia dragged out his notepad, holding it to one side to avoid bleeding on it. I want platoon Captain Chen North over at the southeastern tower now. He's to do whatever it takes to hold that wall. Yes, sir. Issia's pencil slashed at the pad. He stuffed the hastily written order into a message canister and flicked it on its way. Message to Sun Lord Markin, Chan Skritha continued without a break. Begin. Expect heavy cavalry attack from southeast. Expect fire throwers. Imperative the enemy not reach the fort's walls with blasting spells. He thought about adding specific instructions, but there was no need. You're a Mathian or not, Markin was smart and experienced. He'd know what to do. Issia flicked that message to its destination as well, then took Chan Skritha's revolver and quickly replaced the expended rounds for the suddenly one-handed regiment captain. Chan Skrithik thanked him absently and reholstered the weapon, then started down the steps from the parapet. He hated leaving that vantage point, and hated almost as much the feeling that he was somehow abandoning his prince. But with Janicky dead, he needed access to Chan Forkel. Movement jarred the shattered bones in his left forearm. A part of him almost welcomed the physical pain as a distraction from the anguish within. But he couldn't afford to be distracted by either of them and so he pushed both of them aside, cradling his broken arm with his good one in an effort to at least minimize the hurt, and trying not to think about what another fall might do to that arm, while he ran down the steps faster than he really should have. All about him he heard screams, rifle shots, shotguns, and pistols. Bodies and pieces of men's bodies fell from the walls. Sprays of blood and feathers seemed to be everywhere, and griffins, most dead, some only wounded, and even more dangerous for that, littered the parade ground. Chan Skrithig let go of his left arm and drew his revolver once more, as he and Issia headed out across that parade ground. Twice, wounded griffins slashed at him with beaks or talons, and twice, the heavy H&W revolver roared in his hand. Then, ahead of him, he saw company captain Messiaen. The new Farnalian company captain had moved down to the ground-level gun pits, and he'd brought his distance viewer with him. I understand what his highness said, sir, Wasire Chan Forkel protested. I'm trying, but they just gobs damn disappeared, and I can't get them back. The distance viewer broke off. For an instant, his eyes were distant, 
almost confused looking, and then abruptly they snapped back into focus. I've got them again, he said flat voiced. I see the standard too. Gods, those are big fucking horses. Screw their size, Lorva Messiah snapped. Give me a target. Yes, sir. Chan Forkel closed his eyes once more, concentrating on his talent. Distance viewers were critical to accurate indirect artillery fire. But Chan Forkel had a special talent, and Messiah had never been more glad that the chief armsman had wound up assigned to Fort Salby. Men with his talent were more often snapped up by the Navy, because Chan Forkel was a predictive distance viewer. His particular talent included just a touch of precognition, the ability to project a moving target's position ever so briefly in advance. Six thousand yards, Chan Forkel said suddenly, sharply. One seven three degrees, two minutes. Six thousand yards, Messiah bellowed. One seven three degrees, move, gods damn you. Bugler, sir. Blow at the trot. Yes, sir. Five hundred Erlin heard the urgent golden notes flaring from the bell-mouthed bugle, and the seventh Zydors sprang ponderously into a trot. Their horses might be slower than unicorns, but despite their size, the massive beasts were still faster than the finest unaugmented thoroughbred ever foaled. On the other hand, they still had over three miles to go. Bugler, blow canter! No! Chen Forkel shouted, and seven four-and-a-half-inch mortars coughed as one. There was no warning. One instant, the seventh Zydor heavy dragoons were thundering forward, moving up from a trot to a hard canter in perfect order under the protection of their cloaking glamour. The next, thunderbolts came dropping out of the heavens without any warning at all. Five hundred Erlin swore savagely as the mortar bombs exploded. They clustered around his command standard with enough perverse accuracy to make a man actually believe in demons after all, and the sun-baked, stony earth was almost as hard as a paved street. The incoming mortar rounds scarcely dented it, and there was nothing to absorb the force of the explosions or the deadly whirling splinters those explosions threw out in all directions. Horses and men screamed as white-hot steel fragments drove into fragile flesh and bone. Half a dozen of the huge steeds went down, shrieking like tortured women as legs broke or whirling steel knives opened their bellies. Spread out! Skirmish order! Erlan bellowed. Once again, the bugle's notes flared golden, and his men responded like the elite troopers they were. They opened their ranks, dispersing to deny their enemies a compact, concentrated target. Erlan watched the evolution. The confines of the valley meant they couldn't open their ranks as widely as he would have preferred, but at least they were no longer riding knee to knee. He bared his teeth as more of those infernal explosions raked the Zydors, and then he swore again, hideously, as he realized the commander of fifty responsible for the glamour was down. There they are, Loris Chan Brickle snapped. He didn't know how the Arcanans had pulled it off. Still, if the bastards had dragons, why shouldn't they have cloaks of invisibility as well? The thought flickered through the back of his mind, but whatever it was and however it had worked, it obviously hadn't fooled Company Captain Messiah's distance viewer. The explosions sprouting amongst the oncoming cavalry looked like flame-cored toadstools, and he saw the huge horses going down, spilling their riders. But not as many of them as I should see, something muttered in the back of his brain. Vothan, those things must be tough. The howitzers were firing as well, dropping their lighter shells in among the heavy mortar rounds, but they weren't going to stop that many pissed-off cavalrymen with less than a dozen tubes. Rifles, he shouted as the range raced downward and the platoon's Model 10s began to crack. More of Erlen's men and horses went down as the Sharonian shoulder weapons, the rifles, opened fire from atop the wall but at least the briefing from the recon crystal had been accurate. The tower that marked their objective was still on fire, and none of the machine guns and whatever the hells those other rapid-fire weapons had been could bear on them from this angle. The rifle fire would be bad enough, but... Fire! Sunlord Markin heard the young commander of horses shout, 
as the company of dismounted cavalry Markin had snatched away from the entrenched positions west of Fort Salby, rounded the fort's flank. Accuracy would have been too much to expect out of them after their hard run, and they'd lost at least ten or twelve men to stray, rampaging eagle lions. But even unaimed fire from a hundred and twenty rifles had to get the other side's attention. Of course, Markin thought distantly, Getting heavy cavalry's attention might not be the very best thing dispersed infantry could do when it's outnumbered three or four to one in the open. Mother Jambacall! Five hundred Erlins spat the filthy curse as still more rifles began to fire, this time from ground level. His head whipped around and his eyes narrowed as he saw the infantrymen. They were firing furiously, although with nowhere near the accuracy of the men on top of the wall. For a moment, Erlon considered sending one of his dragoon companies to scatter them, but he quickly decided against it. They weren't hitting very many of his own men, and when the Zydors reached their objective, the fort itself would cover them against these new Sharonians' fire. They'd lose more men charging them than they would simply galloping straight into the waiting cover. Chief Armsman Chan Brykel watched Arcanans dropping under his platoon's aimed fire. The mortar fire continued to rake their ranks as well but it wasn't going to be enough to keep them from reaching the wall. They were going to run in under the mortar's effective arc of fire when they got a bit closer. His marines weren't scoring as many hits as they should have been either. Was that from excitement and too much adrenaline, he wondered? Or could it be that the bastards had some other spell protecting them? Not something that could make them invisible, perhaps, but something that made them harder to hit. He didn't know, and it didn't matter. What mattered was that at least some of them were going to make it to the base of the wall after all, and Prince Janicki and Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik were counting on Chan Brykel to keep them out of Fort Salby. Chan Yarin. Yes, Chief. Petty armsman Rokel Chan Yarin, whose promotion had come through less than two weeks before, replied. Get your grenade party ready. Yes, Chief. When Lord Garsol had suddenly become the senior officer in the infantry and artillery positions protecting the western approaches to Fort Salby, it was not, he discovered, a position he particularly wanted. Unfortunately, it was his. Sun Lord Markin's decision to personally lead the one company they'd retained as an immediate reserve struck Garsol as quixotic at the very least. Nonetheless, he'd obeyed the Sun Lord's orders and his flicker had sent out the orders that stripped an entire battalion out of its positions and sent them thudding across the barren, dusty earth in Markin's wake. Which left Garsol to deal with the minor matter of what looked like at least two or three hundred dragons headed straight for him. And they're the diversion, are they? The thought flashed through his brain, and for the first time in his life he found himself devoutly hoping all the tales and legends about the Calarath talent were actually accurate, because if they weren't. He watched them coming on, and as he did, another thought occurred to him. They may be supposed to be a diversion. In fact, I'll bet they are. They'd have followed closer behind those eagle lines if this were a serious attack. But it looks like they may not have realized just how long-ranged our artillery really is. His smile was thin and feral as the huge dragons swooped and wove their intricate patterns. There was an awful lot of motion up there, but they weren't actually advancing all that quickly, and he looked at his flicker once again. Message to the artillery. Prepare to load with shrapnel, but don't set the fuses until I give the order to fire. Five hundred Erlon's lead dragoons reached the foot of the fortress wall. The rear troopers leaned back, triggering their cut-down infantry dragons, sending blasts of intolerable heat rolling up the outer face of the wall. A Sharonian who leaned out to fire down upon them shrieked horribly and plunged from the parapet, trailing fire like a human meteor. Others ducked back, cowering away from the searing fury. But still others had been waiting. Erlan saw the small objects plunging down from above, and his stomach tightened. He didn't know what the god's damned things were, but he was certain he was about to find out. Chan Brykel heard the hand grenades exploding even through the thunder of the rest of the battle, and his eyes glittered with cold satisfaction as he listened to the screams from below. The bastards were too close to the wall for artillery to drop on them any longer, but Chan Yarin's grenades were obviously a different matter. 
Yet even as they exploded, the blasts of heat and fury continued to roar up from below as well. He looked out across the parapet, wondering if he had any eyebrows left, and swore with fresh inventiveness as he saw the floating whatever the hells they were. He didn't know what to call them. They looked for all the world like some sort of airborne boats towed by the massive horses to which they were tethered. But whatever they were, they floated even higher than Fort Salby's walls, and they were packed to the gunnels with Arcanans, some of whom, obviously, had fire throwers of their own. His men had the advantage of better cover. The fort's adobe had already proven itself virtually immune to the blast effect of the Arcanan fireballs, and the mortars could still reach the tow horses. Unfortunately, Chan Brickle and the other defenders on the wall were also outnumbered by somewhere around ten to one. And when one of the fireballs did find a chink in the parapet, it killed or wounded four or five of his people at once. Chen Yaren and his squad were still chucking hand grenades over the edge as quickly as they could pull the pins, and Chan Brickel had another squad doing nothing but protecting the grenadiers, which left him only three squads, less than thirty men with the casualties he'd already taken, to hold off at least eight or nine hundred Arcanans in those floating boats. It was not a winning proposition, even for Imperial Ternathian Marines. Five hundred Erlun grimaced in satisfaction as Charlie Company finally came up with the infantry assault force. His two lead companies had taken at least thirty percent casualties, but they'd also managed to suppress a lot of the defensive fire. Now, Killeron's troopers had managed, not without taking serious losses of their own, to get close enough that they were sheltered from the Sharonians' artillery fire by the wall itself, and that meant the infantry could damned well take over. Chan Brickle felt someone pounding on his shoulder. He turned his head and found himself looking into platoon Captain Tarkle Chan Noth's blue eyes. How bad, chief? Chan Noth shouted in the Marine's ear, pointing downward to indicate the ground at the foot of the wall. I think we've got the first batch of bastards pinned, sort of at least. Chan Brickle shouted back, then pointed out at the approaching air bolts. More and more fire was beginning to come from them, and Chan Noth ducked as a fireball exploded just below the edge of the parapet directly in front of him. But if we don't stop that, sir, we're fucked, Chan Brickle added, quite unnecessarily, he was certain. Then it's a good thing I brought this. Chan Brickle turned his head and saw a three-gun section of Farika-1 machine guns setting up with frantic haste. Mother Jambacol! Erlon snarled again as the distinctive ripping cloth sound of one of the Sharonians' accursed machine guns crackled above him. He whipped his head around in time to see splinters flying from two of the closer personnel pods as the Sharonians flayed them with fire. Then, suddenly, one of them plunged to shatter on the ground below as one of the Sharonian bullets either killed the gifted engineer controlling the levitation spell or smashed the accumulator itself. A second pod followed moments later, and the cavalry commander looked around quickly, then grunted as his eyes found what they'd been looking for. Fifty Randa! The dark-haired commander of Fifty with the engineer's shoulder patch looked around sharply at the sound of his name. Yes, sir. I want a god's damned hole, Fifty, Erlan snarled, jabbing a finger at the fort wall. And I want it right fucking now! Randar darted a quick, anxious glance up the wall to where those infernal explosive devices were plunging down and swallowed hard. Apparently, however, the thought of being blown apart was less daunting than whatever he'd just seen in Erlon's eyes. Yes, sir. Randar reined his horse around and started shouting for the rest of his engineering section. Chan Brickle was just beginning to feel a certain cautious optimism when the world went crazy. It wasn't really an explosion. It was too quiet for that. There was no flash, no thunder, just the sudden concussive shattering of adobe and stone. It should have sounded like an explosion, but it actually sounded more like a frozen tree trunk snapping in an icy winter night. But whatever it sounded like, the force of it shook Fort Salby to its bones. A section of wall at least eight feet across at the base simply disintegrated. It flew apart 
spraying adobe, rock, and men, as it opened a wedge-shaped gap which ran all the way to the parapet and measured better than forty feet across at the top. Two of Chan Noth's machine guns went with it, and so did petty armsman Chan Yarin and his grenadiers. Half of Chan Breichel's platoon was simply gone, and the survivors were shocked, stunned by the sudden cataclysm. Chan Noth's men had been hit less severely, but they'd also still been in the act of taking up their positions. Confusion swept through them, however briefly, and the defender's fire faltered. Now! Gyrus Erlin bellowed as the fire from above slackened. Now, go, go, God damn it! Young Randar had done his job well. In fact, he'd done it too well for his own good. He and most of his section, and another twenty or so of Erlon's troopers, had been caught in the collapse his demolition spell had wreaked. That was unfortunate, but no one could control whether wreckage from a demo spell was going to fall, and at least they had a breach at last. Half of Erlon's surviving men flung themselves off their horses. They took their swords, their infantry dragons, and their dagger stones with them, and charged forward, swarming up over the wreckage into the clouds of billowing dust and smoke with the high, howling cheer of the Seventh Zydors. Lorash Chan Breichel stared down into the gap which had suddenly appeared and shook himself. Despite its width, it was choked with rubble that rose to at least a third of the wall's original height. Unfortunately, enough of that rubble had spilled outward to provide a ramp, and he saw arcanans in cavalry boots, breastplates, and helmets swarming up it. At least half of them seemed to be carrying the glittering tubes of their fire throwers, and he snarled in fury. He jerked the pin out of his final hand grenade and he tossed it down into the gap, only to see it lodge in a hollow in the rubble before it exploded. The pocket into which it had fallen absorbed most of its power, and only three or four men went down. The others kept coming, and a fireball roared past his ear. Chan Breichel fired his rifle again and again until the magazine was empty. He groped for another, but his hand came up empty. He cursed venomously, then kicked his feet over the edge of the gap and went slithering down into the dust and smoke, bayonet first. Five hundred Erlon looked for his bugler but the man was down with half his head blown away, and without the bugle, there was no way for him to communicate orders to Charlie Company. It should have already been here, and Erlon wanted to curse its commander as a coward. But that would have been unfair, and he knew it. Oracle Killeron was no coward, but he was aware how valuable the gifted engineers and his toad pods were. Although the fire from the wall directly in front of Erlon had been largely silenced, more and more rifle and light machine gun fire was ripping out from the flanks. The smoke and dust hanging in the air was obviously affecting its accuracy, but at least two more pods had gone down, taking their infantry and engineers with them. If he'd been Killeron, he probably would have assumed the defenders weren't being successfully suppressed and started falling back too. The 500 reached out and grabbed the nearest trooper who was still mounted. The man's head whipped around. Sir, his surprise was obvious and Erlon shook him. Get your ass back there. Find Hundred Killeron and tell him we need those pods up here right fucking now. Chan Breichel hit the bottom of the breach. His boots slipped and slithered in the ankle-deep rubble and he found himself face to face with an Arcanan cavalry trooper. The Arcanan reared back in obvious surprise, then swung his hand around. There was something in it. Chan Breichel didn't have a clue what it was, but given the things these people had already done, he didn't intend to sit there and find out the hard way. The other man was still trying to bring whatever it was to bear when a fourteen-inch tempered steel bayonet slammed forward above his protective cuirass and opened his throat. Chan Breichel drove a combat boot into the dead man's breastplate, wrenched the blade free, and whirled to a second enemy. More Sharonians hurled themselves forward. There was no unit organization in it. The breaching spell had buried at least sixty men inside the fort. Another forty or fifty had come down with a collapsing parapet. The platoons closest to it had taken the worst casualties, and some of those who weren't physically wounded were too stunned, too shaken to respond coherently. But others were like Lorash Chan Breichel. They waited for no orders, didn't worry about where the rest of their platoon or even the rest of their squad might be. They drove forward to meet the charging Arcanans with rifles, pistols, shotguns, bayonets, rocks, or even their bare hands. 
It was hand to hand in the breach. Erlon could hardly believe the ferocity of the defense. The normal range advantage of the Sharonian's rifles was meaningless here. His troopers' infantry dragons and dagger stones were far more lethal than firearms in such narrow confines, or would have been if there'd been room to use them. But the Sharonians were charging straight into them, too close for them to use even dagger stones without killing themselves as well as their enemies. Infantry dragon gunners were being forced to discard their weapons and whip out sabers to defend themselves against lunatics with knives on the ends of their rifles. And unlike his men's dagger stones, the Sharonians with pistols didn't have to worry about the black blast killing them. They were actually pushing his men out of the breach when a sudden rush of infantry surged past him. He looked around and realized Killeron had given up on getting the pods in across the top of the wall. He grounded them instead or some of them at least, and sent the infantry in at ground level. Yes! Erlon bellowed as the fresh weight of men and weapons hammered the Sharonians back. Yes! Chan Breichel staggered backward. The cavalrymen had been falling back at last, but now men in infantry boots and equipment harnesses were charging forward. The ragged, disordered knots of Sharonians resisted stubbornly, but the Arcanian infantry were much better at this sort of game than the cavalry compatriots. They came forward with intact unit organization, and this time they were able to maintain enough separation to actually use their spell-powered weapons. Blasts of flame and lightning swept the gap, maiming and incinerating, and Chan Breichel flung himself down as an infantryman swung a dagger stone in his direction. His last-minute dodge saved him from a direct hit, but the very fringe of the bolt crashed over him. It slammed into the rubble and broken adobe, and he slithered down it, alive but unconscious. Five hundred Erlon watched the infantry flowing unstoppably into the gap and groped his saddlebag for the flare stone. He raised it and triggered the single green flare to announce his men's success. Fifty Farlow saw the brilliant green flare arc up from the far side of the beleaguered fort. He'd expected to see it sooner, but later was definitely better than never in this case. He looked over his shoulder to make certain the transport dragon who'd been told off to play messenger was already headed back towards the portal with the good news, then turned his attention back to the task at hand. Now that Erlon was into the fort, it was more important than ever to keep as much as possible of the Sharonian's attention focused on the aerial demonstration. Aside from an occasional rifle shot, absolutely nothing had been fired in his direction this time around, and he felt no particular eagerness to change that. But if he'd been the Sharonians, he'd be looking for anyone he could possibly throw at the attacking infantry. So it was time to encourage the ones outside the fort to stay put. When Lord Garsel watched through narrowed eyes as the intricately weaving dance of dragons flowed closer, you really don't know what our effective range is, do you? He thought coldly. Well, the PAAF's effective range at any rate, he amended, for his own horse artillery was shorter ranged and lighter than the heavier field guns from Fort Salby. Not that it mattered who the guns technically belonged to. At the moment, they were his, and he let the range fall to 9,000 yards, then nodded to his flicker. Now, he said softly, only one thing saved them, Farlow realized later, and that was the fact that the Sharonian supply of artillery was obviously limited. The hammering the battle dragons had taken in their direct attack upon the fort had imbued him with a healthy respect for the sheer destructiveness of Sharona's mechanical weapons. Nonetheless, he was unprepared for the puffs of smoke blossoming in midair. For an instant, he couldn't figure out what was happening. Then he realized he'd just met another infernal Sharonian device. Whatever they were firing at him were exploding into veritable clouds of smaller but still incredibly lethal projectiles. Each of those puffs of smoke spawned a cone-shaped pattern of death that carved its way into his formation. Six transports went down in the first salvo, and three more were wounded. The other pilots reacted almost instantly in obedience to the orders they'd received before taking off for the operation. They wheeled, streaking back the way they'd come, and those innocuous-looking puffballs of smoke followed them. 
Five more transports crashed to the earth before they could get out of range, and Commander of 50 Farlow swore with cold and bitter hatred as the Air Force found itself hammered yet again. 500 Erlan had no way to know what had just happened to the airborne diversion. Nor, to be completely honest, did he very much care as his assaulting column pushed forward. He didn't want to think about the losses the 7th Zydors had taken getting the infantry into position, but if it gave them the fort, it would be worth it, and it certainly looked as if the rifle bullet struck him behind the left ear and killed him instantly. Hit them! Had he stopped to think about it, Sun Lord Markin would have felt just a bit ridiculous waving a sword in the middle of a modern battlefield to urge his men onward. Or perhaps not. There were swords in plenty on the other side of that modern battlefield, after all, as well as crossbows and daggers. Of course, there were also dragons, fireball throwers, and gods alone knew what else to go with them. None of which mattered at the moment, as he brought an entire dismounted battalion of elite Euromathian cavalry crunching in on the Arcanans' flank. The Arcanans fought to turn and face the new threat, but the Euromathians had come out of the smoke and dust like ghosts, and the section of wall which had shielded the attackers from Markin's fire earlier had also hidden his own reinforcements' approach from them. No one had noticed him at all, until his troopers swept out and around the wall and opened fire. Now they sent disciplined, rapid, aimed volleys crashing into their enemies, and the battered Arcanan cavalry had had enough. Those who were still mounted turned and galloped towards the rear, and most of those who weren't mounted took to their heels after them. The infantry force driving forward into the breached wall outnumbered the Euromathians by better than two to one but it didn't feel that way when it found itself suddenly flanked by a thundering wall of Sharonian rifles. The Arcanans recoiled, and even as they did, a counterattack came pounding back through the gap. No longer disorganized knots of men swarming instinctively towards the enemy, but an ordered, disciplined attack by two companies of Portal Authority infantry with rifles, shotguns, and grenades. It was too much. Those who could turned to flee. Those who couldn't threw down their weapons and raised empty hands in token of surrender. Chapter 31 Jukon Darshu, Sun Lord Markin, climbed carefully down the loose, shifting slope of rubble which had spilled into Fort Salby from the breach in its eastern wall. It would have been easier to come in through the gate, but the gate was on the far side of the fort, and he was damned if he'd hike all the way back around just to use the front door. He stepped off the untidy ramp of wreckage and looked about him with a sense of disbelief. It didn't seem possible that so much carnage had been inflicted upon so many men and so many creatures in so short a time. The surrendered, unwounded Arcanans were still being shoved and pushed, none too gently in most cases, into a semblance of order then searched while hard-eyed men with bayoneted shotguns watched them like hawks. Those searches were extraordinarily thorough, and no more pleasant than they had to be. It was plain the prisoners didn't care for the harshness of their treatment, but it was equally plain that they didn't have to be empaths to sense the hatred radiating from their captors in waves and realize it was time to be very, very meek. Markin felt his lips twitch in a slight, bitterly amused smile at the thought. It was the only thing remotely like amusement he'd felt in what seemed an eternity, and it vanished quickly as he picked his way around the sprawled, untidy carcasses of eagle lions. He wasn't the only man moving out there. At least a third of Fort Salby's garrison was down, and casualty parties were busy searching through the wreckage, concentrating on finding and collecting the wounded. There'd be time enough to collect the dead later. An occasional pistol shot cracked, as the search parties discovered an eagle lion that wasn't quite dead yet, and Markin wondered what they were going to do with all the carcasses. Hells, he thought with a snort. Why worry about them? What are we going to do with all the dragon carcasses? He reached the steps leading up to the gun platform where he'd left Crown Prince Janicki and Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik six hours and half a lifetime ago. The climb seemed much steeper somehow 
and he shook his head in weary bemusement as he started up them, rehearsing the apology he had to make when he got to the top. He hadn't attempted to hide his skepticism when Prince Janicki started describing his glimpse, and now that he'd seen the reality, it was time. Sun Lord Markin's thoughts chopped off with brutal suddenness, and he froze in mid-stride as he reached the head of the steps. He felt as if a sledgehammer had just hit him squarely in the pit of the stomach. Crown Prince Janaki Chan Kalarath lay on the gun platform where he had died. His body had been moved to a stretcher, but no one had been able to move him further, for painfully evident reasons. The two medical orderlies who brought the stretcher to the gun platform were backed up against the parapet, and the deeply bleeding gouges down the side of one orderly's face had obviously come from the talons and beak of the Imperial Peregrine Falcon, perched protectively on the dead prince's chest, wings half-spread and eyes blazing with battle fury. The bird's head snapped around as Markin stepped the rest of the way onto the gun platform, and its beak opened in a warning hiss of rage. No one seemed to know what to do. Markin certainly didn't, and the stupefying shock of Janicki's death seemed to have shut his brain down entirely. Then someone stepped past him, and his head turned to see Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik. The Ternathian looked terrible. His left arm hung in an improvised sling, which had been jury-rigged out of someone's pistol belt. His forearm was crudely splinted, and his filthy uniform tunic was torn in half a dozen places and covered with dust. An ugly scabbed cut across the center of a livid bruise disfigured his left cheek, and dried blood stains, most of them obviously from other people's blood, were spattered across both trouser legs. But it was his face, his eyes, that truly struck Markin. The shock, deeper even than Markin's own, the loss, the pain, and the guilt. Unlike Markin or the intimidated stretcher bearers, Chan Skrithik didn't even flinch as Tolina hissed at him. He only walked straight across to her slowly, holding out his good hand. That razor-sharp beak, fit to snap off fingers like a hatchet, opened as her head cocked threateningly. But then something seemed to flicker in the bird's golden-rimmed eyes. A memory, perhaps, Markin thought, recalling half-believed stories about the Imperial Falcon's fabled intelligence. Talina's head swiveled toward the dead eagle lion sprawled in ungainly death at the foot of the gun platform. Then she looked back at Chan Skrithik and made a soft, almost entreating sound. Markin was an experienced falconer, but he'd never heard anything like that cry of avian heartbreak out of another bird. Chan Skrithik seemed to flinch, but he only held out his hand patiently until finally the bird just brushed it with that sharp, wickedly curved beak. I'm sorry, my lady. Chan Skrithik spoke then, so quietly Markin could barely hear him. I tried. God, Snow, we both tried. Talina looked at him for another long moment, and then, without warning, her wings snapped once as she leapt from Janicki's chest to Chan Skrithik's good shoulder. The regiment captain's uniform lacked the non-regulation reinforced leather patches Janicki's tunics had boasted, but the pistol belt sling gave his shoulder some protection, and the falcon's powerful talons were careful, gentle. She stood on his shoulder and bent to press her beak into his hair, and Chan Skrithik reached up to touch her folded wings with equally careful gentleness. The litter bearers started to move away from the parapet towards the fallen prince, but the regiment captain shook his head. They stopped again, and Chan Skrithik went to his knees beside the stretcher. He knelt there, staring down at the face of a young man who would never grow old, and his own face was wrung with barely unshed tears. Janicki's dead face was almost relaxed, Markin thought. The gray eyes were open, staring sightlessly into a void no talent could see across. A trickle of blood had flowed from the corner of his mouth and dried, but there was no pain in that face, and no fear. The Euromathian noble moved closer, and Chan Skrithik laid his one working hand on Janicki's still chest and looked up at him. Sun Lord, he said, and his voice was rusty and broken-sounding. 
Regiment Captain, Markin responded quietly. Thank you. Chan Skrithik had to stop, clear his throat. Thank you, he repeated huskily. Without your men, my men would have been too late, if not for yours, Markin interrupted. Chan Skrithik looked up at him for several seconds without speaking. Only his hand moved, the fingers stroking gently at the dead prince's tunic as if to somehow tidy it. Finally, the regiment captain nodded, then looked down at his hand. He regarded it for a heartbeat or two as if it were a stranger's. Then he looked back up at Markin, and there was a strange, lost look in his eyes. My crown prince is dead. Tears welled in those eyes at last, and his voice wavered. They were only five words, yet Markin heard a universe of pain deep within them and felt his own eyes burn. The Sun Lord blinked once hard and looked away, looked beyond the gun platform at the smoke, the bodies, the downed dragons and griffins. It was a scene of carnage such as no Sharonian had ever imagined, and yet in his mind's eye, Markin imagined another scene, one in which there were no dead dragons, no dead griffins, no Arcanan prisoners marching sullenly into confinement, only a fort in flames and a garrison taken unawares and slaughtered. He stared into that vision of what had never been. The vision, he realized, that Janaki Chen Kalarath had seen in the glimpses he'd tried to describe. The thought of his own cynical skepticism, while Janaki had offered the warning which had saved them all, filled him with shame. And he looked back down at Chen Skrithik. The tears had broken loose at last, cutting startlingly white tracks through the dust and grime and blood on the regiment captain's face. And Markin went to his own knees beside Janaki's body across from him, with Chan Skrithik's last words still ringing in his ears. No, my friend, the Eurymathian said quietly, and shook his head as he reached out to touch Chan Skrithik's upper arm. No, our crown prince is dead. Still nothing? Alvir Banku asked as he climbed up the last few rungs of the ladder and stepped up onto the freight car roof beside platoon captain Salon Vurus. Nothing. Vurus shook his head, gazing off to the north as if he thought he should somehow be able to see across the 800 miles between him and the Tracem portal. You don't think it could be some sort of normal glitch? Banku's question sounded a lot more like a statement, and Vurus shook his head again. The regiment captain didn't set up his communication schedule just so he could ignore it, sir, he told the TTE's senior engineer. If he hasn't said anything, then it's because Prince Janaki was right. Banku discovered that he had very seldom wished anything in his life as fervently as he wished that Vurus might be wrong. Unfortunately, he was certain the young Lamathian wasn't. The question, of course, was whether Chan Skrithik's silence resulted from an attack on Fort Salby, or simply the cutting of the voice relay between the railhead and the tracem portal. Do you think they could have taken out the relay? He asked, and Virus snorted. I explained things very carefully to voice Orma on our way through, sir. He understands, believe me. And unless the Arcanans have some sort of voice sniffer, they aren't going to find him. Even if they might somehow have known where he was before our train came through, we moved him over sixty miles and dropped him off at his own private waterhole with a camo net and tarp. We even found him some trees to hide under. The platoon captain shook his head again. Whatever's caused the communications break, it's not because the Arcanans found him, Master Banku. Well, Banku stood there, but unlike Virus, his gaze was directed towards the worksite around them. He studied it for several minutes, then looked back at the PAAF officer. If you're right, I'm happy for Orma, platoon captain, but it leaves us in a bit of a pickle, wouldn't you say? Oh, I'd definitely say that, sir, Vurus agreed grimly. Then I suppose I'd better go see how our preparations are coming. Banku climbed down from the freight car and headed off in search of his assistance. Platoon Captain Vurus was the senior officer of the double platoon Regiment Captain Chen Skrithik had sent down to reinforce the railhead security. Unfortunately, even after Vurus's arrival, that left Banku with less than a company of regular troops to look after the better part of 2,000 workers. 
the good news was that at least a third of his labor force had at least some military experience. The Trans-Temporal Express had always given veterans preference when it came to hiring practices, and its personnel office vigorously recruited retired Army engineers for its construction projects. And in this case, given all of the uncertainties of the situation, Banku had arrived with a freight car loaded with 2,000 Model 10 rifles and a million rounds of ammunition. That was enough to issue virtually all of his workers, even those without actual previous military experience, a personal weapon at least. And he'd put Forum Chen Aris in charge of organizing them. Chen Aris was his senior assistant and just happened to have retired from his first job as a company captain in the Imperial Ternathian Army Corps of Engineers. Unfortunately, neither Banku, Chen Aris, nor Vuras had very much in the way of heavy weapons to support those rifles, Aside from the pair of Yurthic pedestal guns and single section of light machine guns Vuras had brought with him. There were no mortars, no field guns, no howitzers. What they did have was ingenuity, lots of construction equipment, several hundred miles worth of stockpiled rails, and the mobile machine shops necessary to perform maintenance on millions of Ternathian marks worth of steam shovels, bulldozers, and tractors. That thought carried Banku over to the area where Chan Aris and platoon captain Herrick Chan Morick were overseeing the chief engineer's latest brainchild. Sparks fountained from welding torches as sweating track layers and maintenance crews worked frantically on what had been standard freight cars up until a very few hours ago. Now the wooden sides of those freight cars were in the process of disappearing behind layers of steel rails. Banku didn't know if a double layer of railroad iron would stand up to one of the dragons Petty Captain Chan Dharma had described to Hersel Yoritam, Banku's own assigned voice. He doubted that anyone had any clear notion of exactly how powerful dragon fire or lightning might be. But his improvised armor ought to stand up to just about anything short of field artillery, and he'd been careful to leave enough loopholes to allow anyone inside the cars to bring at least a dozen Model 10s to bear in any direction. How's it coming for him? he asked. Well, as we could expect, I guess, Chen Aris replied. Mind you, I don't think we got enough freight cars to put everyone into, even if we end up having time to stick rails on all of them. That's what I've always liked best about you, Forum, that sparkling Ternathian optimism of yours. What's to be optimistic about? Chen Aris responded sourly, although there was more than a hint of a gleam in his eyes. How about starting with the fact that we're still alive, and we haven't seen any dragons diving on us? Yet. We haven't seen any dragons diving on us yet, Chen Aris said. Of course, the day's still young, isn't it? Yes, it is, Banku thumped him on the shoulder, then cocked his head. What about the locomotives? I've got two of them just about ready. The cabs are protected at least as well as the freights at any rate. And young Chan Morick's working on another pair right now. We've done the best we could about protecting the boilers, too, but that's a lot tougher. As far as I can make out, these people don't have anything like rifles or machine guns, Banku told him. I don't know that they're going to be able to punch through the boilers with anything they've got. Maybe not. But all they really have to do to strand us is tear up the track, you know, Chan Aris pointed out. They can tear up the track if they want to, Banku said more grimly. Unless they're a lot more experienced with railroads than I think they are, though. They probably don't realize how quickly our people can put the track back together again. Assuming we've got enough firepower to keep the bastards off our people while they put it back. Chan Aris might have sounded as if he were objecting to what Banku had just said, but he wasn't, and he snorted when Banku quirked an eyebrow at him. I don't know how many troops these people brought with them all there but they'd better have a lot if they want to stop us and simultaneously take and hold Fort Salby, especially with Division Captain Chan Jarath as close as he is. I'm not too sure about those armored freight cars of yours. Mind you, I think they're a good idea. I just don't know how good an idea. But I do know that if the other side is stupid enough to spread its forces too thin, it's gonna get reamed. Reamed, Banku repeated. Is that one of those technical military terms a civilian like me wouldn't be familiar with? Probably. Chan Aris squinted up at the crew working on the current freight car, then looked back at Banku. I've got this part of it pretty much under control, Alvir. Why don't you go worry about something else? 
My Ternathian optimism and I can handle this. Banku chuckled, shook his head, and headed off to see how much construction equipment they could load onto their available flat cars. What the... Underarmsman Verace lowered the field glasses for a moment, then shook his head and raised them once more. We've got three horsemen coming down the valley, armsman, he announced. What? Junior armsman Paris Chan Barsak seemed to materialize out of the dusty earth at Verace's elbow. There. Verace passed over the field glasses and pointed at the roadway far below. Chan Barsak raised the binoculars to his own eyes, adjusting the focus, then grunted as the image sharpened. Verace was right. Three men mounted on something horse-sized and vaguely horse-shaped were cantering along the roadway at a preposterous rate of speed. Afternoon sunlight glittered on what were apparently long spiral horns sprouting from their horses' foreheads, and Chan Barsak had never heard of a horse with what looked remarkably like a carnivore's tusks. Of course, the not horses were just passing abreast of the shattered corpse of what was obviously a dragon, so he didn't suppose there was any reason they couldn't be equally preposterous. His lips twitched at the thought, and his forehead creased in surprise. They're coming in under a parley banner, he said. Parley banner? Verace hawked and spat over the edge of the drop-off. How the fuck, pardon my Euromathian, would they know what a parley banner looks like? And if they did know, what makes them think we'd be stupid enough to trust anything they said? I didn't say it was a proper parley banner. Chan Barsik said rather more patiently than he felt. But it's green, they're flying it, and there's just three of them. Whether we can trust them or not is really kind of beside the point, don't you think? Ferrace just scowled, and Chan Barsik snorted, then shook his head, and started calling for the flicker assigned to his squad. Rothchan Skrithik and Sun Lord Markin stood side by side outside Markin's CP and watched the pair of Arcanan officers being escorted towards them. Both Arcanans were blindfolded, and their third companion had been held at the outer picket line where he could keep an eye on their peculiar horned horses and couldn't see anything about the defenders' positions. Frankly, Chan Skrithik was just as happy not to have those unnatural creatures any closer than they had to be. Actually, he thought grimly. I'd just as soon not have these arcane and fuckers any closer than they have to be either. He thought about the dead prince lying in Company Captain Krillar's infirmary, and the palm of his pistol hand itched. The Arcanans were marched into the command post. Chanskrithic and Markin watched them go by, and followed them silently into the sandbagged bunker. It was obvious from the Arcanans' body language that they weren't as calm as they would have liked to appear. Yet Chanskrithic found himself feeling an unwilling respect for their sheer nerve. Riding in to parley with someone against whom you just launched a sneak attack while in the midst of negotiations in time of peace was not a task for the faint-hearted. The Arcanans were turned to face him and the blindfolds were removed. They blinked as their eyes adjusted to the dim light inside the command post. Then one of them looked at Chanskrithic and Markin. His eyes narrowed as he saw the three gold rifles of Chan Skrithik's rank insignia and the splinted forearm suspended in the sling tied around the regiment captain's neck. May I crystal back, the Arcanan said in heavily accented Ternathian, gesturing at the petty captain who'd escorted him and his companion to the CP. You want one of your crystals returned to you? Chan Skrithik responded, and the Arcanan nodded vigorously. Can talk better with, he said. Chanskrithik frowned for a moment, then glanced at the petty captain. You took one of their rocks off of them? Yes, sir. We didn't find anything that looked like a weapon, not even a knife, but after everything else, I figured, well... The youngster shrugged, and Chanskrithik nodded. You did exactly the right thing, son. On the other hand, I suppose if we actually want to hear what these people have to say... We should give it back to them. The regiment captain held out his hand for the crystal in question and turned back to the more talkative Arcanan with it on his palm. Understand, he said grimly, holding the other man's eyes with his own and letting him see the hate and barely leashed rage. 
If we think you're going to do anything with this hunk of rock except talk, I'll shoot you dead where you stand. Understand, the Arcanian replied. Transcrithic wasn't at all certain that the other man's comprehension of Ternathian was genuinely up to understanding what he'd just said, but he suspected that he hadn't actually needed to say it in the first place. He stared into the other man's eyes for another moment and handed the crystal across. The Arcanan murmured something and the piece of rock started to glow. Then he looked across it at Transcrithic. I am commander of 500 Dare Vainhair, army of the Union of Arcana, he said crisply, or to be more precise, the crystal translated crisply. This, he indicated to the older man standing beside him, is commander of 1000, Clamon Torok. I see. Transcrithic gazed back at them, his eyes hard, but his brain was busy behind them. He knew nothing about how the Arcanans organized their military. For that matter, he didn't know whether the rank titles this Vaynair had just rattled off had been literal or figurative interpretations of their actual ranks. Nonetheless, he didn't doubt for a moment that these were the two most senior Arcanan officers any official representative of Sharona had yet encountered. Or, a mental voice amended coldly, the most senior Arcanan officers any living, uncaptured official representative of Sharona has encountered. The Arcanans gazed back at him equally levelly, obviously waiting for him to introduce himself in response. For a moment he toyed with the notion of refusing to do so, but he brushed the petty temptation aside. Regiment Captain Roth, Chan Skrithic, Portal Authority Armed Forces, he said. Ah, Vaynair nodded. May I assume I'm speaking to the senior Sharonian officer in that case, sir? He inquired politely. At the moment, Chan Skrithic replied curtly. Very good, sir, Vaynar cleared his throat. Thousand Torok and I have been sent as envoys by commander of two thousand Hashu. I see, Chan Skrithic repeated. So I suppose I should assume this commander of two thousand Harshu of yours is in command of this batch of cutthroats and murderers? Vaynar winced. His eyes tried to move sideways towards his superior officer, but he stopped them. As for the superior officer in question, his expression didn't even flicker. I... Vaynar began, then paused. You may assume that, Regiment Captain, the commander of one thousand said into his junior's hesitation. He met Chan Skrithik's eyes steadily. Obviously, I would prefer some other description of the men under my command. Under the circumstances, however, I can appreciate how you might fail to grasp the distinction. Torog's voice was firm, Chan Skrithik noted. Nonetheless, the Arcanan continued, five hundred Vaynar and I are here with a message. Two messages, in fact. Are you willing to listen to them? The fact that you're here at all suggests to me that the last Sharonians who listened to what Arcanans had to say didn't make out very well, Chan Skrithic replied coldly, and this time Torok's eyes seemed to flinch ever so slightly. Regiment Captain, he said after a moment, I'm an officer in the Union Air Force. Policy decisions are made at a higher level than mine. I say that not in an effort to suggest the anger you obviously feel is unreasonable but because there's nothing I can do or could have done about the cause of that anger. I was sent here with a proposal based upon the situation in which we currently find ourselves. So again I ask you, are you willing to listen to my superior officer's messages? Chan Skrithic felt an unwilling flicker of sympathy for this Torok, even through the cold, bitter fury of Janicki's death. He wouldn't have cared to be sent on a mission like this one. Very well he said finally, flatly. Speak your piece. Five hundred Vaynar, Torok said quietly, looking at the other officer, and Vaynar cleared his throat again. Regiment Captain Chan Skrithic, he said. I am two thousand Hashu's senior magistron, his senior medical officer. We realize that some Sharonians have what you refer to as the healing talent. What we've been able to discover about it so far, however, suggests that its primary functions are pain management and the enhancement of the natural healing process. A magistron like myself, however, has the healing gift, which differs from your people's talent. 
With proper training, that gift can repair damages your own people's talent can't. For example, a sufficiently powerful magistron can actually regenerate damaged nervous tissue. Chance Krithik managed to keep his eyes from widening and simply cocked his head, waiting when Vayner paused. The reason I specifically am here, Regiment Captain, the commander of 500 continued after a brief silence, is to propose that my medical staff and I make our healing gifts available to the wounded from both sides. Why? Chance Griffith demanded. For several reasons, sir. One of them, frankly, is to ensure the best possible treatment for the Arcanian prisoners currently in your hands, many of whom must have been wounded. Vayner made the admission unflinchingly. A second, which you may find more difficult to believe, is that magistrons swear an oath very similar to the one your healers swear. The use of our gift is supposed to be determined by our patients' needs, not by who the patients might happen to be or the uniform they might happen to wear. And a third is because we couldn't reasonably expect you to allow us access to our own wounded if we were to refuse to treat your wounded as well. I see, Chance Grithick said for a third time. Somewhat to his own surprise, he was inclined to believe Vayner was sincere about this magistron's oath. And whether the Arcanian was sincere about that or not, the other points he'd made were certainly reasonable enough. And the least these horse sons can do is save a few God's damned lives for a change, he thought bitterly. It was hard, but he managed to keep his voice level. Straining the hate and fury out left it curiously flattened, but there wasn't much he could do about that. I'll certainly take your proposal under advisement, he said after several seconds. Of course, before I could accept it, I would have to ask you to repeat it in the presence of a sifter. That would be someone with your people's talent for recognizing when someone is lying. It would. Why? Chan Skrithik's eyes narrowed. Would you have some objection to that? We would have no objection at all, Regiment Captain, Torok replied for the commander of 500 so long as the questions we were required to answer were limited to the discussion of the proposals before us. Transcritha considered that, then shrugged. I suppose that wouldn't be unreasonable, assuming I feel inclined to consider those proposals in the first place. However, you said you have two messages. Yes, Torok agreed. At the moment, you have in your possession several hundred Arcanian prisoners. 2,000 Hashu would like to propose an exchange. The prisoners you currently hold for the free passage of your work crews in Karis back to Fort Selby. Our work crews? Chance Griffith said. Are you saying you've captured them? Or have you simply rounded up the survivors after massacring most of them? We haven't massacred any of them, Regiment Captain. We bypassed them on our way to Fort Selby. However, they're now behind our lines, and it's necessary for us to do something about them. Torok looked straight into Chance Grithick's eyes. We can either go back and demand their surrender, and use force to compel them to surrender if they refuse, or we can attempt to arrive at some other arrangement. Are you suggesting that you might hold them hostage for the return of your personnel? Chance Grithick asked in a considerably icier voice. I suppose it might sound that way, Torok conceded. However, the point I'm trying to make is that at the moment there has been no contact between our forces and the civilian workers on your railroad. What 2000 Hoshu is offering you is an opportunity to protect them in exchange for the return of his own personnel. What if I suggested that if he wants his people back, he should return all of our people? Everyone you've captured from the moment you attacked us during the middle of the peace negotiations you people proposed. Chanskrithik watched the other man's expression narrowly and found himself wishing he'd had at least some experience in reading arcane and body language. Not that he was certain it would have helped a great deal. Watching Torolk, he suspected that the Arcanan would have been a formidable opponent across the gaming table. Two thousand Harshu thought you might make such a counteroffer, Torolk said. He instructed me to tell you that he doesn't have the authority to agree to such a broad exchange. He instructs me to point out to you that, as he's sure you'll appreciate, having transported at least some of the prisoners your people took when you attacked us beyond our reach, 
The prisoners in his hands represent an invaluable intelligence asset. He lacks the authority to surrender that asset until and unless both sides are in a position to discuss the return of all prisoners. Does he? There was something about Torok's reply that bothered Chance Grithic, something about the careful word selection. He couldn't put his finger on exactly what it was, yet it sent a chill through him. And he found himself hoping it was only because his bone-deep anger at Janicki's death had made him hyper-suspicious of anything an Arcanan said or did. Very well, he said, hoping his flicker of apprehension hadn't been obvious to Torok and Vaynar. Suppose I make a different counter-proposal. If he wants his soldiers back, I want not simply my civilians, but their construction equipment. Torok blinked. Clearly, Chance Grethick had managed to surprise him at least a little for the first time. The Arcanan frowned, cocking his head slightly, while he considered what Chan Skrithik had said, then shrugged. I can't say how 2000 Hoshu would react to that suggestion, he admitted. I would have to return and discuss it with him. Would that be acceptable? Possibly, Chan Skrithik smiled thinly. Your 2000 Hoshu is the fellow who first proposed the exchange. I hadn't even considered it. Obviously, I'll have to think about it as well, won't I? However, at the moment, I'm disinclined to settle for anything less. And I suppose I should point out to you that what we're talking about is a couple of thousand civilians equipped with the same weapons which blew your first batch of butchers into dog shit at Fallen Timbers. You might find an effort to compel them to surrender rather more expensive than you'd like. Torok's face tightened slightly at the words, first batch of butchers, but he had himself well under control. Instead of some angry response, he simply nodded. You might be right, Regiment Captain. That doesn't mean either side would be happy about the expense involved, however. True enough, Chan Skrithik agreed with a thin smile. I would like to add one more thing, Regiment Captain, Vaynair said, and Chan Skrithik swung his gaze back to the magistrate. What? The two proposals aren't necessarily linked, sir. The offer of our medical personnel for the wounded of both sides is independent of any agreement on exchanging prisoners. Chan Skrithik nodded. I understand. And to be honest, we've got some men on both sides who probably aren't going to make it without the kind of healing you seem to be describing. I thought that would probably be the case, sir. Vaynar's expression was grim. In fact, with your permission... I've already requested 2,000 Hashu's permission to remain here and offer my own gift for the immediate treatment of the most critically injured, while you and he make up your minds about the other aspects of his proposals. And did 2,000 Hashu give you that permission? Chan Skrithik asked. After all, you say you're his senior medical officer. Is he willing to effectively add you to our bag of prisoners if the negotiation of his proposals falls through? I'm sure he hopes that in that eventuality you'll allow me to return to him, Vaynar said levelly. In fact, he told me to ask you for assurances to that effect. However, Vaynar looked Chan Skrithik straight in the eye. He also authorized me to remain, whether you give that assurance or not. Chan Skrithik's eyebrows rose. I was very generous of him, the Sharonian said or else he's a lot more worried than he wants to admit about the care his wounded are likely to receive. In either case, I'm prepared to accept your offer, subject, of course, to that sifter I mentioned. And, Chan Skrithik added grudgingly, if the sifter passes you, I'm also prepared to guarantee your safe return, whatever happens to the rest of our negotiations. Chapter 32 and I don't give a good god's damn what you think, Fifty. The next time you drag your sorry ass into my office and get into my face over this, I'll shove my boots so far up at your taste fucking leather for a god's damned week. Now get the hells out of my sight. For the first time in his military career, Thurman Ulthar failed to salute his commanding officer before he wheeled and marched furiously out of Hadrine Thalmer's office. The wiry, red-haired officer's blue eyes were cored with rage. His lips were white with compressed fury, and the care he took to shut the door very quietly behind him was a clearer statement of his seething anger and contempt than any violent slam could have been. 
He stalked out of the office block at Fort Cartoon, literally trembling with combined fury, outrage, and humiliation. And Sword Carrick Norm glanced up from where he'd been mending the buckle on his weapons harness. Guess the hundred tied his bulls in a nut, he remarked with a pronounced note of satisfaction. He shook his head and glanced at the other sword, sitting beside him on the barracks veranda and smoking a pipe. Graholus, you'd think someone who'd been these fuckers prisoner would get it, wouldn't you? Sword Evarl Harnick looked back at Norm thoughtfully for several seconds. Then he took his pipe out of his mouth, tamped the tobacco down, and put the stem back between his teeth. Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? He repeated in a very different tone, and Norm's eyes narrowed. Don't tell me you agree with him, the first non-com said incredulously. Fifty Ulthar's a right smart young fellow, Harnack replied indirectly, looking back out across the parade ground at the stables surrounded by infantry dragons and alert sentries. He's only a fifty, Norm pointed out. You've been around as long as I have, Evar. You've seen the dragon and smelled the smoke. You know most fifties still need swords like us to wipe their noses and change their diapers. You think so? Harnack looked back at him. Hells, yes, I think so. I mean, take Fifty Sama. He's a good kid, mostly. Still wet behind the ears and full of all that starry-eyed academy crap, but a good kid. He just doesn't get it, though. Not where these bastards are concerned. Actually, Harnack said after a moment, his tone thoughtful. It seems to me the real problem isn't snot-nosed kids fresh out of the academy and too stupid to understand the real world. But some old sweats who are so stupid they aren't even bothering to try to get it. Norm stiffened and his face darkened. What do you mean by that crack? he demanded. I mean, I'm getting tired of people who don't bother to listen to what's really going on out here, that's what I mean. Harnick's tone was harder and his voice was lower pitched. I mean, I'm getting tired of people who eat up that asshole Nashik's so-called intelligence briefings like they were handed down from the gods. And, I mean, I'm getting tired of idiots so locked up with the hate inside them that they can't even wake up and smell the fucking coffee. Norm's eyes flared wide, and he sat back in his cane-bottomed chair abruptly. What in the hells are you talking about? Anger crackled in his own voice, but there was confusion as well. God damn it, you were one of their prisoners. You know damned well they didn't even bother to give the hundred a decent healer. And you were God's damn there when they shot Magister Halifan. You poor, pathetic excuse for a sword, Harnack said almost pityingly. My gods, you've been kicking around the service for this long, and you don't recognize a pile of unicorn shit when they put it on your plate and call it scrambled eggs? Norm's wide eyes narrowed at the slang phrase. It could be used to describe orders that were unusually stupid or confused, or to describe someone's particularly blatant and unconvincing cover-his-ass excuses. But it was also used to describe confirmed intelligence that was just plain wrong, or a deliberate lie. What do you mean? he demanded harshly. I mean, I was there, Harnack grated taking the pipe out of his mouth and stabbing the stem in Norm's direction. I was there, at Fallen Timbers, when it all fell into the shitter. Hells, Osmuna, the first man down, he was in my fucking platoon, and I was the one who found him with a frigging hole blown all the way through his god's damn chest. Don't sit there and tell me what the fucking intelligence pukes have been feeding you. I was there, goddammit. I saw what the hells happened. The pipe in his hand quivered, and Norm's expression changed suddenly as he recognized the barely leashed fury in that quiver. Then tell me, he said in a very different voice. Tell me what happened. Harnack looked at him for several heartbeats, as if weighing the risks, then inhaled deeply and shrugged ever so slightly. Hundred old Ahon was right all along, he said then, softly. I don't know who shot first, Osmuna or their man. I don't think anyone ever will know. But I know who fucking shot first at Fallen Timbers, and it wasn't them. 
It wasn't the God's damned civilian standing there with his hands, empty, trying to fucking talk to us. Just talk to us. When my own shitty excuse for a fifty shot him right in the throat against the hundred's direct orders. Norm recognized the look in Harnack's eyes now, and the agonizing shame he saw there was more convincing than any anger might have been. Did you know Hundred Older Hun made the only two of them we didn't manage to kill? His shard and I? Harnack continued, glaring at the other sword. You know whose son he is? You think he did that? Because we'd acted so fucking honorably? And I'll bet you didn't know. The Hundred offered to cut Thalmer down right there in front of everything that was left of my platoon when that asshole sitting in that office over there wanted to put manacles on the Hundred's shot and I. Well, I know. I was the sword Thalmer ordered to do it, and the one the Hundred ordered to stand fast. And Magister Halith, they didn't kill him. We did. Anguish tightened Harnack's fierce, low voice. It was an infantry dragon, a god's damned lightning thrower. You seen any of them in these people's armory, Norm? Because I sure as fuck haven't seen any of them. Harnack jerked his head in the direction of the Fort Cartoon armory building, and his mouth twisted as if he wanted to spit. And all that crap about shooting prisoners, torturing them, denying medical care, dragon shit, dragon shit. These people, the officers in that brig over there, saw to it that we were treated well. I never saw a single one of their guards, as much as butt stroke one of our guys with a rifle. You want to explain to me just how that compares with the way we've been treating them? And then, as that bastard down there and his lying shit about how they tortured him, Harnack's tone dripped contempt. Fifty Ulthar and I got left here, because we were both wounded too. I saw their healers at work. Hells, they worked on me. And I never saw one of them do less than the very best he could do. They aren't like our magistrons. They can't do the same things. Can't any of you get that through your god's damned skulls? They did the best they fucking could treated us every bit as well as they did their own people without once asking whose uniform we were wearing. And that's who your precious hundred thou mares beating and stomping the shit out of every couple of days. It God's damned makes me want to puke. Norm stared at the other non-com in shock as he realized there were literally tears of fury and shame in Evarl Harnack's eyes. I, he started, then broke off. It was too much for him to take in all at one sitting. Stood too many preconceptions he'd spent too long cherishing on their heads. But in Evarl Harnack's rage and shame, he recognized truth when he finally saw it. What? Harnack half snapped as Norm hesitated. I guess maybe I should have spent a little more time listening to Fifty Sama. Norm replied finally, slowly. Maybe then I wouldn't feel like as big a piece of shit as I do right now. Yeah, Harnick growled. Well, you aren't the only one who feels that way. Trust me, maybe not. Norm sat staring out across the captured fort's parade ground, thinking about everything Harnack had just told him, thinking about everything he'd said and done. Maybe not, he repeated. But what in Graholus's name do we do about it? I don't know. Harnack put his pipe back into his mouth and turned away from the other man while he fished out an accumulator and used it to relight the tobacco. And his voice was even lower than before. I know what I'd like to do, but I can't. And I wish the fifty would remember the same advice he gave me, he added, turning to look in the direction in which Ulthar had disappeared. If he keeps on with this, keeps getting in Thalmer's way, I don't know what's going to happen. Norm's eyes followed Harnack's, and as they did, they deepened and darkened with fresh worry all their own. I know exactly what's going to happen if Ulthar doesn't back off, he thought grimly. And he's not the only officer it's going to happen to either. So what the hells do I do about my fifty? Because that wet-behind-the-ears kid I should have been listening to all along sure as hells isn't going to leave it alone either. Great Norm looked into the future and he didn't like what he saw there at all.
The miles-long train pulled into the Fort Salby station in a long, shuddering, clanking spasm of steam and hissing air brakes. It stretched as far back down the tracks as the eye could see, and Roth Chanskrithik's eyes narrowed in appreciation as he saw the machine guns and light pedestal guns which had been mounted on top of many of the freight cars. The command and staff cars were at the head of the train, and Chanskrithik came to attention as the doors opened and an officer in the uniform and paired golden sunbursts of a Ternathian division captain came down the short steps. The division captain was short for a Ternathian, with dark hair beginning to be streaked with dramatic silver highlights. He was also wiry and fit, with a horseman's build and large, powerful hands, which went well with his cavalry boots and the bone-handled grips of the H&W holstered at his side. Instead of the lighter Polshana, many other officers preferred these days. But his brown eyes were dark, and the black mourning band on his right arm matched the identical mourning bands worn by every other person in sight. Division Captain Chandraith, Chanskrithik said quietly. Regiment Captain, Chandraith replied. I'm glad to see you, sir. I only wish... So do we all, Regiment Captain, Chandraith said as Chanskrithik broke off. The division captain held out his hand and gripped Chanskrithik's firmly. So do we all. But you did a fine job out here. A fine job. Thank you, sir. We didn't do it all on our own, though, and I'd like to intro- Chanskrithik broke off again, but not this time because he couldn't find the words. This time he was interrupted by the magnificent peregrine falcon, which came slanting down across the station platform's roof and landed on his shoulder. Chandraith's eyes widened. He hadn't actually noticed the leather pad on the regiment captain's shoulder, he realized. I'm sorry, sir, Chanskrithik began when he saw Chandraith staring at the bird. I know she's Prince Janaki's, and I'm sure there has to be some other arrangement, but since he was killed, she's... His voice trailed off helplessly. For a moment longer, Chandraith just looked at him. Then the division captain gave himself a visible shake. That's an Imperial Ternathian Peregrine Regiment, Captain, he said. No one tells them what to do in a case like this. On the thankfully rare occasions when they lose their human companions, they decide where to go and who, if anyone, to bond with. If she's chosen you, then that's her decision, not anyone else's. But, sir, I don't know anything about falcons, Chan Skrithik protested in a half-desperate voice. If not for the Sun Lord here, I wouldn't have had a clue what to do for her. Then it would appear to me, Regiment Captain, Chandraith said, turning to extend his hand to the cavalry officer standing at Chan Skrithik's shoulder with a matching mourning band on the right arm of his Euromathian uniform, that we have two things to thank Sun Lord Markin for. Believe me, he continued, speaking directly to the Euromathian, I am as deeply and sincerely grateful to you and all of your men as Emperor Zindel himself will be, Sun Lord. It was a cooperative effort, Division Captain, Markin replied, gripping the offered hand firmly. No one here at Fort Salby had a monopoly on courage or sacrifice. His dark, almond-shaped eyes dropped to the dark band around his own sleeve, matching the one on Chen Jurates, and the Division Captain nodded soberly. Well said, Sun Lord. He gave Markin's hand a final squeeze, then drew a deep breath. Gentlemen, he said, looking at both of them. I suspect that my staff car is actually better equipped, at least until we can get your fort put back together again, for the briefings and discussions awaiting all of us. But before we start all of that, I would like to see my prince. Crown Prince Janaki Chan Kalarath, dressed in a clean uniform, lay on the bier in the Fort Salby Chapel with his hands folded on the hilt of the dress sword on his chest. The presence lights of the triad glowed above the altar where the three faces of Volthon the Protector, Mother Shalana, and Marinle the Maiden gazed down upon him, and an honor guard composed of the seven surviving men of Janaki's platoon, under the command of Chief Armsman Chan Brykel, stood stiffly at attention around the bier. It was thankfully cool in the chapel, yet Chan Jurath was surprised that there were no visible signs of corruption. He looked at Chan Skrithik, and the regiment captain shrugged. Maybe I shouldn't have done it, sir. But the senior arcane and healer offered to put what he called a preservation spell on the prince's body. They'd been informed he was killed. 
Chanjareth asked sharply with more than a hint of disapproval. He already knew when he approached me, sir, Chan Skrithik said levelly. Apparently one of the wounded mentioned it where he and his translating crystal could overhear. Since he already knew, I saw no reason not to accept his offer. Chan Jareth grimaced, but Chan Skrithik faced him squarely. Sir, every single one of your men is going to want to pay his respects to the prince, just like every one of my men and the Sun Lords did. They're going to need to see him, and there are going to be voices among them. For that matter, I know you've got voice correspondence with you. I didn't want his lady mother, anyone, to see him looking like... The regiment captain stopped with another shrug, his eyes glittering under the presence lights, and Chan Jareth felt his grimace smooth into something else. I hadn't thought about it that way, he admitted. I'd rather they didn't know a thing about it, but if they already knew, then I think you probably made the right decision. Thank you, sir, Chan Skrithik said quietly. He shook his head slightly. Actually, it seems to me and Petty Captain Chan Dharma, my voice agrees with me, that this 500 Vaynar is a genuinely decent human being. I don't know what someone like him is doing in the Arcanan army, but my sifter agreed that he was sincere when he said he wanted to do this as a mark of his personal respect. Indeed, Chen Jareth frowned thoughtfully. He'd been surprised by the Arcanan commander's offer when Chan Skrithik's voice relayed its terms to him. In fact, he'd seriously contemplated ordering Chan Skrithik to refuse. Like the regiment captain, he was grimly suspicious of the real reasons this Harshu was mysteriously not authorized to release any other prisoners he might hold. And as Harshu himself had pointed out through his mouthpieces, the Arcanan POWs constituted a potential intelligence treasure trove, whose value was impossible to estimate. But weighed against the release of fewer than 300 military prisoners was the return of over 2,000 civilians and most of their heavy equipment. 2,000 Harshu had agreed to allow them to remove any and all equipment they could load in a 12-hour window, starting when the exchange was agreed to. Since Olvir Banku had been loading cars with an eye to a retreat to trace them for almost 36 hours at that point, the grace period actually amounted to almost two full days. That, unfortunately, had still been a short enough time to preclude taking any of the really big excavators, since it would have been necessary to break them down into their component loads. And the lack of flat cars meant that almost a third of the other heavy equipment had been left behind as well. Nonetheless, Banku had returned to Fort Salby with millions of marks worth of construction machinery that was going to be worth considerably more than its weight in gold when it came time to resume the advance towards Hell's Gate. Indeed, Chanjareth had to wonder if Harshu had realized for a moment just how valuable that machinery was going to prove. If Sharona had lost all of it, it would have taken literally months to ship in replacements and the trained personnel to use it. Chanjareth had seen the endless lines of work cars, portable machine shops, flat cars loaded with bulldozers and scrapers, passenger cars, portable sawmills, auxiliary steam engines, Loads of unused rails and ties, bolts, spikes, hammers, pickaxes. The list seemed endless, and the cars and work locomotives filled the extensive sidings left behind when TTE finished construction of the Tracem Cut almost to capacity. He couldn't possibly have justified holding on to Chan Skrithik's prisoners if they were the price of getting so many Sharonian civilians and so much priceless capability back. He'd accepted the offer because he'd seen no choice. But he'd been more than a little surprised by how scrupulously the Arcanans had honored the terms of their agreement. According to Chan Skrithik's post-surgeon, for example, the regiment captain would never have regained full use of his arm without the intervention of the gifted Arcanan healers. At least fifteen of Chan Skrithik's wounded, including Prince Janaki's chief armsman, would almost certainly have died without that same intervention. And many more, like Chan Skrithik, would have been crippled for life. Indeed, the Arcanans had ended up healing twice as many Euromathian and PAAF casualties as they had of their own men. And then there was this, he thought, gazing down at the dead young man lying before him as if he were only sleeping. I suppose there have to be at least some decent men anywhere, even in Arcana, he said finally, and I'm grateful. 
But I don't think this is going to soften public opinion back home and outs when word gets back to Tajvana. Chan Skrithig winced at the reminder that Janaki's parents still didn't know about his death. I wish, sir, you don't know how badly I wish that he hadn't been here, the regiment captain said softly. We'd never have held this post without him, but gods. He shook his head, eyes gleaming with remembered tears, as he looked back down at the body. To lose him like that, so young, so full of promise. I know we always think crown princes are full of promise, but try it above, he was. He really was. I know. Chanteraith reached out and squeezed Chan Skrithik's left shoulder, careful to make no sudden movements near Tolina. I know. He told me he had to be here, Chan Skrithik continued. I wanted to argue with him, but somehow I just couldn't. And gods know I needed him. With all the civilians, the portal's strategic importance, I just couldn't tell him no. And to the very last moment of his life, he was totally focused on saving the rest of us, on his duty, on being certain I knew what he'd glimpsed. Without that knowledge, that warning, we never would have held. Hells, without his warning, we'd all have died in our beds. He saved us all. And at least I can honestly tell his parents that he died almost instantly. He never could have known what hit him. Oh, he knew, Regiment Captain, Chan Jareth said quietly. He knew exactly. He saw it coming. He experienced it before the first arcana never came into sight of our fort here. Sir? The word came out half-strangled as Chan Skrithik's head whipped back around. He stared into Chan Jareth's eyes, and the division captain nodded slowly. He was in a fugue state, he said simply, and his talent was never as strong as his father's or his sister's. For him to enter fugue state, it had to be a death glimpse. He knew he was going to die if he stayed here, Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik. He saw it. He even sent me a message that told me he knew, and prevented me from ordering you to have him removed from Fort Salby by force if necessary. Chan Skrithik's face was twisted with a deeper, fresher anguish. And even though Chan Jareth had no trace of talent, he felt the other man's pain like his own. Part of him felt guilty for inflicting that fresh pain upon him. But it was important that Chan Skrithik know that everyone know, that Janaki Chan Kalarath had gone knowingly to his death, offering up his life to save thousands of others. It's the motto of his house, Regiment Captain, Arlos Chan Jareth said softly, quietly, into the silence, feeling Sun Lord Markin at his elbow. I stand between. I stand between evil and its victims, between darkness and light. I stand between right and wrong. I stand between my people and their enemies, and between the people I am sworn to protect and death. There's a reason men and women have followed Kalarath's straight into the fire for thousands of years, Regiment Captain, and we, you and I, have been honored to see precisely what that reason is. Chapter 33 What is it, Alazan? Darsal Kinlafia's brown eyes looked into the eyes of Grey, and Alazan Yanamar didn't need the bond between them to recognize his deep concern. What's worrying her so badly? He turned his head away once again, gazing down the palace corridor where Grand Princess Andrin had just disappeared. The young woman's spine was as straight, her carriage as graceful as ever. But her eyes had been unquiet for days. Cosmetics could not disguise the dark shadows under them. And she had walked past Alazan and Kenlafia without even noticing their presence. I can't tell you that, love. Alazan reached up and touched his cheek gently and his eyes narrowed. There were times when the closeness of a bond like theirs had its downside. He could tell that whatever was haunting Andrin was causing Alazon deep distress as well. At the same time, he was a voice himself. He understood the responsibilities, the privacy oaths of any voice, far less the Emperor of Ternathia's privy voice. I'm sorry, he said contritely. I shouldn't have asked you. It's just that I hate seeing her this way. I know you do. Alazan stroked his cheek one more time, then tucked her arm through his, and began walking him down the same corridor. I think everyone does, she continued. Triad knows I do, but then... She glanced up at him. 
Most of us have known her since she was a little girl. Point taken, my lady, he said with a slightly lopsided smile. If you don't want to tell me what's going on between the two of you, that's fine, she said, deliberately using her voice, so there could be no question of her sincerity. But if it's something I can help with, help her or you, you know you only have to ask. Of course I know, he told her in reply. And it's certainly not that I don't want to tell you. It's just that I'm not really sure what's happening myself. And there are some privacy issues of my own I have to work through. I can understand that, she said. And in the side traces of her voice, he heard her memory of the echoes she'd felt when his shared glimpse with Zindel had hammered through him. She couldn't help feeling that memory, putting it together with a dozen other little clues, and realizing, in general terms at least, what must have happened. Yet she made absolutely no effort to use the knowledge he knew she already possessed as some sort of opening wedge, and he sent a warm flood of love and gratitude over their bond. You know she's already planning to organize our wedding for us, don't you? Alizan continued, her mental tone lighter as she deliberately changed the subject. From a few things she said, I think she's planning on pulling out all the stops, too. Oh, wonderful. Kinlafia's voice was so tart, Alizon chuckled out loud. You do realize that my parents, both of my parents, are good new Farnalian social republicans, don't you? They're going to have enough trouble with my marrying an emperor's privy voice without having said emperor's daughter organizing the ceremony. Oh, stop worrying, she scolded. Every parent wants his or her child to do well in life. Just because your parents are socialists doesn't change that. After you get elected to the new Imperial House of Talents, they'll be so proud of you they won't even notice who you're marrying. For that matter, you may find they've turned into staunch imperialists once they see you wheeling and dealing in the very cockpit of power, as it were. Kinlafia rolled his eyes. If simple confidence were enough to get elected, we wouldn't even have to count the ballots with you around, he said dryly. Unfortunately, I think it's a little more complicated than that. Not when Zindelchan Calarath puts his mind to it, it isn't, she told him serenely. And not when the candidate is as completely and totally right for the job as you are. He squeezed her elbow against his side as the warmth and confidence flowed out of her into him. And yet her mention of the Emperor had brought him back his concern over Andron. Zindel was older than Andron, more experienced at dealing with and concealing the telltale symptoms of a glimpse, despite which it was obvious to Kinlafia that whatever was riding Andron like some sort of unrelenting nightmare was also pursuing Zindel. And the ripples spreading from his and his daughter's anxiety were afflicting the Empress and her younger daughters as well, even if they had no idea what that anxiety's root cause might be. Maybe the ball will help, Alizan said hopefully. And maybe the ball will send her right over the edge, Kinlafia shook his head. The mere thought of it is coming close to having that effect on me, at any rate. Nonsense. You'll be the most handsome man there, not to mention the most famous. In fact, I'm planning to be intolerably jealous when all these court ladies come fluttering around you, asking to dance. Oh, don't worry about that, Kinlafia chuckled. Did I forget to mention that I never learned to dance? His brown eyes danced wickedly. Trust me. As soon as I've crushed a few ladies' delicate toes, you won't have any trouble at all keeping me all to yourself. Voice can laugh you? Alizan had been about to reply when the voice from behind cut them off. They stopped, looking over their shoulders, and saw an armsman in the green and gold of the Calaraths, who bowed to them with grave courtesy. Your pardon, voice can laugh you, but his majesty would be very grateful for a few moments of your time. Kinlafia's mouth felt suddenly dry, and his pulse rate picked up. Of course, he said quickly. Would now be a convenient time for him? He hoped you could come promptly. The armsman agreed, and Kinlafia turned to peck a quick kiss on Alizan's cheek. I'll see you again as soon as I can, my dear, he told her. After all, we have that delightful appointment with the tailor this afternoon, don't we? Alizan smiled at him, then nodded and released his arm. He gave her an answering smile before he turned to the armsman and beckoned for the other man to lead the way. He followed the armsman down the passageway, and as he went, he felt Alizan's warm, loving touch on his mind and heart.
Thank you for coming, Darcel. Kinlafia's left eyebrow rose very slightly as Zindul Chan Kalarath turned from the view through his study windows to greet his guest. So far, the Emperor had always been careful to begin any interview or conversation with Kinlafia by greeting him formally as Voice Kinlafia. For a moment, Kinlafia wondered if today's change was some sort of deliberate tactic on Zindul's part. But then he felt that same mysterious something he'd felt at their very first meeting, radiating from the Emperor. Using his given name hadn't been any sort of ploy. It was simply a measure of Zindel's concern that he'd forgotten the formal courtesy. And it was also, Ken Lafia realized, a reflection of Zindel's awareness that whatever else might happen in this universe or any other, Darcel Ken Lafia would face it at his daughter's side. Yes, Zindel said, almost as if he'd been the voice, reading Ken Lafia's surface thoughts. It's about Andrin. Your Majesty, I'm sure there are other... Ken Lafia began, but then he stopped himself. There was no point in pretending, not when Zindel was as aware as he himself was, of the bizarre fashion in which he had shared in the Emperor's glimpse. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, he said instead. It would be pretty foolish, I suppose, to pretend I don't know what you're talking about. Of course, he managed a smile of sorts. Understanding it is something else again. I'm sorry too, Darso. Sindel said with simple sincerity. He walked over to the chair behind his desk and sank into it, then waved for Kenlafia to be seated in another chair at the end of the desk, close enough for comfortable conversation. Kenlafia was well aware that one was not supposed to sit in the Emperor's presence, yet it seemed the most natural thing in the world for him to accept the invitation. He sat, cocking his head to one side, and waited for Zindel to explain why he'd been summoned. It took the Emperor several seconds of uncharacteristic hesitation. Then he cleared his throat. I'm sure you've figured out by now that Janicki had more than one reason for suggesting you run for office, he said. Your Majesty, I realized that the first time he made the suggestion, Kinlafia replied. I didn't ask him what those other reasons were, although perhaps I should have, but I knew they were there. And you accepted his suggestion anyway. The fleetingness of Zindel's smile seemed to shout his anxiety to the voice. It must have been that damned Kalarath magnetism, the Emperor continued. Janaki always has had more than his fair share of it. I think they issue it with your birth certificates, actually, Your Majesty. Kinlafia produced a small smile of his own, although he was beginning to suspect that what he'd just said came very close to being the literal truth. Well, at any rate, Zindel said, after our little shared experience at dinner, I strongly suspect, no, I don't suspect, I know, that you've figured out at least a part of what Janicki's other reasons were. Yes, I have, I think, Kinlafia admitted. And if you'll pardon my saying so, your majesty, it scares the ever-living shit out of me. It's so far above anything I ever thought of as being my pay grade that I get a nosebleed just thinking about it you'll get over it. It could have been a simple conversational throwaway, and it could have been a condescension. But it was neither. It was a simple statement of fact, as if the emperor had mentioned that the sun was likely to rise somewhere in the east tomorrow morning. I certainly hope you're right about that, even if it does seem a little unlikely at the moment. Zindel chuckled, but then he shook his head and leaned slightly towards Kinlafia. Janicki's talent isn't as strong as mine, he said, and mine isn't as strong as Andrin's. His sea-gray eyes, so much like his son's and his elder daughter's, seemed to hold unquiet ghosts as his gaze met Kinlafia's. In fact, I'm coming to the conclusion that Andrin has one of the truly legendary talents. Her glimpses are far stronger than mine ever were, much less than mine were at her age. I'm very much afraid that for her, like for many of her ancestors, her talent's very strength is going to be the curse she bears. As an emperor, I'm delighted to see it, grateful it will be available to serve my people's need. As a father, I would sell my soul to protect her from it. He fell silent, those gray eyes looking at something only they could see. He sat that way for several seconds, before he inhaled again deeply, and his eyes snapped back into focus. 
I suppose it's just as well for the Empire, and all of Sharona, that I can't protect her from her own talent. But what Janaki glimpsed fragments of, what I've glimpsed in more detail, tells me she'll need you, Darcel. I don't pretend to know all of the reasons, all of the ways in which you'll be there for her over the years. That isn't the way glimpses work, especially for a member of the glimpse's own family. But I know, beyond any question or doubt, that my daughter will come to love you as deeply as she's ever loved anyone in her life, and that you'll return that love just as deeply as if she had been the daughter of your own flesh. I know that, Darcel. But what I don't know is what the cost for you will be. Kinlafia sat very quietly, looking into the eyes of the man who would become his emperor in less than forty-eight hours. And as he did, he realized Zendolchan Kalarath was already his emperor. Your Majesty, I don't have any more idea about that than you do, and I won't say I don't care what the cost will be. But I will say that, yes, I did share your glimpse. And given what I saw when I did, I'll pay that cost, whatever it is. Thank you, Zindel said with quiet, deep sincerity. A father always wants, needs, to be there for his daughter. I hope to be there for many years to come for Andrin, as for Raziel and Anbessa. But having seen you and Andrin in my glimpse, I know that if for some reason I can't be there, she will still have you. And that's one of the very few visions my talent has ever given me which are unalloyed sources of relief and happiness. However, the reason I asked you to visit me this morning, he continued more briskly, is that I'm certain you've noticed that both Andrin and I have been more tense than usual over the past few days. And as I'm almost equally certain you've deduced, that tension has been the result of a glimpse we've shared. Given what you shared with me, You'll probably understand better than most non-Calaraths when I say it's been difficult for us to nail down the exact significance of that glimpse. However, his face turned grim and hard. I've just received a dispatch from Division Captain Changer Wraith, which has put a great deal of what I've seen into perspective. A most disturbing perspective. Your Majesty? Kinlafia stiffened in his chair. As you're better aware than most, any voice message from the division captain takes just over a week to reach us. This particular message relayed one from Janaki, at Fort Salby. It would appear, Darcel, that the Arcanans weren't negotiating in good faith with us, after all. Kinlafia's eyes narrowed and he felt something like sea ice sweeping through his veins. Janaki's message has put several things Andrin and I had glimpsed earlier into perspective. I know now what we were seeing. But Janaki's glimpse is obviously far stronger, far more complete. At the time he sent his message to Division Captain Chanjareth, he expected Fort Salby to be attacked within 48 hours by an Arcanan force, which included dragons. Literal, flying, fire-breathing dragons. Kinlafia blinked in astonishment and Zindel laughed. It was an ugly, harsh bark of sound, without any trace of humor. Believe me, I doubt very much that you could be more surprised by that than I was, and I actually glimpsed the things months ago. I simply didn't know what they were, didn't have enough other knowledge to put it into context or recognize what I was seeing. The very idea was so preposterous that my preconceptions got in the way until it was far too late. What do you mean, too late, Your Majesty? Kinlafia asked, tautly. I mean... Andrin and I have been glimpsing Janaki in combat for the last eight days. Zindel's face suddenly looked years older. I mean, we can't tell from what we've seen what happens to him. But what we have glimpsed is terrifying, Darcel. And the message he sent to Chan Jareth is even more frightening. Whatever Andrin and I may be glimpsing, Janaki expects to die. Kinlafia felt as if he'd just been shot through the chest, and his face went suddenly white under its deep tan. Memories of Janaki, of his laughter, his kindness and compassion, his zest for life, and his obviously deep and abiding dedication to the lifetime task to which an accident of birth had condemned him, rushed through the voice, and his hands tightened like claws on the armrests of his chair. He may be wrong, Zindel said. 
His talent is weaker, as I've said. He may be misinterpreting something he's seen, and I pray to the triad that he is. But the very weakness of his talent makes the clarity of his glimpse more frightening. There are several reasons why it might have been clearer, sharper than ours. But there's no point in pretending that the most likely reason isn't that he's interpreted it correctly. My God, Your Majesty, Ken Lafia whispered. I don't know. I mean, what can I say? Do. I don't know what you'll do if Janaki is right. Zindel's eyes were dark, glistening with the unshed tears of a strong man, an emperor, who was also a father, whose son had just prophesied his own death. All I know is that, if he is, Andrin will need you, and you will be there for her. Does she know about Janaki's message, I mean? No, she doesn't. Neither does her mother. Zindel looked away, gazing out the windows at the garden, and his voice had become distant, as if he were speaking to himself, or possibly to his son. I don't know if I'm going to tell them. On the one hand, I should. They have a right to know. But on the other hand, suppose Janaki's wrong, as I pray he is. Should I tell them? Put that burden on them now of all times, when it may never come to pass at all. And even if Janaki is right, telling them now won't change what will happen. It will only let them worry, anticipate. It's bad enough knowing myself. Should I inflict that same pain, that same worry, on two of the five people I love most in the multiverse? I don't know what to say, Your Majesty, Ken Lafia admitted softly. I wish I did, but I don't. I know you don't, Darzel. The Emperor-elect of Sharona reached across and patted Darzel Ken Lafia on the shoulder almost comfortingly. I know you don't, but when Andrin needs you, you will know. Andrin Calarath was not quite eighteen years old, and her mother had always had strict notions about proper etiquette and the degree of decorum expected out of a daughter of the aristocracy. Whereas many a young Ternathian noblewoman might have attended her first public ball by the time she was sixteen years old, or even as young as fifteen, Andrin's very first formal ball had been to celebrate the ratification and signing of the Act of Unification only twelve days earlier. She'd expected to be giddy with excitement at the opportunity, and the truth was that she had enjoyed herself, but not as much as she'd expected to. Perhaps it was simply that pleasures anticipated always loomed greater than pleasures actually experienced. She suspected, however, that the answer was rather simpler than that. Andrin was the eldest daughter of the man who would become the first emperor of a united Sharona tomorrow afternoon in the magnificent temple of St. Tyre of Tajvana, the traditional site of Kalarath coronations for almost 2,000 years. Whereas other nobly born young ladies of her age could spend their formal coming out ball in a whirl of excitement and enjoyment, her grand imperial highness Andrin could not. Her entire evening had been rigorously regimented, planned out ahead of time with the precision of a professional military operation. She hadn't really blamed anyone. She was who she was, and there was no point pretending it could have been any other way. But the fact that she understood why it had happened hadn't magically, she winced a little as that particular adverb occurred to her, restored some sort of spontaneity to the occasion. Still, she'd enjoyed her first ball immeasurably more than she was enjoying her second. One thing an imperial princess could count upon was that she would never find herself unattended. Not only was she accompanied everywhere, except on the dance floor itself, at any rate, by Lazima Chan Zindico or one of her other bodyguards, but she was also the inevitable center of a veritable bison herd of young and not-so-young male aristocrats all determined to impress her with their sparkle, their wit, their good looks, and above all, their eligibility. The only one of them who hadn't all too obviously been thinking of himself in terms of matrimonial prospects, and her in terms of breeding stock, she thought tartly, was Howen Phi Guten. The crown prince of Ennieth had partnered her for two dances, before he bowed to the dictates of etiquette and withdrew to allow others to seek her hand. Those two dances had been blessed interludes, in which she could enjoy the physicality of movement without being subjected to witty comments 
or bits of profound political or literary or philosophical or even God's helper religious insight. Why, oh why, had the word that she was bookish had to get out amongst the marry me because I'm so impressive crowd? Unlike the others, Howen had simply danced with her, and most of her suitors had regarded him, while no doubt composing their own next witty sally, with a certain tolerant pity. For all its lengthy history, Eniath was a postage stamp kingdom, and one which had already aligned its policy with the Calaraths. There was no need to buy Eniath's loyalty with an imperial marriage, and the entire kingdom was scarcely worth a Ternathian duchess's hand, far less that of an imperial grand princess who stood second in line of succession to the throne of all Sharona. So they had allowed her two dances worth of freedom, waited while he'd bowed to her, kissed her hand, and withdrawn gracefully. And as soon as he had, they'd closed in once again to impress her with their own enormous suitability for her hand. It could even have been rather flattering under the right circumstances for all of, oh, fifteen seconds or so. By now, what she found herself hankering for most strongly was a good revolver and an extra box of ammunition. Fenena swiveled her head from her perch on the exquisitely stitched and gemmed leather gauntlet on Andrin's left wrist, looking up at her human friend with an eye Andrin was privately certain gleamed with approval. Her own lips twitched ever so slightly at the thought, yet not even that image, delectable though it might be, could break through the shell of... of what? She couldn't answer that question hard, though she'd tried. She knew her terrifying glimpses of Janicki were a huge part of it, of course. They were too strong, too persistent, for her to just brush them aside however hard she tried. However frequently, she reminded herself, glimpses often failed, or turned out to have been misunderstood or wrongly interpreted, especially when they concerned loved ones. She'd felt the bumblebees swarming under her skin again, felt the needles and pins of prophecy pricking in her bones, and she knew something. Something dreadful was going to happen to her brother. Shalana the Merciful, please, she thought. Please let this glimpse be wrong. Protect Janaki. If only her father hadn't so obviously been glimpsing something similar, it might have been easier for her to convince herself she was wrong. But she'd seen the same unspoken fears in his eyes, felt his talent resonating against hers and she knew what it was he hadn't told her mother. Her haunted eyes tracked across the ballroom floor, to where Empress Verena swirled through the graceful measures of a Euromathian waltz with the Prince Regent of Lamathia, who appeared to have finally forgiven her father for the famous God's Damned Fish remark. The Empress's head was tilted to one side as she smiled at her partner, moving with all the skilled grace which had seemed to elude Andrin, despite the best efforts of veritable troops of dancers for so many years of her adolescence. Verena radiated vivacity, zest, confidence in the future, as she looked forward to her coronation as Empress of Sharona on the morrow. But Andrin knew. She knew the burden of the Calarath talent lay even heavier on the shoulders of imperial consorts who lacked that talent, than on any who possessed it. Her mother couldn't experience any glimpse directly, yet she knew when her daughter and her husband were gripped by the cruel pincers of precognition, and she knew how desperately they sought to protect her from the often frustratingly murky visions of the future which haunted them. Despite her smiles, despite the confident, gracious image she projected, she knew they were protecting her now. And even someone far less intelligent than she would have had very little difficulty figuring out which of the people she loved was most probably in danger. And yet, she did her duty. She shouldered the burden she had agreed to bear the day she accepted Zindel Chan Kalarath's hand in marriage, and the even greater one no one could have predicted, which would settle upon her tomorrow. She hid her fears, pretended she was unafraid, pretended even to her husband and her daughter that she wasn't terrified by the future which they, unlike she, could at least glimpse, however imperfectly. As Andrin watched her dancing, smiling, she wanted to weep, weep for her mother's courage, for the crushing weight of the duty she had accepted so many years before. Your Highness? 
Andrin blinked herself back into focus and turned her head. Yes, voice can love you. I was hoping you might be kind enough to allow me to partner you for the next dance, your highness. The tough-looking, brown-haired voice looked out of place in the ballroom, not because he wasn't perfectly attired and one of the better-looking men present, but because he made the other, younger, far more nobly-born males, still orbiting Andrin, look as callow and untried as they actually were. Many of them had the tanned, lean fitness of the sports field, but his bronzed, muscular hardness went far deeper than that, earned in a far harder school where the stakes had been infinitely higher than who won or lost some trophy. He was far too old for Andrin, of course, at least twice her age and probably more. But for just a moment, as she looked into those warm, somehow compassionate brown eyes, she felt a deep envy of Alazan Yanamar. I promise I won't walk all over your slippers, your highness, Kinlafia told her with a twinkle. Mind you, I wouldn't have promised any such thing for this waltz, but the next dance is from New Farnal, which means I actually know the steps. He smiled so winningly she had to chuckle despite her mood. I'd be delighted she told him, and the crowd of disappointed aspirants parted like ice flows around the bows of a Farnalian icebreaker as he escorted her towards the head of the line forming for the next dance. You'll have to excuse me for a moment again, dearling, she told Fenena, and the falcon launched from her gauntleted left wrist. Fortunately, the Calarath's attachment to their falcons was sufficiently well known, not to say notorious, that no one seemed particularly astonished or upset when Fenena went flashing overhead. The falcon settled on her perch, under the watchful eyes of Brandis Chan Gordal and Ulthar Chan Habakon, and Andrin offered her hand to Kinlafia. Thank you, your highness. He bent over it, pressed a kiss to its back, and then they took their places as the orchestra played the first few bars of a new farnal country melody, and the step caller called out the circle dance's first movement. The dance was far more lively than the stylized, refined waltz which had preceded it. Kinlafi was obviously familiar with the steps, although, despite his athleticism, he was not Howen Fai Guten's equal as a dancer. Yet there was something profoundly soothing about him, and Andrin found herself actually laughing with delight as he twirled her through the dance's movements. And as she did, she realized it was precisely for that moment of escape that Kinlafia had asked her to dance. It came to an end at last, and she tucked her hand into his elbow. He started to escort her back to where her abandoned suitors waited, but she looked up at him with a winsome smile. If you please, voice Kinlafia, she said, I think I'd prefer a glass of lemonade. Nothing could please me more, your highness. From one of the nobly born butterflies who'd been fluttering about her so assiduously all evening, it would have been a pleasant nothing. From Kinlafia, it was a completely sincere statement. And she squeezed his elbow gently. He glanced down at her with a small smile, and she realized there was no need to explain to him what that squeeze was for. Lazima Chan Zindiko trailed watchfully along behind, his eyes searching constantly for any tiny flaw in the crowd, any possible sign of danger for his charge. He didn't find one, of course which didn't prevent him from settling into what Andrin privately thought of as his brooding protector mode, as Kinlafia seated her at one of the small candlelit tables placed to catch the pleasant evening breeze swirling in through the wall of open double doors. Kinlafia glanced at Chan Zindiko with a much more measuring eye than most of the young sprouts who had pestered Andrin all night ever showed. Obviously, the voice recognized Chan Zindiko for what and who he truly was, whereas most of the spoiled, pampered aristocrats saw him only as one more item of furniture. Andrin liked that. Kinlafia disappeared for a moment or two, then returned with not one glass of punch, but four, and Prince Howen Fai Guten and Alazan Yanamar. Andrin thanked the voice for the glass and raised it to her lips a bit more quickly than she might otherwise have to hide her smile. She'd wondered when Alazan would turn up. She also wondered how long it would be before the reporters noticed that wherever candidate Kinlafia happened to be, the emperor's privy voice was virtually certain to turn up, and vice versa. The thought tickled her fancy, and her eyes gleamed mischievously as she considered how she might twit the two of them. 
The two voices were busy looking at one another, and Andrin's dancing eyes met Prince Howen's equally amused gaze for just a moment. Forgive me, Voiskin Lafayette, she said then, lowering her glass. But I've noticed that some of the papers and some of the voice reports are commenting on how much time you seem to be spending here in the palace. There's speculation that your presence here indicates you've decided to become one of Zindel's men. She paused, and Kinlafia cocked his head slightly to one side. I've seen the reports, your highness, he said. May I ask why you mention them? I know from something Yanimar said that father didn't want it to seem as if he was too openly supporting your candidacy. But I've also noticed he seems to be spending an extraordinary amount of time talking to you, especially for someone who hasn't even won election yet. I was just wondering if you and he had changed your minds about the possible implications of his openly supporting you, or at least appearing to support you. She looked at him very steadily and saw something like recognition flicker back in those brown eyes of his. But he didn't reply immediately. Instead, he sat there for several seconds, gazing at her thoughtfully, much as Shamir Taj might have. That thought danced through the back of Andrin's brain, and as it did, she realized that one of the things which most appealed to her about Kinlafia was that he and Taj were the only two men, apart from her father, who didn't seem to care about her youthfulness when she asked a question. They actually thought about those questions, about their responses to them, because they extended respect to the person asking them, not simply out of courtesy to the title of that person. Then he tilted his head to one side, glancing at Prince Howen, and arched one eyebrow. King Juni has become one of Father's closer allies, voice can laugh you, Andrin told him. I don't think we need to worry about the Prince's discretion, do we, Your Highness? Most assuredly not. Your Grand Imperial Highness, Prince Howen responded with a slight smile. His Ternathian had improved enormously over the last couple of months, thanks in no small part to the services of a voice-language tutor, and the irony in his tone came through perfectly. Then his expression sobered. Still, I will certainly understand if Voice Kenlafia would prefer to answer your question in privacy. The Eniathian prince started to stand but Kinlafia shook his head. If Her Highness trusts your discretion, Prince Howen, then certainly I do as well, he said. The prince looked at him for a moment, then inclined his head in a small bow which mingled acknowledgement and appreciation of the implicit compliment. He sat back down, and Kinlafia turned to Andrin. Actually, Your Highness, I don't really think you were wondering about campaign strategies at all, were you? Andrin's eyes widened. Despite what she'd just been thinking, his directness and perceptiveness surprised her. No wonder Alizon was so attracted to him. You're right, she admitted. I suppose I'm just not used to asking such questions directly. With all due respect, Your Highness, Alizon put in, you should get used to it. Andrin looked at her and the privy voice shrugged. You happen to be heir secondary, Your Highness. Yes, you're young, but don't let the natural deference of youth keep you from asking the questions you need to ask and demanding the answers to them. Andrin glanced at Prince Howen, the only other person at the table remotely her own age. His expression gave away very little, but she thought she saw a trace of agreement in his almond eyes as he looked at the privy voice. And as Andrin considered the advice herself, she remembered that Alizon Yanimar was far more than simply her father's privy voice. She thought about it for several seconds then nodded in acknowledgment and moved her eyes back to Kinlafia. Taking Alizan's advice, voice Kinlafia, am I just imagining that Father and First Counselor Taj both seem to be treating you much more as if you'd been a family advisor for years than like someone who just got back from Hell's Gate less than two weeks ago? I, Kinlafia began and paused. He looked very thoughtful for a moment or two, then he gave a little shrug of his own, very much like Alizan's had been and nodded. I wouldn't say they regard me as any sort of advisor, Your Highness, and they certainly don't regard me as any sort of retainer or as some sort of official member of your household or administration. But there have been certain developments since your brother sent that flatteringly inaccurate letter of recommendation to your father. I'd really rather not go into all of them at this point, but he looked into her eyes once more. Some of them 
at least, concern you. Me? Andrin's pulse fluttered ever so slightly as she remembered her own thoughts during the unification parade. Is it something father's glimpsed? She asked. To some extent, yes. She could tell Kinlafia hadn't really wanted to admit that. Yet she felt strangely certain he'd never been tempted to lie to her, however diplomatically. The front of her brain told her she should take her cue from him, let it rest where it was. She'd already learned more than she'd really expected to, after all. Can you tell me what he's seen? She asked instead. No, your highness. Not without his permission, I'm afraid. Andrin felt a quick, brief flicker of anger, a spike of almost rage, made far stronger by the background of her endless days of anxiety and fear for Janaki. And Kinlafia was a voice. She knew he'd felt her anger. But he only looked back at her, steadily, and anger turned into respect. I can appreciate your discretion, voice Kinlafia, she told him after a moment. That's not to say I don't wish you could be more forthcoming. She sipped from her lemonade glass once more, then lowered it. I'm sure you're well aware that Father and I have been experiencing an entire cascade of glimpses for the past several days. It's a very uncomfortable sensation. It worries me. No, it scares me. And I suppose that makes me more anxious than usual for some kind of reassurance. I do know about the glimpses, Your Highness. He looked across the table at her, his eyes filled with a compassion which seemed somehow only warmer and deeper because of her awareness of what he himself had endured. He was like her father in some ways, she realized. From a different sequence of causes, perhaps, but with that same inner core of strength. Not so much of toughness or hardness, but of purpose of determination to meet whatever challenges the triad might see fit to throw before them. Was he always like that, I wonder, or did what happened to him at Fallen Timbers change him that deeply? I will tell you this, Your Highness, he continued. Your father, as I'm sure you need no one in the multiverse to tell you, loves you very, very deeply. I haven't known you very long myself, but I can already understand why that is. I've told your father, that if I win election to Parliament, my opinions will be my own, and that if I disagree with him, I'll say so. I meant that then, and I mean it now. But since then, I've been privileged to come to know him and you far better than I ever expected I would. And speaking as Darcel Kinlafia, not Voice Kinlafia, and not Parliamentary Representative Kinlafia, I would count it an honor if you would call upon me for anything you need. Andrin's eyes widened once more in fresh surprise. People told her father and her, to some extent, that sort of thing every day. Sometimes they even meant it. But coming from Kinlafia, it was different somehow. There was an echo almost of what she often sensed from Chan Zindico and her other personal armsmen. And yet that wasn't quite correct either. Chan Zindico and the others were her family's loyal retainers, her servants when it came right down to it. Even though it would never have occurred to her to think of them as such, they were always aware of that relationship. It helped to find not simply how they regarded her, but who they themselves were. Darcel Kinlafia didn't see her that way. She'd never been his grand imperial princess, although she supposed that was technically going to change in about 18 hours. There was no institutional, dynastic sense of loyalty in what he'd just said. And in a way, Andrin doubted she would ever be able to explain, even to herself, that made the sincerity of what he just said indescribably precious. He meant it when he said he would be honored to help her. And there was no reason why he had to be, no basis for her to simply expect him to be. Voice can love you. I... She paused, her eyes burning strangely, and he reached across the table and very gently took her hand. It could have been a presumption, an intrusion. But instead of drawing back, her wrist turned as if of its own volition, meeting his hand palm to palm. And as she felt him squeeze her fingers, something clicked, almost audibly, deep down inside her. The bumblebees buzzed louder under her skin, the sound almost deafening, and something seemed to literally flow from her fingers into his hand. 
She'd never experienced anything like it, never heard of anyone experiencing anything like it. And she inhaled sharply, her nostrils flared. Your Highness, she heard Chan Zindiko say from behind her, his voice sharpening with the instinctive bristle of the deadly guard dog he truly was. Are you all right, Your Highness? I'm fine, Lazima. She turned her head to smile reassuringly up at him, then looked back at Kin Lafia. The voice must have recognized Chan Zindiko's flare of suspicion, but his expression was calm, almost tranquil. Voice Kin Lafia, I think, she began, only to break off abruptly as Alizan Yanamar jerked upright in her chair. The privy voice might have been carved from ice, so still she sat as she listened to whatever message had arrived with such abrupt, brutal unexpectedness, and then her eyes filled suddenly with tears. Alizan? Andrin said quickly, urgently. She took her hand from Kinlafia's, reaching out to the older woman as Alizan's pain reached out to her. What is it? What's wrong? Alizan closed her eyes, her face wrung with an anguish so deep, so bitter, that Andrin literally flinched. She saw Kinlafia responding to his beloved's grief as well. He reached out towards Alizan, and only later did Andrin realize that he'd reached out towards her, not Alizan, first. Andrin leaned towards Alizan across the table, unable to imagine what had hurt the older woman so. And then, abruptly, she realized the music had stopped that an ocean of utter silence was flowing out from the ballroom, sweeping over the entire palace. She turned her head, looking through the arched colonnade back into the ballroom, trying to understand the sudden stillness. And then, at last, Alizan spoke. Your Highness, the anguish, the grief in Alizan's beautiful voice, ripped at Andrin like a knife. Your Highness, the privy voice said, your father needs you. Chapter 34 Darcel Kinlafia followed Andrin and Chan Zindigo back into the ballroom. It was one of the hardest things he'd ever done, and his right arm tightened protectively around Alizan as the sledgehammers of shock, disbelief, grief, and fury hammered at their voices' sensitivity. Yet if it was terrible for them, it was still worse for Andrin, for she knew what her father was about to tell her. He saw it in the way all color had drained out of her face, felt it in the emotional aura trailing behind her like a fog of smoke and poison. Yet she crossed that ballroom floor, tall, straight, and graceful. Yes, Papa. Her voice cut through the stillness, the silence, with an impossible clearness as she stopped before her parents. Her mother's face was as white as her own, but Empress Verena's eyes were filled with the dark terror of the unknown, not the even darker ghost's foreknowledge inflicted. Emperor Zindel's right arm was about his wife's shoulders, and his face was strained. Andrin, his deep, powerful voice sounded frayed about the edges, and his arm tightened around his wife. We've just received word from Tresum, from Division Captain Chen Jirath. It's... His voice broke and his left hand rose. It settled on the back of the Empress's head, cradling it protectively, as he turned her and folded her against his massive chest. His own head bent as he bowed over her slenderness, and the tears of a strong man gleamed in his eyes. It's Janaki, Andrin said. Her father looked up and she met his eyes levelly, steadily. He's been killed. The Empress stiffened convulsively in her husband's arms. There was no word to describe the sound she made. It was far too soft to call a wail, yet too filled with pain to be called anything else. She shuddered, and the sound she'd made turned into something else, shattering sobs that filled the hollow silence. Yes, Andrin's father confirmed, in a voice which had been pulverized and glued unskillfully back together once more. Andrin swayed. Her regal head never dropped, yet Kinlafia could literally see the wave of agony that flowed through her. He stepped away from Alizan quickly, offering the princess's arm, and she took it blindly without even looking at him. Gods, he thought. Dear sweet gods, if Janaki's dead, then Andrin is... We have to go, her father told her across her sobbing mother's head. Of course, Papa, 
Andrin straightened her spine with a courage which made Kinlafia want to weep. And despite the tears which streaked her face and fogged her tone, her voice never wavered. Raziel and Anbessa will need us. How is she? How are they? Alizon looked up at the harsh, angry question and shook her head. I don't know, love, she replied quietly. The Empress and Raziel are sedated. His Majesty is holding himself together. I don't know how. And I don't believe Anbessa really understands what's happened. Not yet. And Andrin? She's just sitting there, Alizon said sadly. Sitting there in the nursery, beside Anbessa's bed. Raziel is asleep in her arms. She cried herself out, poor little love, after the herbalist sedated her. Andrin? Alizon's voice broke and she raised gray eyes soaked with tears to Kinlafia's. Andrin sang them both to sleep. She managed to get out. She began to weep once more, weep with deep, tearing shudders. And Kinlafia put his arms around her, hugging her tightly while his own eyes burned. Again, he thought. The bastards have done it again. His jaw clenched so tightly he thought his teeth would shatter as memories ripped through him, and white-hot rage boiled in their wake. The same Arcanan butchers who'd murdered Shalar and all of his friends, his family, at Fallen Timbers, they'd done it again. Despite his earlier conversation with the Emperor, or perhaps because of it, the pain of Janicki's death was like some huge, jagged splinter buried in his chest. And with that pain came the anger, the fury, that the Arcanans could wreak such carnage on the hearts and souls of those for whom he cared even here, even in the very heart of Sharona. His eyes burned even hotter as he thought about all the men he'd known, fought with, the men who'd avenged Shalar's murder. Balker Chantesh, Grafen Halifu, Rokum Tragen, Delicon Yar, Halmak Arthag, if the Arcanans had penetrated as deeply as Fort Selby, managed to kill Janaki, then all of those others, still more of Darso Kinlafia's friends, must have been killed or captured first. And now the treacherous murderers had killed the heir to the throne himself and devastated his family. Is there anything I can do? He whispered almost pleadingly into Alizon's hair. Anything at all? I... She began. There will be something you can do, voice Kinlafia. Another, deeper voice interrupted Alizon's, and she and Kinlafia looked up quickly as Zindel Chan Kalarath strode into the room. He looked in that moment, Kinlafia thought, like an Imperial Navy dreadnought with its main batteries swinging out to bare its teeth as it forged into the teeth of a winter's gale. His face might have been hammered out of old iron, and his gray eyes were colder than chilled steel. Your Majesty, Ken Lafia said. There will be something, the Emperor repeated in a hard, flat voice. I don't know what, not yet, but I know that much. Your Majesty, I... You'll know what it is when the time comes, Darsal, Zindel said. For now. He drew a deep breath and raised both hands, scrubbing his face in his palms. For now, all I know is that all the Arpathian hells together couldn't hold everything that's about to break loose right here in Tajvana. His voice came out muffled by his hands, and Kinlafia looked at Alizon, and both of them looked back at Zindel, as the Emperor lowered his hands with a smile as bleak as northern sea ice. Chavabusar is going to see his opportunity in this, the Emperor said. Shamir Taj is out talking to the heads of the various delegations to the Conclave right now, and you can be damned certain Chava will soon have his representatives doing exactly the same thing. They're going to use my son's death any way they can. As if what's happened to Janaki wasn't going to do damage enough all by itself. How bad is it, Your Majesty? Alizon asked quietly. They've taken at least five universes, Zindel said flatly. As far as we know, every soldier and civilian we had in those universes is either dead or prisoner. And somehow, he met the two voices' eyes. They managed to keep a single voice from getting the warning out as well. Kinlafia's belly muscles clenched, and he felt Alizon's sick awareness of what the Emperor was telling them. 
They've advanced over 4,000 miles in less than two weeks. Zindel continued. The sort of transport and logistics capability that suggests is going to be terrifying as soon as its implications sink in. And the existence of these dragons and these lion-eagle things of theirs is going to be even worse. But frankly, what's going to hit home the hardest, going to have the most catastrophic effect on public opinion, is that they launched this entire attack while they were negotiating with us. Kinlafia's teeth grated together with fresh fury, and Zindel snorted with cold, bitter anger of his own. They've truly done it this time, he said harshly. First, Shalar's murder. Now this, this treachery and the murder of my son, the heir to the throne. The whole of Sharona is going to explode in fury. Any possible hope we ever had for stopping this insanity is gone forever. Whether we're ready for it or not, whether we want it or not, we're in a fight for our very survival. And my son, his voice broke savagely. It took him three tries to get it under control again. My son's death will not be in vain, he grated at last. We're going to take every one of those portals back. We're going to drive those bastards back into the universe they came from. And I don't mean the universe on the other side of the portal you helped capture, Darcel. I mean their home universe. We're going to shove them back and bottle them up and blow them apart so hard it'll knock them back into the God's damn Stone Age. He stared hard into Kenlafia's eyes. And you, Parliamentary Representative Kenlafia, are going to help me do it. Yes, sir. Kinlafia met that hard, bitter stare of steel across Alizon's head and nodded once, sharply. Yes, your majesty, he agreed in the voice of a man swearing an oath. No matter what it takes. Good. Zindel's voice was different, too. It was the voice of an emperor accepting an oath of fealty. Then the grief, the anguish in his eyes shifted. It turned into something else, equally hard and yet somehow almost desperate. And the other thing you're going to help me do, Darcel, he added in a chilling tone, you and Alison both, is to find a way to keep that bastard Bussar from forcing Andrin to marry one of his monstrous sons. Kenlafia's heart lurched. Oh, dear God, he half whispered. How could he have missed it? He had already realized that Andrin had just become the crown princess of Sharona, or shortly would, and that meant. I will personally put a bullet through every last one of Chavo Bussar's sons before I let any of them marry your daughter, your majesty, he said, and felt Alizan shudder in his arms. Shudder with the thought of Andrin wed to any member of Chava's family, and with her voice's knowledge that he meant every single word he'd just said. Good. Zindel Chan Kalarath's eyes could have frozen the heart of hell itself. But then he made himself inhale deeply. Good, he repeated. But now let's try to figure out a way to stop it without throwing our world into a civil war at the same time we have to deal with these arcane and butchers. Yes, your majesty. Kinlafia nodded and the emperor turned to Alazan. Shamir is canvassing our allies' delegations, he told her. It was a sign of his own grief and shock that despite his outward self-control, he'd clearly forgotten that he'd already told them that. I expect him back within the hour. Please contact the members of the Privy Council. This crisis won't wait. Tell them we'll meet two hours from now, and I want Orem Limana present as well. We'll need him to help us coordinate portal traffic. Yes, Your Majesty. Thank you. Thank you both, Zindel said. Then he drew a deep breath, turned, and walked back out the door through which he'd entered the room. Kenlafia heard the sound of weeping from beyond that door, and the emperor moved like an exhausted swimmer in deep water as he returned to his grieving family. The door closed behind him, and Alazan buried her face in Kenlafia's shoulder and spent one long, desperate moment weeping while he held her close. Then she tilted her face up and gave him a trembling smile full of courage, and he kissed her very gently. Let me know when you have a free moment he said. I'll feed you some dinner and rub your feet. That's an offer more precious than diamonds, she said, making herself smile once again, even while her eyes swam with fresh tears.
consider it a date. She rose on her toes to kiss him once more, and then they both gathered themselves to face what must come next. Chaba Bussar stood in his strategically chosen spot beside the buffet tables, watching the hysterics which were now fully underway in the grand ballroom, and worked hard to keep from smiling in delight. The truth was still sinking in, he thought. Out on the dance floor, women sobbed into silk handkerchiefs and men wore murderous expressions. He heard curses and vows of dire vengeance in a score of languages, and the sound was sweet, sweet to his ears. Janaki Chan Kalarath had gotten himself killed, gotten his head nipped clean off like a chicken by some sort of huge bird or monster, if the rumors were to be believed. It was absolutely delicious. In one fell swoop, his own choice of verb made him chuckle mentally behind his impassive expression, considering the nature of Janaki's executioner. The utter disaster which his political ambitions had suffered was reversed. All he had to do was grasp the opportunity swiftly and intelligently. By this time next week, that horse-shaped, gangling, hideous giant of a schoolgirl was going to find herself profoundly married. And not long after that, he looked up as the seneschal of Othmalese waddled over to his corner of the ballroom. The seneschal contemplated the weepers and cursers, then looked Chava in the eye. What a pity, he said. Yes, isn't it? Chava agreed, allowing one corner of his mouth to quirk upwards ever so slightly. I imagine tomorrow will be... Quite a busy day for us all, the seneschal continued. There'll have to be another session of the conclave to deal with this latest crisis. And of course, this is going to force a postponement of the coronation. So sad, he sighed. So very sad. True, Chava nodded, then cocked his head to one side. One's heart goes out to the emperor's family at such a time, of course. Still. There are responsibilities which must be met, aren't there? And plans which must be adjusted, or in some cases. He looked deep into the seneschal's eyes, accelerated. I do trust that the comforters will be keeping the emperor and his entire family in their thoughts. Oh, I think you need have no fear on those grounds, your majesty. The seneschal assured him. Someone knocked on Darcel Kinlafia's door at three o'clock in the morning. He jolted awake and jerked upright in bed, momentarily confused by the soft white moonlight falling through open windows where the warm breeze stirred white draperies. He'd been dreaming of combat, a ghastly, nightmarish mishmash of his own memories, fighting at the swamp portal, the massacre of his survey crew, and the combat he'd seen through the glimpse he'd shared with Zindel and he wasn't certain at first what had awakened him. Then the knock sounded again. Darcel! A familiar voice called softly in the back of his brain, and he was out of bed in a heartbeat. He snatched up a night robe as he crossed the apartment, somehow managing with the moonlight's aid to avoid stubbing his toes as he dodged around the furniture of a living room to which he wasn't yet accustomed. Then he snatched the door open and found her standing in the hallway, trembling. He didn't speak. He simply opened his arms, and she fell into them, weeping. He held her close, rocked her gently, then guided her into the living room. He drew her down beside him on the divan in a pool of moonlight, and she huddled against him while she sobbed. He surrounded her with his arms, with his love, with the caress of his voice and the bond between them. There were no words, for there was no need for words. There were only the two of them clinging to one another in the midst of their grief and that was enough. Reports are still coming in from Tresum, she whispered finally. Chandoraith's first report of the battle was relayed while he was still eleven hours out from Salbaton. He's sent three more since then. It's horrible. She relayed the images Kalia Chan Dharma and Lissar Chan Corthol had transmitted up the voice net. Images of Fort Salbi still smoking, 
with a huge, monstrous, winged creature draped over one tower. Images of men burned into twisted charcoal, or lying like tattered scarecrows where lightning had left them, bits and pieces of the bodies of Sharonian soldiers, and strewn among their mangled bodies the tumbled carcasses of the unnatural fusion of lion and eagle which had killed them. More bodies, breaches in a wall of adobe and stone, things which looked like horses but obviously weren't, shattered platforms filled with the broken bodies of Arcanan soldiers, gun pits, row after row of bodies laid out in canvas shrouds. They went on and on, a catalog of destruction and desecration, and Darcel Kinlafia fought the surge of acid trying to come up out of his belly. His arms tightened around Alizon, and he held her while she shared the horror with him. The images ended at last, and he kissed her hair, murmuring wordlessly to her. He never knew how long they sat there, just being there for each other, clinging to their love like some last unshakable rock of sanity in the midst of a multiverse gone mad. How are they holding up? he asked finally. Andron is sedated now, too, Alizon said. She didn't want to take it, but his majesty insisted. She wanted to stay with Raziel and Anbessa, but she has to rest, really rest. Kinlafia nodded, his jaw tightening once more. The Empress is in deep emotional shock, Alizan continued. She knew the danger was there, but somehow it seemed so remote, especially when Janaki was ordered home with the Arcanian prisoners. But I think, I think she'd guessed what's been worrying His Majesty and Adrin. She just didn't want to admit it to herself. He's her only son, Darzel, and... Her voice caught raggedly, and she shook herself. I already told you Raziel had been sedated, but she's awake again. And Anbessa is finally realizing what's happened, I think. Both of them were clinging to their mother when I left the Imperial apartments. And Zindel... Her voice broke off again. What about him? Ken Lafia pressed gently, and she inhaled deeply. I've never seen his majesty like this. He can barely speak above a rasping whisper. It's more than just losing his only son. He feels responsible for the massacres, for failing to move quickly enough and get reinforcements forward soon enough. That's ridiculous, Kinlafia snapped in hot defense. I've worked that transit chain, Alizon. Nobody could have moved in troops or material any faster. Nobody. He isn't a god to wave one hand and magically transport a division. I know all that, Darzel, and he knows it too, but he's a Calarath. He feels responsible for the deaths, for the undermanned forts. And he's not the only one, Alizan shivered. Orim Lamana is nearly suicidal with remorse. He feels like he's betrayed them, all of them, soldiers and civilians, by trying to build new forts before he had troops in place to adequately man them, before he had artillery in place to defend their walls. He's not a soldier. Kinlafia protested. It's not his job to think like one. Besides, no one ever intended those portals to stand up to anything more dangerous than a few bands of brigands. There's never been anything more dangerous than a few bands of brigands until now. I know that too, she nodded. And the Emperor knows that. When Yafumani spoke to me from Exploration Hall, he said His Majesty's ordered two of the PA's distance viewers to watch the First Director twenty-four hours a day until this emotional shock passes. The Emperor has ordered Orem not to suicide. That shocked Kenlafia. Orem Lamana was one of the strongest men he'd ever known. If he was that shaken, then... What about the First Counselor's contacts with the other delegations? He asked. It's going to be ugly, Alizan told him. The Emperor was right about that, too. Iseth's requested an emergency meeting of the Conclave later this morning. Iseth? Kinlafia repeated incredulously. Everyone knows perfectly well that Chava is really behind it, she said. No one's going to admit it, though. And the coronation? That's been postponed, she said bitterly. This... Spontaneous request for a conclave session supersedes it under the circumstances. That's just wonderful. Actually, she said unwillingly, it was inevitable. If Iseth hadn't requested it, we probably would have had to do it ourselves. Not that Iseth or Chava did it to do us any favors. 
Fresh anger swirled about deep inside Darso Kinlafia, but he made himself step back from it. He remembered what Janicki had told him about the deadliness of hatred. Yet that wasn't what let him step away from the demons of his inner fury. No, it was the woman in his arms, the lifeline he clung to. And as he did, he felt her clinging to him in turn. Their strength flowed together, melding, merging into something greater than the sum of its parts. And he turned her tear-soaked face up to his and kissed it gently. All right, he said softly. His majesty was right about Andrin needing to rest. Well, so do we. Come with me. He stood, then scooped her up in his arms and carried her through the moonlight towards his bedroom door. She looked up at him, and he smiled crookedly. I said rest, love, he told her. And I meant rest. There'll be time for other things later. I didn't realize you were so chivalrous, her voice murmured in the back of his mind. Refusing to take advantage of a maiden's grief? He laughed softly despite their grief, despite their loss, and kissed her once again. Chivalrous isn't exactly a word I'd apply to myself, love. Let's try patient instead. I prefer chivalrous, she told him. And in this case, I think I may just know you better than you know yourself. Maybe, but either way, woman. He turned back the light spread at one side of the enormous bed and tucked her under it. You need rest, and so do I. So, he bent over to kiss her once again, very gently. Go to sleep. Chapter 35 The tension in the Emperor Garum Chancellery could have been used to chip flint as Darsul Kinlafia settled into the place in the gallery to which his candidacy for the House of Talents entitled him. The sunlight streaming in through the windows framed in the black and white banners of mourning revealed a very different set of faces from the ones he'd seen there just the day before. The vast majority of naysayers and fence-sitters had disappeared. Today's faces were shaken, sick, and enraged. Zindal Chan Kalarath, who should have been at the temple of St. Tai preparing for his coronation, sat like a statue of Ternathian granite. The black mourning band around his right arm was matched by the bands around the arms of every other man and woman in that enormous chamber, and the flags of every nation of Sharona flew at half-mast. The death of the heir to any imperial throne was always a world-shaking event. The death of this particular heir had shaken an entire universe to its foundation. Andrin Kalarath sat beside her father, her own face pale and drawn with grief. The preparation of her glimpse had done nothing to lessen her sorrow or the profound, brutal shock of her loss, and nothing could have prepared her to deal with her younger sister's grief. She'd argued against her father's decision the night before, but she knew now that he'd been correct. She had needed rest, and she was profoundly grateful that her mother and sisters had no official reason to be here this morning. Indeed, she wished desperately that she hadn't had to be here either. But there was absolutely no choice about that, despite her youth. With Janicki's death, Andrin Kalarath, at seventeen, had become not heir secondary to the winged crown of Ternathia, but heir apparent to the throne of Sharona and all the crushing weight of the multiverse seemed to be bearing down upon her shoulders. I should still be with my tutors, a small voice wailed in the back of her mind. I'm not ready for this. It wasn't supposed to be my job. Yet even as that little voice cried out in protest, she knew it was her job, that it had always been here waiting for her, if anything happened to Janicki. Shamir Taj, unlike Andrin, was not in his place at his emperor's elbow. Since the formal ratification of the Act of Unification, Taj, as the effective first counselor of the worldwide empire to be, had replaced Orim Lamana as the presiding officer of the Conclave. Under the terms of the unification, the Conclave was to continue to function as the effective caretaker government of the new empire until after the formal parliamentary elections scheduled for two months after the official coronation. 
now that Conclave's members sat almost as still as Zindel. As Taj stepped up to the podium Orem Lamana had occupied when it first assembled. This Conclave is now in session, Taj announced. All rise for the invocation. That morning the invocation was short and to the point. Guard us, heavenly protectors, and help us choose wisely in this battle to save ourselves. Then Taj took the podium once again. As all of us, I'm sure, have already been informed, he said, his voice harsh and rusty with fatigue. Crown Prince Janaki Chan Kalarath has fallen in battle against the enemies of Sharona. Regiment Captain Chan Skrithik and Division Captain Chan Jaraith both agree that it was only the prince's glimpses which allowed Fort Salby to hold. And, he looked up, forced to clear his throat hard despite all his years of political experience. The division captain has confirmed that Prince Janaki knew it was a death glimpse before he chose to remain as part of the garrison defending Fort Salby and Salbaton's civilian population. There was a moment of profound silence, and then Taj straightened his shoulders. Rather than rehearse the truly harrowing details which have been summarized in reports that are being bound for distribution as we speak, I will turn the podium over to His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor-elect of Sharona. But first, I ask that all please rise and bow heads for a moment of silence to honor the Crown Prince and the thousands of others that we estimate have been murdered in this Arcanan assault. Kinlafia heard temple bells tolling in the distance as the word raced out through Tajvana and the rest of Sharona, signaling voices across the world to sound the bells in honor of their dead, royal and common, military and civilian. He shivered as he listened to those deep, rolling tones of grief and respect. He'd never heard so many temple bells at one time. The sound reverberated through the city, through his bones. They rang out their dirge for five full minutes, calling to the thousands of Sharonian souls trying to find their way to the heavens of home. In the end, the last shivery tone died into silence, and Zindel Chan Kalarath took the podium. It was obvious he hadn't slept. Kinlafia's seat was close enough for him to see the bloodshot eyes haggard with dark circles. The emperor gripped the sides of the podium for long, silent moments, simply standing there in the heartlessly plain black-and-white morning tunic and trousers, instead of the jeweled coronation robes he ought to have been wearing. Then he began to speak. Over the past several weeks, he rasped, his deep voice rough-edged with fatigue and grief. We have wondered and debated over Arcana's possible intentions. Those intentions are now brutally clear. We neither asked for nor provoked this war. We attempted to deal fairly and openly with the enemy, only to be met with treachery and escalating violence. I have been closeted with the chiefs of staff, the elected speakers of this conclave, and the first director of the portal authority for most of the night. We've discussed threats and options for meeting them, and we have reached the following decisions. We are instituting an immediate recall to active duty of every soldier, sailor, and marine under the age of 40. We realize the terrible hardship this will place on families and businesses, but we have no choice. Our standing army is far too small to fight a war of this magnitude. If circumstances force our hand, we will recall all former military personnel under the age of 50, placing those with health and eyesight difficulties in administrative slots that must also be filled in order to make this war effort succeed. We are also asking for emergency volunteers from the talents to fill critical positions in communications, intelligence gathering, medical care, and many other areas. If we cannot fill those needed positions through volunteerism, we will have no choice but to institute conscription. Shock detonated through every talented delegate to the conclave. Even Garsel was stunned by the suggestion. Of all the major Sharonian nations, only Eurymathia practiced conscription. Ternathia, Farnalia, Harkala, and New Turneth and New Farnal all relied upon a tradition of voluntary military service. So did virtually all of the smaller Sharonian nations, and even in Eurymathia, the talents were automatically exempt from conscription because they were so relatively scarce 
as necessary to the civilian infrastructure as to the military. What Zindel had suggested, or threatened, was unprecedented, hadn't happened in over 400 years, and a roar of protest rose. It hammered at the Chancellery's banner-hung walls, and, You will be silent! Zindel Chan Kalarath's bull-throated bellow stunned the entire vast chamber into silence. By our best estimate, judging from when we initially lost contact with our forces in Hell's Gate, he said into the ringing stillness, biting off each rough-edged husky word like a sliver of bone. The Arcanans advanced over 4,000 miles in approximately 12 days. They are now little more than 44,000 miles from Sharona. If they launch a second and successful assault on Fort Salby and continue to advance at the same pace, they could cover the remaining distance to this very city in barely three months. Do not presume to protest anything the throne demands in a war of survival. We don't have time for it, and I will not let any of you jeopardize all of us. Is that clear? No one said a word, and Zindel Chan Kalarath's nostrils flared with satisfaction. Good, he said much more quietly. Then understand this as well, all of you. We did not start this war, but we will finish it. We will take back the portals they've taken from us in their treacherous attack. We will punish the atrocities they have committed against our people, and we will ensure that this union of Arcana will never again pose a threat to us, to our children, or to our grandchildren. A roar of approval went up, louder by far than the previous protest. Kilafia found himself on his feet with the rest, applauding madly. Yet even as he did, he looked down from the gallery at Chava Bussar's face and saw the cold, calculating eyes that watched Zindel with carefully veiled contempt. When the tumult finally died, Zindel continued his implacable, methodical outline of his preparations. Troops to be raised and trained, railroads to be extended, shipyards to be built, munitions factories to be expanded, fortifications to be planned and built, weapons to be improved, developed, and deployed. The list went on and on, marshalling the resources of every universe Sharona had ever explored and hammering them into a weapon of war. What I require from you, he finished finally is the immediate passage of sufficient taxation to pay for these utterly critical measures. We do not have time to wait for formal parliamentary elections. The Arcanans have taken that luxury out of our hands. When those elections are held, I will seek approval of our present emergency revenue measures from that parliament. But they must be passed now, and they will not be a negligible burden for anyone. This will be an expensive war. Never doubt that. Every Sharonian will feel the bite of higher taxes, and that bite will be deep. Many will protest when they realize just how deep. But when they do, ask them this question. Which do you prefer, higher taxes and higher prices, or Arcanan dragons in your skies, burning down your homes and loved ones? That is their choice. We did not ask for this war, but we will, by the triad, fight it with everything we have, with every ounce of strength we possess. Another ovation met that statement, although it was more subdued than the last one. Talk of things like higher taxes and conscripted labor forces had that effect. That concludes my prepared remarks, Zindel said when the silence had fallen once again. Does anyone have questions? Not debate. Questions. No one spoke for several seconds, but then the Emperor of Eurymathia stood in the heart of his own delegation. Your Majesty, he began, bowing in Zindel's direction, and esteemed colleagues, Eurymathia shares the profound grief which the heroic death of Crown Prince Janaki has brought to all Sharona and applauds the Emperor of Ternathia's determination to deal with this crisis. Something flared deep inside Kinlafia as Chava said the word Ternathia. However, Chava continued, while no one could deny the necessity of the measures which she has outlined, 
Eurymathia must question whether or not he possesses the authority to demand them. A stir of protest began, but he continued speaking clearly and strongly. It is unfortunately true that Crown Prince Janicki's death has reordered both the Ternathian imperial succession and the proposed succession of the Empire of Sharona. And it is also unfortunately true that as of this moment there is no Emperor of Sharona, nor an empire for him to rule. There has been no coronation, and the conditions specified by the act of unification for the empire he is to rule have not been, and cannot, as written, be satisfied. What are you suggesting? Ronald of Farnalia demanded furiously. I am simply suggesting, Chava replied, that this is a time of enormous uncertainty, and that under those circumstances it is particularly important that all these matters be handled in strict accordance with the provisions under which the nations represented at this conclave agreed to surrender their sovereignty. Yes, we are at war. Yes, it may be a war for our very survival. But if we are to face our enemies as a single cohesive whole, we must be truly united, and there must be no question of the legality and legitimacy of the government under which we will fight. Come to the point, quickly, Zindel Chan Kalarath said icily. Very well, your majesty. Chava bowed once more. My point is this. The death of your son has invalidated Section 3 of Article 2 of the Act of Unification. Unless the provisions of that article and section are satisfied, the Act is not binding upon Eurymathia or any other signatory power. If there is to be a true Empire of Sharona, then I must respectfully request that the succession be secured as contemplated by Article Two, in light of the changed circumstances resulting from your son's lamentable death. Is Crown Princess Andrin ready to marry the son I designate as her groom? A savage roar of outrage erupted. Half the members of the conclave were on their feet, shouting and demanding Chava's ejection from the chancellery, and Zindel's hands tightened on the podium with such force that Kinlafia expected the wood to crack. Then the gavel crashed down again and again, hammering for order, and all the while Chava stood in the tumult, eyes defiantly insolent, and wearing a smug little half-smile of satisfaction. The furor died down at last, trickling slowly away into silence. When the entire chancellery was still once more, the emperor turned his attention back to Chava Bussar. The Eurymathian smile faltered as Zindelchan Kalarath's icy gray eyes bored into him with scalpel-sharp contempt. The son you designate, the emperor said, and Chava actually blanched at the menace in his deadly soft voice. Haven't you overstepped your authority by presuming to name which of your lecherous, ill-bred mongrels will have the right to rape my daughter? Chava Bussar's face went sickly white with shock, then purple with rage. How dare you, he began. Do not presume to dictate terms to me, Zindel thundered. I, Chava began again, but a third voice interrupted him. It was a youthful voice, a soprano, which had never been raised in that chancellery before. Do not discuss me as if I were not here that voice said with icy precision, and every eye turned to the Ternathian delegation. Andrin Kalarath stood there, and the golden strands in her midnight hair seemed thicker, brighter than ever, gleaming as she faced the combined leaders and rulers of her entire planet. She stood in her black morning gown, with its bodice of stark, pitilessly unadorned white, like a votive candle burning before the triad's altar in its holder of polished ebony. And her eyes were Calarath eyes, haunted by portents of a future dark as the morning band about her sleeve, yet hard with the lightning flash of purpose. In some indefinable fashion, 
She looked like both the teenaged girl she was and the avatar of Sharona's future. Tall, strong, fearless, and wounded. Emperor Zindel stared at his daughter and his eyes were no longer those of an emperor. They were the eyes of a father, stark with fear for a daughter he loved more than life itself. They were the eyes of a man who had been asked for one sacrifice too many, of a man who could not, would not, give his family's juggernaut destiny his daughter, as well as his son. And they were the eyes, Darsol Kinlafia realized, of someone who recognized in this instant one fragment of the glimpse he and Kinlafia had shared. That man opened his mouth, his face hard with bitter determination. But the daughter looked up at her father and shook her head. Tanaka Sahari, Alien, show Warak, Crown Princess Andrin Kalarath said softly, and her father's face twisted as if the words had been bullets. Yafumani was one of Sharona's foremost linguisticians. He'd never held a position in any university's department of ancient languages. His career as the Portal Authority's chief voice had precluded that. But he had a true voice's love for language. And he was one of the very few people in that enormous chamber who recognized the language in which she'd spoken. He was also a man of impeccable integrity. But the shocks had come too hard and fast over the past fourteen hours. His recognition of what Andrin had said leaked out to every voice in the Chancellery. I am your daughter, Hallian. I remember. Silence hovered, and then slowly, so slowly, Zindel Chan Kalarath bowed his head. Andrin smiled at him almost gently, but then she turned to look across the Chancellery with its endless tears of men and women, and there was no gentleness in the tempered steel of the eyes which fixed themselves upon the Emperor of Eurymathia. I beg leave to inform Emperor Chava that his concerns are premature, she said clearly and distinctly. The act of unification has been neither nullified nor invalidated by my brother's death, nor will the House of Calarath seek to evade its obligations under that act. There is still an heir to the throne of Ternathia, and that heir is prepared to accept her obligations under the subsection Emperor Chava has just cited. But I am the Imperial Crown Princess of Ternathia, heir to the winged crown of Solarian, daughter of the House of Calarath, descendant of Halion and Earthane the Great. Her eyes flashed gray lightning, and her voice rang out like a soprano sword. It was no longer the voice of a teenaged girl. The voice of the most ancient lineage in human history had taken its place in that conclave. It stood before them in a gown of mourning, crowned in hair of golden-stranded black silk, and all the weight of that lineage crackled in its pride and defiance and anger. My ancestors were emperors of half the world, while yours were still picking lice, raiding their neighbor's sheep and stealing their neighbor's wives. You will not dictate to me the man I will marry, Chava Bussar. Bussar's face darkened in fresh rage, but Andrin's eyes were deadly, and she continued to speak with that cold, lethal precision. Subsection 3 of Article 2 requires the heir to Ternathia to wed a Euromathian royal prince within three months of the ratification of the Act of Unification, and that act was ratified two weeks ago. Very well. You will submit to me no later than noon tomorrow a list of those you wish to nominate as my husband. You may list every unmarried male of your lineage, if such is your desire. But I, Chavo Bussar, I and no one else will make my choice from all the eligible nominees. I will marry as the act requires within the next ten weeks. But do not ever make the mistake of attempting to dictate to a member of my house again. Epilogue The sun had set hours ago. The slider car raced up what should have been the valley of the Resinta River almost silently but for the rush of wind. It was a cloudy, moonless night, cold and still and very, very empty. The Arcanans called the Resinta the Kosal, 
and they traveled almost 1,800 miles across the face of the universe they called Lamia to reach it, racing steadily southwest towards the next portal in their endless journey. From the maps Jacek had shown them, that portal lay some miles south of Usarla, the capital of the province of Delkrath back in Sharona, almost in the center of the Narhathian Peninsula. But this Usarla lay almost a hundred thousand miles from the Usarla Shalar had visited as a young university student so long ago. I've come almost half the distance to the moon from home, she thought, staring out into the darkness. And that's as a bird or a dragon might have flown it halfway to the moon. She shook her head, trying to wrap her mind around the sheer distance involved. And we still have almost 40,000 more miles to go. You seem pensive tonight, Shayla, Gadriel said, and Shalar turned back from the window. The Ransaran magisters sat across the small table from her, shuffling the 60-card deck with slender, adroit fingers. She'd been teaching Shalar and Jathmar an arcane and card game called Old Basilisk. The rules weren't all that complex, certainly not any more complicated than several Sharonian card games Shalar could think of. But the deck had five twelve-card suits instead of the three eighteen-card suits she was accustomed to, which made keeping track of exactly what had been played challenging, or would have if voices hadn't had photographic memories at any rate. I feel pensive, Shalar admitted. We're such a long way away from everything I've ever known. And it's so empty out there. Appearances can be deceiving, Gadriel told her, looking out the window herself. Back home, all of this is part of the Duchy of Forcasa, one of the oldest and wealthiest independent territories of Shaloma. Of course, the factors that made Forcasa so wealthy back in Arcana don't necessarily apply in the out-universes, and was still a long way from Arcana or New Andara. But the last time I checked the census figures, Lamia had a population of somewhere around three million, I think. Three million, Shalar repeated. She had to remind herself that Arcana had been expanding into the multiverse for two centuries, almost three times as long as Sharona. Still, the thought that they had three million people living in a universe 40,000 miles from their home universe was sobering, to say the least. Well, Lamia's attracted more colonization than a lot of our other universes, Gadriel said, as she offered the deck for Shalar to cut. The distance between portals is shorter than in some, and it's all over land, which helps. And the natural tendency is to spread out to either side of the slider right of way, which just happens to run across some of Shaloma's best real estate, not to mention the fact that some of the most beautiful beaches of the western Hesmerian are less than a hundred miles from where we are right now. She began to deal, and Shalar nodded in understanding. The Hesmerian Sea was what the Arcanans called the Mabisi Sea, and Gadriel was certainly right about the Narhathan beaches. Tourism was one of Terramander Province's most lucrative industries back home in Sharona and Terramander Beach Resorts were famous throughout the multiverse. Anyway, Gadriel continued, I think every universe looks emptier when you see it in the dark. It always makes me feel like there's nothing really quite real out there. I've felt that way a lot lately, Shalar said in a low voice, and Gadriel's hands paused. She looked across the table at the other woman, and her almond-shaped eyes were dark with sympathy. I know you have. And I wish none of this had happened to you and Jathma. We know that, Gadriel. Shalar managed to smile. Go ahead and deal, silly. Gadriel smiled back and resumed dealing cards. Shalar watched them fall, listening to the quiet, snapping sounds the cardboard rectangles made as they landed on the tabletop. She would never have been able to hear that sound aboard a Sharonian train moving at this speed. Indeed, the quiet, vibrationless slider cars continued to amaze her, although she and Jathmar had noticed several weaknesses compared to old-fashioned, noisy, vibrating railroads. It had taken them a while to realize just how big a disadvantage the absence of engines was. There was no doubt that the fact that each slider was self-propelled made the slider cars more flexible, but the price for that flexibility was high. Each slider required its own spell accumulator, 
and for all their luxury, they were much more lightly built than Sharonian rolling stock, for reasons which had become obvious as they'd watched the gifted technicians recharge the accumulators at the stations where they'd stopped. The spells which propelled the sliders were obviously complicated, and it took quite a while to recharge each slider's accumulator. And as Gandriel had explained when they'd finally asked her about it, there was a reason the cars were so light. The sliders relied upon a variant of the levitation spells used by the cargo pods dragon transports often towed, and those really weren't very efficient on a tonnage basis. From what she'd said, Jathmar, who knew far more about railroads and steam engines than Shalar did, had calculated that the Arcanans would be lucky if one of their slider cars could transport a quarter of the tonnage of one of the TTE's freight cars, routinely carted across the multiverse. It's nice to think we have at least some advantages, she thought moodily as she gathered up her cards and began sorting her hand. She glanced across the compartment to where Chief Sword Threbich and Jathmar were engaged in a game the Arcanans called Battle Squares. It was a complicated, highly stylized war game, using eighteen carved pieces on each side, played across a game board that was nine squares wide and nine squares deep. Jathmar had turned out to be surprisingly good at it, and he was pushing Threbich hard while Jugthar Sandali kibitzed. She could feel his concentration and enjoyment through their marriage bond, and it was obvious that Sandali was amused by Threbich's predicament. Shalar was glad Jathmar was enjoying himself, but even that was flawed for her tonight. She could feel his concentration and enjoyment, yes, but not as clearly as she should have been able to. Their wedding bond was definitely weaker. And when they'd stopped for the last accumulator charge, Jathmar had tested his mapping talent. It was weaker, too. In a way, Shalar was almost relieved. Even in Sharona, marriages and relationships sometimes proved less enduring than the people involved in them might have wished, especially in the face of unexpected stress or anxiety. Very few people could ever have been under more stress than the two of them. And she'd seen more than one marriage bond simply wither and die as the partners drifted apart. The thought of that happening to her and Jathmar was more than she could have borne. And she was almost desperately glad that there was some other reason for what was happening. But even so, the implications of their weakening bond and Jathmar's weakening talent were nearly as frightening as the thought of losing Jathmar might have been. They had no idea what was causing it, and Shalar looked up from her cards. Gadriel's head was bent as she sorted her own hand, and she failed to notice the intense, almost plaintive quality of the look Shalar gave her. The voice wished with all her heart, that she and Jathmar could discuss what was happening to them with someone, and the most reasonable someone would have been Gadriel. But Jathmar was right. They couldn't mention this to anyone, not when it was possible that the effect could be deliberately induced, even used against other talents, by a sorceress who figured out what was happening. Gadriel looked up, and Shalar quickly banished her worries from her expression, if not from her emotions. Ready to bid? Gadriel asked. Sure, Shalar said, with a cheerfulness she was far from feeling. Fifteen. Afternoon sunlight slanted in through the narrow, barred windows as the outside door slammed open. Two Arcanan guards came through it, dragging a limp, semi-conscious body between them, and a third guard followed behind them, with one of their repeating crossbows cocked and loaded in his hands. The armed guard stood back, weapon ready, while one of the other two unlocked the cell door so that his companion could toss their burden through it. Namir Velvelig moved quickly, catching Company Captain Silk Ash before the all but unconscious healer could hit the cell floor. Silk Ash cried out in pain as the regiment captain caught him, and Velvelig's eyes could have frozen the heart of any Arpathian hell as he glared up at the guards. One of them sneered at him, obviously amused by his glare and made a taunting gesture with one hand. His mocking expression and obvious satisfaction at Silk Ash's broken, bloodied condition was almost enough. Almost. Yet Velvelig's iron expression never even twitched. Only those frozen eyes spoke of the fury blazing within him. The time would come. He already knew that much. The time would come when he would finally make his try and die. But not today. 
Not until the moment was right and he could count on taking at least one of them with him before the bastard with the crossbow shot him down. The guard who'd mocked him snorted with contempt, spat on the floor, then slammed the cell shut and locked it. He said something to his companion, and all three of the guards sauntered out. Velvelig eased silk ash down on the pallet he and the other officers in their cell had put together, and the healer twitched, hissing in anguish as Velvelig's gently testing fingers found fresh breaks in his ribs. The regiment captain had cuts and bruises in plenty of his own. The last two times they'd come for silk ash, Velvelig had stood in front of the healer. He hadn't launched a single blow, hadn't threatened the guards in any way, but they'd had to club him out of the way before they could get at the healer. Not that it had done any good in the end. Sir. He looked down at the faint, thready voice. Silk Ash's left eye was open, his right was swollen shut. He'd lost several teeth along the way as well, and his speech wasn't very clear. I'm here, Silky, Velvelig said quietly. You don't look too good. Well, I don't feel so good either. Silk Ash got out, and Velvelig's eyes burned at the healer's feeble attempt at humor. Tobis, Velvelig asked after a moment, and Silk Ash shook his head. Don't know, sir. The bruised, bloodied face twisted. That son of a bitch I was still working on him when they dragged me out. Poor son. Somebody snarled behind Velvelig, but the regiment captain only patted Silk Ash gently on the shoulder. All right, Silky, take it easy. We'll take care of you. I know, sir, Silk Ash whispered, and his eye slid shut. Velvelig held up one hand, and one of the other prisoners handed him the scrap of blanket they'd soaked in their water bucket. The regiment captain began cleaning his healer's face, and his touch was as gentle as any woman's, while black murder seethed in his heart. Hadrine Thalmer's sadism had a certain brutal cunning. There was no doubt in Velvelig's mind that he was going to kill Silk Ash and McCree in the end, but he was in no hurry to end his entertainment. Perhaps it had begun as some sort of punishment, vengeance for the torment he believed the healers had deliberately inflicted upon him. If that was how it had started, though, it had gone far beyond that by now. Vengeance might have offered him the pretext, but the truth was that he enjoyed what he was doing. He was pacing himself, rationing himself, giving his victims time to recover between sessions. Yet Silk Ash, and especially McCree, were growing steadily weaker, and no one seemed to care. Certainly no one was offering them the magical healing which had saved Velvelig's own life. However spectacular their healing powers might be, the Arcanian healers were obviously content to watch their Sharonian counterparts being slowly and brutally beaten to death without raising a finger to repair the damage. I don't think Tobis can take much more, sir. Silk Ash's voice was a little stronger, which only made the despair in it that much clearer. It's worse for him. It blasts his talent open, makes him feel... How much the son of a bitch enjoys what he's doing to him. I know, Silky. I... Velvelig broke off, and his belly muscles tightened in anticipation as the outside door opened once more. But it wasn't the guards dragging Tobis McCree back into the brig, after all. Velvelig straightened, and the fury in his heart redoubled as he recognized the wiry redhead. Thalmer was bad enough, yet at least he appeared to genuinely believe his captors had deliberately tortured him when he was in their power. The Arcanans standing outside their cell now, looking into them, had no such excuse. And Velvelig knew that if he would only come within arm's reach of the bars. He wasn't that stupid, unfortunately. He only stood there, glaring at the prisoners, his face tight with hatred as he drank up the extent of Silk Ash's injuries. Then he turned around, as wordlessly as he'd come, and stalked back out. Amir Velvelig watched him go, then knelt slowly back down beside his healer, and started wiping blood off his face once more. Thurman Ulthar closed the door very carefully behind him, then stood on the walkway outside the brig. His left hand dropped to the hilt of the short sword sheathed at his hip, and his knuckles whitened with the force of his grip. 
He refused to let himself look at the administration block. He couldn't, because he knew what was happening in there right this moment. He didn't have to hear the blows, listen to the gasping screams, to know what Hadrine Thalmer was doing. And if he let himself think about it, let himself feel, then... He closed his eyes and inhaled deeply. You're an officer in the Union Army, goddammit, he told himself despairingly. You can't just stand here. Whatever Iftar said, if you don't take a stand for something, then what the fuck use are you? There was a sickness spreading through the garrison of the captured Sharonian fort, radiating from the man who'd been placed in command. And Ulthar was afraid, afraid where it would end, who might find himself added to the list of Hadrine Thalmer's enemies. Someone had to do something, yet Ulthar was only one man, and a man Thalmer obviously distrusted as much as he loathed him. You don't even have a platoon anymore, Thurman, he thought. And it was true. He had exactly five men, the other Andoran scout wounded POWs who'd been left behind here with him and Thalmer under his command. Thalmer had been careful not to assign him to anything which might have required more men, and Ulthar knew exactly why that was. He also knew all five of them would have followed him into any open confrontation with Thalmer, for all the good it would have done. I can't take them with me, he told himself yet again. I don't have that right, but gods, I've got to do something. At least the healers 500 Vaynar had left behind were refusing to go along with Thalmer. No doubt the other prisoners didn't understand. But if Thalmer had had his way, the healers would have repaired the damages he inflicted on a daily basis so that he could inflict fresh damages on a daily basis. But they'd refused. They couldn't stop him from torturing his prisoners. But they could refuse to become his accomplices by helping him do it. Ulthar snarled in frustration. How pathetic was it, when the best he could find to say was that the healers wouldn't heal someone. Something snapped down inside him at that thought. The iron self-control he'd forced himself to exert slipped, and he spun on his heel and started stalking across the parade ground towards the office block, unsnapping the retaining strap across his short sword as he went. Fifty Ulfa! The voice reached him even through the red haze of his fury, and he paused, looking over his shoulder. He didn't really know the man who'd called out to him. He'd seen him around the fort, but he wasn't an Andaran scout, and Ulthar had been too focused on what Thalmer was up to to pay him much attention. Yes, Ulthar's one-word response came out sounding strangled and strange, even to his own ears. And the other man grimaced. I think we need to talk, Fifty Ulthar. Commander of 50, Geralt Sarma, said. Commander of 2000, Merkos Harshu, sat in his tent at the foot of the precipitous cliffs and pushed the last few bites of his supper around the bowl with a spoon. A glass of wine sat largely untasted at his elbow, and his expression was unusually grim. The sentry outside the tent called out a challenge to someone, and Harshu raised his head looking towards the entrance. A moment later, the sentry lifted the flap and looked in at him. Thousand Toro could see us, sir. He says you're expecting him. I am, Sword. Send him in, please. Sir. The non-com snapped a salute and disappeared. A moment later, the flap rose again, and Clareman Torok came through it. You wanted to see me, sir? Yes, please. Have a seat. Harshu gestured at the camp chair floating on the far side of the table, and Torok settled himself onto it. The thousand never looked away from Harshu as he sat, and Harshu smiled sourly. I've just received some interesting dispatches, Clareman. Sir? Torok's eyebrows rose as Harshu paused. One set is from Carthos, the two thousand said. That's the good news, such as it is. He's detached hundred helicas strike. We should see Helica in about three more days. The only bad news from him is that I'd asked him how much transport he needed to move his prisoners to the rear. If I were the Sharonians and I had the capability, I'd try pushing down the secondary chain before I tried to fight my way down these cliffs. I don't think they do have the capability, but if it turns out they do, there's no way we can reinforce Carthos enough to hold against a serious attack. 
The best we can do is to keep the approaches picketed and make sure they don't manage to get past him and sneak up on us undetected from the rear. So I thought to myself, we should send his POWs back to 500 Cleon so he could move quickly, without any encumbrances. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that. What do you mean, sir? Torok asked, his expression unhappy when Harshu paused once more. I mean, he doesn't have any prisoners. Not one, apparently. Harshu met Torok's eyes levelly across the table. Every single Sharonian died fighting rather than surrender. Clareman Torok's belly muscles tightened. It wasn't really a surprise, of course, and a part of him couldn't help feeling a sudden surge of fury directed not at the distant thousand Carthos, but at two thousand Harshu. It was just a bit late for Harshu to be feeling upset with anyone over violations of the Corellian Accords, after he'd sown the seeds for everything Carthos had done by what he'd allowed Neshek to do. Something of the thousand's emotions must have shown in his face, because Harshu's jaw tightened. But then the two thousand inhaled deeply and made himself nod. You're right, Clamon. It is my fault. And if I'd listened to you in the beginning, it wouldn't have happened. But it has, and it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to stop it than it would have been simply to never let it start. He shook his head, then leaned back in his chair with a smile that was even more sour than before. Of course, there's always that second set of dispatches to help distract me from the Carthos situation. Second set, sir? Torok asked cautiously. Oh, yes. The set from 2000 Mulgurthic. From 2000 Mulgurthic? Surprise startled the repetition out of Torok. Mulgurthic had been oddly silent ever since the Arcanian Expeditionary Force began its advance. In fact, as far as Torok was aware, he hadn't sent Harshu a single message in all that time. Indeed, Harshu told him, it would appear that 2000 Mulgurthic is most distressed over the way in which I have misinterpreted his desires and grossly exceeded his intentions. Torok's eyes went wide. He couldn't help it. He'd read most of the official instructions and memoranda Mulgurthic had sent forward to Maritha before Harshu launched his attack. But, sir, that's it, he began. Don't say it, Harshu interrupted. Torok closed his mouth with a click, and Harshu grimaced. Given a couple of things he said in his dispatches, Clamon, he said very quietly. I think he probably has his own eyes and ears out here, keeping him informed. It might not be very wise to express your opinion overly freely in front of anyone besides myself, if you take my meaning. It was Torok's turn to sit back, and his jaw muscles tensed as the implications began to percolate through his brain. That's better, Harshu told him. The two thousand picked up his almost forgotten wine glass and sipped from it, then set it back down again. According to two thousand more Gurthic, it was never his intention for us to advance beyond Hell's Gate. And in fact, he always regarded the use of force to retake even Hell's Gate as an action of last resort. Sir, Torok said despite Harshu's warning, I don't see how any reasonable individual could have interpreted his instructions to mean anything of the sort, certainly not in the light of verbal briefings he gave both of us before he deployed us forward. Clamon, Harshu said in a chiding way, shaking a finger at him. You're letting your opinions run away with you again. Torok clamped his mouth shut, and Harshu snorted harshly. The interesting thing is that if you read his written instructions without those verbal briefings of his, they can actually be interpreted exactly the way he's interpreting them at the moment. While I would never wish to impute duplicity to a superior officer, I find that I can't quite shake the suspicion that the discrepancy between his current very clearly expressed views and what you and I understood his instructions to be isn't accidental, shall we say. Sir, I don't like what you seem to be saying. I'm not overjoyed with it myself. In fact, the thing that bothers me most right now is that I can't decide whether Mulgurthic is simply trying to cover his own ass now that the shit's hit the fan, or if he deliberately set us up. Well, set me up, at least. From the start, 
Did he simply shape his written instructions this way, so he'd be covered if something went wrong? Or did he want us to do exactly what I went ahead and did, but clearly, for the record at least, without his authorization? Torok started to open his mouth again, but Harshu's raised finger stopped him. Not, the Air Force officer reflected a second later, that it was really necessary for him to say what he was thinking. But why? Why would Mooka think want us to start a shooting war out here without his authorization? He's still the senior officer in command, even if he did delegate the field command to Harshu. Ultimately, surely the commandery is going to hold him responsible for what happens in his command area. So why go to such elaborate lengths? The thoughts flashed through his brain. He had no answers for any of the questions, but he was sinkingly certain that if he'd had those answers, he wouldn't have liked them. Of course, Harshu continued in a lighter tone which fooled neither of them. 2,000 Mulgurthic is not yet aware that we've managed to kill the heir to the Tenathian crown, is he? That's going to be just a bit unexpected, I imagine, as is the way the Sharonians are going to respond to it. He showed his teeth in a smile which contained no humor at all, and Torog winced. Unlike Harshu, he'd actually met the senior Sharonian officers at Fort Salby. There wasn't much question in his mind about how the Ternathian Empire, at least, was going to respond. He looked across the table at Merkos Harshu and wondered if he looked as sick as he felt. Rof Chan Skrithik stood stiffly to attention as the haunting bugle notes of sunset, the call the Ternathian Empire's military had used to close the day for almost 3,000 years, floated out under the smoldering embers of a spectacular sunset. It was a beautiful bugle call, with a sweet, clear purity that no soldier ever forgot. And it was also, by a tradition so ancient no one even knew where it had begun, the call used at military funerals. The last sweet notes flared out, and Chanskrithic inhaled deeply, gazing out across the neat rows of graves. At least a third of them were marked with the triangular memorial symbol of the triad. Others showed the horse tails of Arpathia, or the many-spired star of Aruncus of the sword. And out there, in the midst of the men who had died to hold Fort Salby, was the young man who had died to save Fort Salby. Chan Skrithik reached up, gently stroking the falcon on his right shoulder. For millennia, since the death of the Emperor Halion, the House of Calarath's tradition had been that when one of its own died in battle, he was buried where he fell, buried with the battle companions who had fallen at his side, and with his enemy. Chan Skrithik would have preferred to send Janaki home to his mother to let him sleep where he had earned the right to sleep, beside Earthane the Great. But like Halion himself, Janaki Chan Kalarath would rest where he had fallen, farther away from Estafel and Tajvana than any other Kalarath. And where he slept would be Ternathian soil forever. Doesn't seem right, sir. Chan Skrithik turned. Chief Armsman Chan Breichel stood beside him looking out across the same cemetery. What well, doesn't seem right, Chief? It doesn't seem right that he's not here, sir. Grief clouded the chief armsman's voice. None of us would be here without him. And... Chan Breichel broke off, and Chan Skrithig reached out and touched him lightly on the shoulder. It was his choice, Chief. Remember that. He chose to die for the rest of us. Never let anyone forget that. No, sir, I won't. Chan Breichel's wounded voice hardened. And none of us will be forgetting how he died, either. Chan Skrithik only nodded. Division Captain Chan Duraith's entire 1st Brigade had marched past Janaki's body. Every surviving man of the Fort's PAAF garrison had done the same, and Sun Lord Markin had personally led his surviving Euromathian cavalry troopers past the bier in total silence, helmets removed, weapons reversed, while the mounted drummers kept slow, mournful time. Janaki Chan Kalarath's death had done more than save Fort Salby. Roth Chan Skrithik already understood that. Janaki had been added to the legend of the Kalaraths, and the fighting men of Sharona would never forget that the attack which had killed him 
had been launched in time of peace by the very nation which had asked for the negotiations in the first place. He wasn't the only victim of their treachery. In fact, Chan Skrithik never doubted that Janaki would have been dismayed, even angry, if anyone had suggested anything of the sort. Yet it was inevitable that the young man who would one day have been emperor of all Sharona should be the focal point for all the grief, all the rage, all the hate Arcana had fanned into a roaring furnace. I stand between, Chan Skrithik thought. Well, you did, Janaki. You stood between all of us and Arcana. And you stood between me and the griffin that killed you. It's a hard thing, knowing a legend died for you. But that's what Calaraths do, isn't it? They make legends. They become legends and gods. The price they pay for it. Talina made a soft sound on his shoulder, and he reached up and stroked her wings once again. I know, my lady, he said gently. I know. I miss him too. Talina touched the back of his hand very gently with her razor-sharp beak, and Chan Skrithik looked across at Chan Brackle once more. His horses and his sword are going home, chief, he said, and you and his platoon are taking them. Yes, sir, Chan Brackle's voice was husky again. Tell them for us, chief, Chan Skrithik looked into the Marine's eyes. Tell them all, this fort, this cemetery, it's ours. He bought it for us, and no one and nothing will ever take it away from us. I can't believe she did that. Alazon Yanamar shook her head. What was she thinking? You know exactly what she was thinking, love. Kinlafia chided her sadly. The two of them stood in Alazon's office in Calarath Palace, surrounded by her collection of horses, as they gazed out the windows. The lamps were turned low, the sun had set hours ago and a silver moon drifted over the palace gardens. It was a serene and beautiful sight, utterly at odds with the chaos and confusion which had enveloped the people who lived and worked in the palace. Just don't want to admit that she was right, Kinlafia continued. Right? Alazon stared at him in stark disbelief. God, Starsel, she's seventeen, and she's a Ternathian. The youngest of that bastard's sons is twenty-nine and they're all just as bad as he is. Can you imagine what will happen to her when she marries one of them, especially after humiliating his father the way she did this morning? Why not just invite him to rape her on the floor of the conclave and be done with it? Yes. The word came out harshly, but Kinlafia met her angry eyes levelly. I can imagine exactly what will happen. Vothan, do you think I like the thought? But that doesn't change the fact that she's right, and we've got to unify and that we don't have time to give Chava the opportunity to reopen the entire unification debate. Yes, we do, Alazan protested. And if Chava's going to open the door, then I say we should use the opportunity he's given us to delete that entire subsection from the act. You know better than that, Kinlafia regarded her sternly. In fact, I know you know better than that. You've been the one teaching me to think in strategic political terms for the last two weeks. Do you really think Chava would have opened this entire subject if he wasn't prepared to announce that Eurymathia would use the pretext of Janaki's death and the invalidation of the act to justify refusing to accept the unification after all unless it's revised once again? This time, to give him more power, more room to spin his webs? And do you think he waited until after the Emperor detailed his requirements by accident? He wanted every member of the conclave to accept, gut deep, just how serious the threat is. And then he issued his demand. He wanted them to know how big a pistol he was prepared to hold to all of their heads. If he claims the act is nullified, if he refuses to acknowledge Zindel's rightful coronation, then what happens to all of the preparations we need to make? Do you think for an instant that once that sack of snakes was untied, there wouldn't be enormous pressure from other members of the conclave to give him more of what he wanted in the first place, if that was the only way to get him to sign back up quickly, now that the Arcanans have proven they're a genuine immediate threat? He might as well have handed us a written memo about his new strategy, Alazan. The way he saw it, he won either way. 
Either he got to name Andron's husband under the terms of the act, or else Zindel told him to go straight to the Arpathian hells before he gave one of Chava's sons his daughter. And if that happened, if Zindel refused to honor the act's terms, then Chava could declare that Zindel's decision to invalidate the act absolved him of his agreement to surrender the sovereignty of Eurymathia to Zindel, and that would have given him all the leverage in the world. Unless we chose to fight that very civil war the Emperor told me last night he wanted to avoid. It's obvious. From the voice reports and the print articles you've had me watching and reading ever since I got back, that Chava never really regarded the original Arcanan massacre as a genuine threat. He was doing his best to game the situation then, and he's doing exactly the same thing now. He's just changing technique, using the threat everyone else sees as genuine to frighten them into conceding the points they refused to give him before. If he can simultaneously frighten the other members of the Conclave badly enough and appear sufficiently intransigent, he'll get at least some of his demands, maybe even most of them. And he won't give a good God's damn how long he delays unification, how much damage he does to our ability to deal with the Arcanans, as long as there's a chance of improving his position. But, but nothing, love, Kinlafia said softly, sadly. You know, that's what would happen, and so does her father. My gods, Alazan, you know how much he loves her. And you saw as well as I did what he was prepared to do out there today. Yes, it was her decision, and I know as well as you do that she never even warned him she was going to do it, that she deliberately didn't give him time to think about ways to stop her, or for the father in him to find some justification, any justification, for keeping her from doing this. But if he hadn't realized in the end that she was right, he would never have let her get away with it. Never. But there has to be another way. Alizon was no longer protesting or denying. She was almost pleading. We can't just let her do this, Darcel. We can't. Tears glittered in the privy voice's eyes, and Darcel put his arm around her and hugged her tightly. I don't see how we can stop her, he said. And in the back of his brain, he saw once again the image of Andrin weeping. I'm finally beginning to understand, really understand, what sort of price being born a Calarath can exact. She's going to do this. The only person who could stop her is her father, and he won't. He can't. He'll do everything he can to protect her, but this is the one thing he can't stop her from doing. It will kill her, Alizon said softly. Maybe not physically, not quickly, but it will kill her. She looked up at Kinlafia, and a single tear broke free and trickled down her cheek. I never really knew her until this entire impossible crisis just exploded in our faces. But now that's changed. And if she marries someone like one of Chaba Busar's sons, it will just destroy her inside. Kinlafia nodded, hearing the pain in her beautiful voice. That pain, he knew was the reason someone with Alizan's sharp intelligence and grasp of politics could insist that Andrin had to be stopped. And gods knew she was right, if there'd been any way to avoid this. We're just going to have to hope she's stronger than that, he said. I've read the entire act since you gave me a copy. If I could see any way for her to... He paused suddenly. And Alizon stiffened in the circle of his arm as she felt a sudden, incredible cascade of thoughts and emotions tumbling through him. Then he inhaled sharply and looked into her eyes. Gods, he half whispered. That's it. What? Alizon demanded. I just had an idea, he told her. My gods, it's what Janicky glimpsed. What's what Janicky glimpsed? We've got to find Andrin, Kinlafia told her. And be sure you bring your copy of the act. Andrin Calarath sat on her bedroom window seat, staring out into the moon-soaked gardens of Calarath Palace, and wept. Her tears were nearly silent, and she sat very still, watching the moonlight waver through them. She wept for the brother she would never see again. She wept for her parents, who would never again see their son. She wept for all the other mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and daughters, who would never see their loved ones again. And she wept for herself. In the cold, still hours of the night, it was hard. She was only seventeen, and knowing that what she must do would save 
thousands, possibly even millions of lives, even agreeing that it was what she must do, was cold and bitter compensation for the destruction of her own life. She was frightened, and despite her youth, she had few illusions about what sort of marriage Chava Bussar and his sons had in mind for her. She knew her strengths, knew the strength of her parents' love, how fiercely they would strive to protect her. Yet in the end, no one could protect her from the cold, merciless demands of the Calarath destiny. At best, it would be a marriage without love, without tenderness, and at worst. She folded her arms, trying to wrap them around herself, not because she was physically cold, but because of the chill deep inside. She was going to spend her life married to the son of her father's worst enemy. Her children would be the grandchildren of her family's most deadly foe. She could already feel the ice closing in, already sense the way the years to come would wound and maim her spirit. And she wished, wished with all her heart, that there could be some escape, that Shalana could somehow find that single small scrap of mercy for her, could let her somehow evade this last bitter measure of duty and responsibility. But Shalana wouldn't. She couldn't. I stand between. How many Calarats had given themselves to that simple three-word promise over the millennia? Janicki had given his life to that promise and Andrin could do no less than sacrifice her life to it as well. Show Warak, Janaki, she whispered. Show Warak, sleep, Janaki, sleep until we all wake once more. I love you. She put her head down on the back of the padded window seat and let her tears soak into the upholstery. She never knew how long she wept into the window seat's satin, but somehow, despite her determination not to, she must have made some sound. She had to have because her bedroom door opened abruptly with absolutely no warning, spilling lamplight into the darkened room. She jerked upright, spinning towards the brightness, but her angry rebuke for whoever had dared to intrude upon her died unspoken. Lady Marissa Vancall stood in the doorway, silhouetted against the light. There was a chair just outside the door behind her, one which hadn't been there when Andrin went to bed, with a blanket tossed untidily across it, and Lady Marissa herself was clad in a silken sleep robe over her nightdress, devoid of the least trace of makeup, her hair all awry. Andrin had never seen, never imagined, her fussy, propriety-obsessed chief lady-in-waiting in such disarray, and she wondered what fresh cosmic disaster could have driven Lady Marissa to her bedroom in such a state. Yet before she could even start to frame the question, Lady Marissa crossed the bedroom to her, and to her utter astonishment, Andrin found herself enfolded in a tight embrace. Oh, my love, Marissa whispered in her ear. Oh, my poor love, I didn't hear you. I didn't know. Andrin felt herself beginning to crumble in that totally unexpected, immensely comforting embrace. Lady Marissa sat down on the window seat beside her, and a corner of Andrin's brain wondered just how ridiculous they looked. She was a foot taller than Lady Marissa, yet Marissa cradled her as if she were a child, and Andrin abandoned herself to the comfort of that touch. There, love, Marissa murmured, stroking her back while she sobbed. There, love. Andrin clung to her, as if the fussy, fluffy, irritating lady-in-waiting were the last solid rock in her universe, for that was precisely what Lady Marissa had become. And then someone knocked gently on the bedroom door. Andrin stiffened, and Lady Marissa's spine straightened with an almost audible snap. Really, she huffed, is this a grand imperial princess's bedroom, or is it the waiting room down at the local train station? She set Andrin aside gently, and came to her feet, straightening her robe, and stalked across the enormous bedroom towards the door, muttering as she went. Can't leave the poor girl in peace, Andrin heard floating malevolently back from her remorselessly advancing lady-in-waiting. Middle of the night, for goodness sake, coming bursting in on her, keeping her awake at all hours. I'll give you a piece of my mind, just wait and see if I- Lady Marissa reached the door and yanked it open. 
A palace maid stood there, hands folded anxiously, and the poor young woman ought by rights to have burst spontaneously into flame under Lady Marissa's fiery glare. Well, Marissa snapped at her luckless victim. Beg pardon, Lady Marissa, the maid said quickly. I wouldn't ever have disturbed her Grand Imperial Highness, not ever, but they insisted. Who insisted, girl? Lady Marissa demanded. And what could possibly be so important that it couldn't wait until morning? I'm sure I don't know what's important, my lady, the maid said. But it's privy voice Yanimar and voice Kinlafia. They say they have to talk to her Grand Imperial Highness right away. This has been an Audible Studios production of Hell Hath No Fury, Multiverse Book 2. Written by David Weber and Linda Evans. Performed by Mark Boyette. Producer Mike Charzik. Copyright 2007 David Weber and Linda Evans. Production copyright 2016 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. If you enjoyed this audiobook, be sure to get more books in the Multiverse series today.